Hello, everyone, and welcome to 15 basic vanilla JavaScript projects video, where we'll sharpen our JavaScript skills by building cool projects. Since there are quite a few projects, I'm just going to show you how you can navigate to our website where you can find all the projects. So that way you can explore all of them yourself and on your own time. So if you'd want to see all the projects that we're going to build in action, just navigate to johnsmilk.com. Again, the URL is www.johnsmilk.com. Keep on scrolling past the courses. And then in the latest projects, look for the JavaScript projects. And then in here, just click on the home icon and you'll navigate to a website where you can see all the projects. And if you want to see how the project is going to look like, just click on a card. And then, of course, you'll see the project in action. So, for example, this is going to be our reviews project. If you would want to see, I don't know, menu project, this is going to be another one where we will be filtering all the menu items and we'll take a look at how we can add them dynamically. And hopefully you get the gist. Few quick notes before we begin. All the projects are part of my JavaScript course, which consists of JavaScript tutorial and many more cool projects. And as far as the projects, since our main goal is to practice JavaScript, all the CSS is already created for you, and you just need to add a few classes in your HTML. One thing that I would want to mention is that during the projects, we will not use arrow functions and few other possible ES6 syntax options, simply because these projects were built as a practice for the course DOM module. And at that point in the course, we simply have not covered ES6 yet. Obviously, course does contain an extensive ES6 module where we cover ES6 syntax and build more interesting projects using ES6. Now, if you're extremely sad that we don't use arrow functions in these projects, well, you can just replace all the regular functions with your own arrow functions. It is as simple as that. And lastly, in order to follow along with the project, you will need a starter project and you can get it by visiting johnsmilka.com. So if you'll navigate to johnsmilk.com in the latest projects, if you'll look for the JavaScript project, then of course, in the bottom, you'll see a star files and a source code. Now for this particular project, both of them lead to same exact GitHub repo. So if you click over here, you'll navigate to my GitHub repo. And from there, either clone or download the starter project, and you'll be good to go. Since the setup for all the projects will be exactly the same, I might as well save us some time and show the project set apart only once. So you'll have to navigate to my GitHub repository and then choose the clone or download option. And then once you do, you'll have access to the folder. And then once you crack open the folder, you'll have all the projects in there. Now for each and every project, you'll have two folders. You'll have the final folder where you'll have finished application. And then also you'll have a setup folder. And then at the beginning of every project, I'm just going to grab my setup folder and add it to my text editor, like so. So I have my setup folder, just drag and drop. This is going to be the first project. The same I'll do for the next one and next one and next one. So as we're starting with the project, you just need to look for that particular project and just grab the setup folder. And then the final folder is for your reference. So for example, if you would want to see how the lorem ipsum is going to look like, I'm just going to open for now another browser window, like so, and then I'm looking for final, and then I'm just opening index.html. So this is going to be a finished project, just in case you would need to reference it. Now, as far as the setup one, of course, I'm just going to drag and drop the folder, and now it's going to be in my text editor, and while I'll be developing the application, I'll set it side by side with a browser window. So my setup is going to be always exactly the same, where I have the text error on the left hand side, and then the browser on the right hand side. And then I'm using my extension in order to open up my file. So as you can see right now, in the right hand side, I have my current project. So this is going to be my setup for all the projects, whatever project we'll be building. I'll just open up my setup folder in a text editor and set it side by side with a browser window. 
Now, there's one more thing that I would like to cover because I see that way too many times. And that one is the fact that even though you have access to a final project, it doesn't mean that you can just copy and paste the code and expect that everything will work. Now, let me show you what I mean by that. For example, I'm working on a first project. And for some reason, I came up with my own class for the button. So I'll say class, and I'll call this special BTN. And I'll call this also special button. Then, of course, since I'm following along with the video, something doesn't work because you came up with your own class. So what I see people doing is, of course, looking for the final project and then opening up the app.js, then grabbing all the code and then copying, pasting like so. So, for example, we already have something in the app.js. I'm just going to delete it, copy and paste, and the code still won't work. And of course, if I check the developer tools, I can see that I'm having the error. So this will not work. Of course, you can use the final project as a reference, as a reference, how I set up the project. But if the code works, the final project code works, that means that you have some kind of error. And oftentimes what I see is that people just look at my code, they copy and paste it, and they say, hey, listen, your code doesn't work. Well, the reason why your code doesn't work, because of course, you're setting up your own HTML. And of course, that's why you will get the errors. So yes, of course, use the final project for your reference. So you can see how I set up the project. But if the project works on your local machine, that means that it's not my code that's bad. It's actually your setup because you have missed out some kind of class, some kind of ID, some kind of HTML element or along those lines. Okay. And once we have looked at our setup, I guess we can start working on our project. And the first project we'll build will be the color flipper. And essentially, the idea is following. We're going to have a button. And as I'm clicking the button, notice we'll change the background color of our body and also we'll display what color we are using. And we'll have two setups. We'll have a simple one. We'll just use a specific amount of colors. So it's going to be fixed array with fixed amount of items. And then we'll have the second setup, the hex color setup, where we'll generate hex colors on the fly. And in this case, we have infinite amount of options. Now, of course, when I say infinite, what I'm talking about here is we're just generating the hex color on the fly. So as you can see, this is not a set amount of items. Every time we click on a button, we'll generate a unique hex color. And in order to get started, we'll have to build our index HTML first, and we'll start with our simple one. So effectively, what I'm doing right now in the index HTML, we're building out the simple setup. And then once we're done with the simple setup, then of course, we'll work on our hex one. So in the index HTML, first, I would want to create a nav bar, because I'll use for both of the pages. So we'll navigate between the projects. And that's why you need our nav bar. So I'm going to go here with a nav and you know what, nav will not have any kind of class. However, the div within the nav will have this nav center. And this div effectively is just a parent for my title, as well as my two links. And that's the only reason for that. So within the div, we'll have the heading four with a text of color flipper. And again, you can name it however you'd like. And then I'll have a on our list with a class of nav nav links like so. Let's set up our nav links. We'll have a list item. Each list item will point to a page. Of course, in our case, we don't have that many pages. We'll have index HTML and then the value will be simple or you can call it home, whatever you would want. And then I'll copy and paste this. So let me open this up. I don't know why I collapsed it. And then the second list item will be my hex one. So I'll change this one around hex. And then also the value will be hex. And again, I'm just pointing to the hex HTML they already have in my project. So I have the hex HTML and we'll work on that one, of course, a little bit later. And then as far as our setup right after nav, so right where we have the nav closing tag, we'll just set up a main element. And then within the main element, there's going to be a div with a class of container. 
and then we'll have two things. We'll have our title. So this is where we'll display what color we're using, and then we'll have a button. And I'll start with a button, even though it's going to be there last. And for the button, we'll add two classes, btn class and btn hero class. And then we'll also add a ID because I would want to target that button, of course. So basically, I'll need this ID for my JavaScript. And then as far as the value, I'll write click me. And then, like I said, above the button, I'll have my heading to with a text of background color, background color, then a colon, and then we'll set up a span. And for the span, I will have some kind of class. And again, in this case, I'll use that class also for my JavaScript. So I'll need it for my CSS and also for my JavaScript. And then within the span, I'm just going to set up the current background color, which is the gray one. And of course, since I was setting up the project, I know that the value for my gray color is F1, F5, and then F8. Let's save it. We have our basic setup. And now we can start working on our JavaScript. Perfect. Once we have set up our index.html, next we'll bravely navigate to app.js and set up our logic. And then at the moment, we can see that in the app.js, we have the colors array with four values. And effectively, they just represent what kind of colors we'll have. Whether it's going to be green, which is a simple color value, then we'll have another one, the red one, and then RGBA just so we can see for sure that it will work with any color values, whether that's a actually named color or RGBA. And we'll also have the hex one. And I guess I'll start by targeting two things, the button. So I'll name this BTN. And then the second one will be my color. Now for my button, I'll use document, then get element by ID. And then since for my button, I had the ID of BTN. And of course, I'll add it here as a value. And the second one will be my color span. So I'll have the const, then color is equal to document. Or in this case, I'll use the query selector. And then the class for my color was color. So I'll use this one. Okay, good. Now let's set up the event listener for click events. So I'm going to have my BTN at event listener, and then I'll be listening for my click events. And then, of course, in here, I'll pass in my callback function, which in my case is just going to be an animus function. And then within the function body, this is where I would want to set up my logic. So each and every time I'm going to click on a button, I'll change the background color for my body. And that is actually going to be our first task. How are we going to target the body? Well, since we know that the body is the property on a document object, and in order to show you that, I'm just going to console log it document body. And then if we check it out our dev tools, we'll see that in the console, we have our body. Awesome. So now I know how I can target my body. What's next? Well, I would want to use the style property, and more specifically, background color property, and change that value. And of course, I'll start doing that just by manually accessing my items from the array. So in this case, I'm going to go with const, then a random number, and I'm just going to set it equal to number two. Now I would want to add the comment where our goal is to get a number. So let's write here comment get random number between between zero and then three. So why are we having three? Well, because we know that arrays are zero in next base, correct? So this is going to be our first item. And that will have the index of zero. So if I would need to select it, I would do something along the lines of colors, and then I'll be selecting the zero. So that's how I can get my first item. If I'd want the second one, I would have here one, two, and then three. That's why our goal is to get a random number between zero and three. Okay, it's good to know our goals. But for the time being, we'll just have it as a hard coded value of two. And then, like I said, we'll use our document object, then we'll look for the body, then style property, not styles, style, and then more specifically, the background color as this value in the properties. And of course, you can see that Visual Studio Code is giving me nice suggestions. And for the time being, we'll set it up to a colors. So of course, that is my array, and I'll use my random number. So I'll use my 
hard coded value of D. And then also, I would want to select my color. And why I'm selecting the color? Because I would want to change the value here as well. So I would want to display which is actually the background color for my body. And property for that is text content. And again, we'll do the same thing colors. And then we'll have a random number. Let's save it. And then, of course, the moment I'll click on my button, you'll see that I'll access my third item. Because of course, I'm using the index number two. And then of course, I can refresh, and I'll do the same thing. So all of this is nice and dandy. But how we can actually make this more interesting, where we'll get a random number from our array? Well, I guess we could start by setting up some kind of function that will generate that number between zero and three. And I'll call this function get random number. So I'm just going to go here with a function keyword, then get random number. Now I'll not accept any parameters, but I will return from my function a math random method. I will invoke it. And then, of course, within my callback, I would want to display it somewhere. So I'm just going to go here with get random number. So that is, of course, my function. I'm just invoking my get random function. And then since I would want to show you what kind of values we'll be getting, I'll go with console log right underneath my random number. And I'll just check what is the value I'm getting. So random number. That's what I would want to console log. And of course, the moment I'll click, you'll notice that at the moment, I'm not getting anything because I'm getting this weird 0 0.57 and whatever all these values after the dot. And what is happening with a math random? We are getting numbers, unique numbers from zero, all the way to one, but it's never going to be one. So it's always going to be between zero and then 0 0.99999 and something. And okay, but as you can see, it doesn't really do much good. Since of course, there is no item with this type of index. So again, we're looking for numbers between zero and three. And one thing that we could do is make it interesting and multiply with the length of our colors. So what is that going to give me? Well, that is going to give me numbers between zero point something, and then three point something. Because keep in mind, our length is four, of course, correct? We have one, two, three, four items at the moment. Of course, if you'll add more items, you'll have bigger length. But at the moment, our length is four. So we're just multiplying the random number we're getting by four. And then since I said, that we'll be getting these random numbers between zero and one, we'll have a result between zero and then three point something. But it's never going to be four because our value is never going to be one. And I'll test it out by just saying that I would want to multiply that by colors and then length, which again, in our case, is four. And now you'll see if we click a few times that we're essentially generating these numbers. Notice, like I said, it's going to be from zero point something all the way up to three point something. Now, of course, in our case, it doesn't get there. I can keep on clicking. And yes, there is 3.06. Now, how we can fix this right now? Well, the solution would be using another method that is on a math object, and that is a floor one. So what floor is doing, it is going to round down to a closest integer. But again, it's going to round always down. So even though technically, as far as math, if we have 1.59, this should round up to two with a math floor, we'll always round to a nearest integer, which in our case is going to be one. So for example, if we'll have 0 0.9, it will round down to a zero. And what will happen, you'll get our numbers between zero and three. And the way we'll set that up, we'll have our math floor, and then we'll pass the value that we're getting when we multiply math random with our colors length. So I'll place it in the parentheses, I will save it. And you'll notice the moment I click, the value is two. So of course, now I'm accessing my third item, then if I'm going to click one more time, then of course, I'm going to be getting the value of one, which represents the color of red, I can click one more time. In this case, of course, I'm accessing the item with a index of zero, which is my green. And as you can see, our functionality works. 
and eventually we'll get to all our values. And of course, we're done with the first part of our project. Now, let me test it out on a smaller screen. Let's see how it's going to look like. Notice again, we are selecting all the items and everything works exactly like we expected. Awesome work. Once we're done with our simple setup. Now, why don't we spice things up and actually work on hex color where effectively what we'll do is each and every time we'll click on a button, we will generate a random hex color. Now, of course, at the moment, as you can see, nothing is happening. But if I'll check it out, the complete project, the hex color one, you'll notice that as I'm clicking, I'm generating a unique color using the hex value. And just a warning, some of the functionality will be exactly the same. We'll still select our button, we'll still select the span, we'll still generate a random number. But the difference is going to be how we will set up the color. Because in this case, we will not use some fixed values, it's going to be generated on a fly. Now, in order to speed things up, if you'll check it out the hex HTML, you'll notice that I already created the setup for you. And again, this just saves us time of repeating the same HTML. Now you'll notice also that the color is the same, the BTN ID is the same. The only difference is that we will use the hex JS. So in the index HTML, we were using the app JS. That's where we set up our basic setup. But then in this case, in the hex HTML, we're pointing to hex JS, where we'll set up our functionality to pick a hex color. And again, the reason why I set up the HTML already for you, so you don't have to retype the same thing, like where you did for the simple one. So I'll close my sidebar, I don't think I need the app JS or index HTML, like I said, there's going to be a little bit of repetition, but not too much. And I'll start by again, selecting my button. And if you'd want, you can copy and paste from the app JS. That's up to you. But I'm just going to retype it. So I'm going to go with document, then get element by ID. Again, I'm looking for the same button, copy and paste. And now of course, I'm going to be looking for the color. So I'm going to go color. Now this is not going to be get element by ID, even though maybe we could have practiced, maybe I could have renamed it. But I mean, it is what it is. So query selector, I'm going to go with a color. And now, of course, I'd also want to change in my small browser window, what am I seeing? So now I'm going to have my hex project. And then again, we'll add a event listener for our button. So BTN, add event listener, we'll be listening for our click events. And then we'll have our callback function. So function here, and then we'll do the same thing with a random number. But the setup is going to be a little bit different. Now, how we can generate a random hex color, and why we'd want that. So the way we work with hex colors is following where hex color consists of the hashtag. And then we have six values. And those values could be from zero to nine. And then we have letters that would represent 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. And again, a typical example of the hex color would be something like this. This is my favorite orange color. And as you see, I'm starting with an F which would be 15. And then I'm getting one five zero two five. And this is exactly what we'll do, where we'll set up a loop that will generate this hex color on the fly. And of course, again, we'll target the body, change the color for the background of the body, and then also add the value within the color span. And within a function body, let's start creating a hex value. And I'll start by setting it equal to a hashtag. Because like I said, at the end of the day, in order to get that X value, we must have this hashtag. So that needs to come first. And then we need these six values. And then of course, we will get those values from our array. But at the very beginning, we just need to have some kind of variable that holds the hashtag. Okay, that's awesome. And then we would want to set up a loop that runs six times. Now why it needs to run six times? Because again, we'll have six values over here. So for each and every time we'll run that loop, I'll get a random value from my array and just add to my hex color variable. And that's why I was using here let because if I would have used const, well, I would get an error. Now how we can set up a loop, we go for loop. And then the syntax would be for then we have parentheses, what would be our starting point, we'll start with a zero. So I is going to be equal to a zero. 
and then we need to actually have here semicolon. My apologies. And where we would want to stop the loop? Well, before I is equal to six. So I'm just going to say run the loop until I is less than six, which is just going to mean that it will run from zero to five, which is, of course, six times. And then each and every time I'll run it, I'll say I plus plus. So it will increment by one. And then within our actual loop, I'm going to have my hex color and I would want to add that particular number. Now, again, we'll start by just hard coding and how it will look like. I'm going to go hex color and then I'm going to say that in each and every iteration, I'm just going to add a value from my array. Again, I'm not going to be getting a random number. We will hard code for the time being, but at least I would be able to show you that we will get six of them. So, of course, my array name is hex and I'll start with my first item. That's why I'll set it equal to the index of zero. Then we would want to target both things again, the body as well as the text content. So in this case, I'm going to go color text content is equal to my hex color like so. And then also I would want to do the same thing for my body. So I'm going to go document body and then we have a style and then a background color background color will be equal to my hex color. And now let's test it out. It should be all black once I press on the button. And of course, I can see that I'm getting my background color and the value here is hashtag and then six zeros, which is awesome. That just means that I am getting six items from my array or there is an issue that, of course, I'm not getting random items. I'm just getting all of them as a item of one. And we would need to set up a function that would generate a random number. And then, of course, I would get a random item from my array. Now, also something to keep in mind that we must have this plus equals to, because if you'll have just equals, you'll see that effectively we're just overriding this in each and every iteration. So if you have click me, you'll see that on the right hand side, I just have the zero because that is the last thing that we're adding in our loop. That's it. That's the last iteration. And then we just set it equal to a hex zero. So keep in mind that you need to have this plus equals to because that way you are generating a string that will consist of the hashtag and then six values from our hex array. And then just to show that, of course, we're getting different items. I'm just going to go with, for example, I don't know, uh, one, two, three, and then maybe this one, the index of 10. And then let's see what we'll have. So this is going to be AA. And then we can try 11, maybe. Let's see. OK, that is going to be B. And as you can see, our color is changing. But of course, we're still getting all six values exactly the same. And we already know what we need to do. We need to set up a function. And we already actually have all the functionality. The only difference is going to be what is going to be the length that we use. Is it going to be from the colors array or is it going to be from the hex? So I'm going to set up my get random number array function again. And then within a function body, again, we will return math floor. We already know the drill. We will round down. And of course, we'll have our math random. We'll invoke it. And in this case, like I said, the difference is going to be that we'll multiply this by the length of the hex array, not the colors array. Because again, what I would want is this random number multiplied by the length of my array, which is just going to make sure that I'm getting values between zero and then the last index in my array, just like we had before. So not colors. Um, for some reason, I was speaking about colors, so I kept on typing. But in fact, we'll go with hex and then again, a length. And again, in this case, length, of course, is different. It's not going to be exactly like we had with colors where we had four items. So the length was four. Of course, since I have more items, I have a bigger length. Let's save it. And now we'll see that each and every time we will click on a button, we will spin up our little loop. And then within the loop, we'll generate that random number. Now, at the moment, I still haven't accessed that number. So where I have the hex and then I'm accessing the item from my array, I just need to invoke my function. I need to say get random number. 
I will invoke it. And you'll see that the moment we'll click, we'll start generating random hex colors. And that's how we can set it up. Now, let me test it out on a bigger screen. Notice previously it wasn't working. Now, of course, as you see, as I'm clicking, I'm changing the background color for my body and I'm generating on the fly some kind of hex value. And then, of course, I'm having it in two places in my span. I'm displaying what kind of color it is. And also for the body, the background color value is equal to the hex value that I'm generating from my function. Awesome work. And up next, we have our counter project where we'll build a counter so I can increase the count. I can decrease the count and I can set it back to zero. If it's above zero, then it's going to be green. If it's below, it's going to be red. And of course, if it's zero, then it's just going to be black. And if you'll open up the setup files, you'll see that currently this is what we'll have. And of course, I'll navigate back to my project. And we'll start with index HTML. So instead of this awesome heading one, we'll place a main element. Within the main element, we'll have our container. And then within the container, we'll start with a heading one. And we'll just type counter. Let's save it and see what we'll have. So I have my counter value. Okay, good. And then we'll have a span. So right after heading one, we'll have the span with an ID of span. And we'll hard code it to be zero. And then also I'll have another div with a class of button containers. So we'll go with div and we'll say button container. And then within the container, we'll have three buttons. And all of them will be exactly the same. But of course, just the classes will be a little bit different. So we'll have BTN. So that is going to be my generic button class and more specific one is going to be decrease. That's for the first one. And as far as the value, we also write decrease. So that is, of course, going to be my first button. And then you know what? It's not actually span. My apologies. It is value. So sorry about that. So the actual ID is value, not a span. And I'll copy and paste my button. And then, of course, like I said, all of them will have this generic button class, but each of them will have this specific class which we'll use in the JavaScript. So the first one has the decrease class. The second one has the reset class. And the third one will have increase. Now, of course, I still need to change these values. So I'm going to go here, increase. And for the second one, I'll add reset. We'll save it. Now we have three buttons. Of course, we can click all day long and nothing is going to happen. But we do have the HTML. So now, of course, we just need to work on our JavaScript. And in order to set up my logic, I'll navigate to app.js. And first, I'll start by setting up some kind of count value. So I'll have a variable. And that variable will use let. So I'm going to say count. And that will be equal to zero. So that effectively will be my count. And you know what? I will also set up right away a comments where I'll say set initial and then count. So that's going to be my comment. And then also I'd want to select two things. I would select the value. So I'd want to select the value span. And also I'd want to select all the buttons. Now, when we're looking at the buttons, what would be our choices? Technically, you can say, all right, we could select them one by one. Where I'm saying query selector. And then I'm just grabbing the class of decrease, class of reset, and class of increase. And technically that is possible, but we also need to keep in mind that for all of them, we would need to set up pretty much same event listener, just a different value. So maybe a better option would be using query selector all, where I could select all the buttons that just have this generic BTN class. And then we'll set up a for each method because it's going to be array like. So we can use for each on that. And then we'll loop over them. And then we're just going to check if the button is decrease then of course, we'll decrease the value. If it's increased, then we'll increase it. And you get the gist. So in the app.js, I will select two things. And in fact, I'll add the comments here. I'll say select value and buttons. And I'll start with my value. That's the easy one. We'll go with value. Then we'll use the query selector. So query selector. And we're looking for the hashtag of value. Why? Because that is the ID value. 
So since the ID name is value, that's why I'm using hashtag and then value. Now I will use the query selector also. In this case, I'll write const btn. So that means buttons. And we'll go with document and then query selector all. And now I would like to select all the buttons that has this class of button. And if we want to console log, what we'll get back, you'll see that we'll have this funny node list. And just to showcase that, I'll open up my dev tools and you'll see that in a console we'll have the node list. So node list is a tricky one where it is array like. So there's some methods that you can perform on the node list. For example, for each, this is going to be our case. And then there's some methods, array methods that you cannot run on a node list. So you would need to transform it into an array. And again, we'll cover that later in the course. But for the time being, we only need to worry about the fact that for each we can run on our load list. So we're good to go. And of course, I can see that I have first button, second button, and the third button. So I would like to run my for each method. So let's say buttons for each. And we already know that in the for each, we pass in the callback function. We write here function. And then this function is called against each and every item in my list. Now, what's cool that in this callback function, I can access each and every item using parameter. So for example, I can name this parameter item. And then if I'll console log it, you'll see that we're accessing each and every button. So check it out. Now, of course, I have all my three buttons. Now, since it is parameter, of course, I can call it whatever I would like. So maybe I can even call this orange and my functionality will still work orange and orange. And as you can see, the amount of buttons that I have in a console log did not change. Now I'm going to be a bit more conservative. I'm not going to call this orange burrito or banana. I'm just going to go with a button. And now I'd want to add this event listener to all the buttons. So again, instead of selecting those buttons one by one using the specific classes that they have, we selected all of them using the button class. And now as I'm looping over my list, then I would want to add those event listeners. So I'm going to go BTN, add event listener, and I'm still going to be listening for my click event. So I'm going to say here, click, and we would need to again pass the callback function. So I'm going to go with my function. And in this case, I'll right away access my event object. Why? Because I would want to check which button I'm clicking, because now I have a list. So I will use my event object to actually check which is the button that the user clicked on. And we already know that on the event object, we have the current target. As always, we will console log it and we can just say event current target. And this is going to spit back effectively which button I clicked on. And more specifically, I could get the class list from the actual button. So in our callback function, we're accessing the event object. Event object has a property of current target. And now more specifically, I'm looking for the class list. So all the classes this element has. And now if I'm going to click on reset, this is the value that I'll get. If I'll click on increase, notice again, I'll have the list of classes what this element has. So this one has BTN reset. This one has BTN and increase. And I can actually assign this to some kind of variable. So instead of console log, I'm going to go with const and I'm going to call this styles is equal to my class list. So each and every time I'm going to click on a button, I'll save in my variable, which are the classes that this element has. And now I could set up a if statement where I could say if and then styles, of course, that is my variable. And then I'm going to say contains. Now, what this means is that I could say if the variable contains specific class, that means that I'm clicking on reset or decrease or increase button. And I'll start with decrease. I'm going to say if styles contains, and then I'm going to look for my decrease. So effectively, I'm looking for this decrease class. And if that is the case, then of course, I would want to decrease my count. So I'm going to go here, count minus minus. So I'm decreasing the count by one. Now we'll still set up some else if and else. 
but for the time being, let's just use the value that we have because we already have selected the value and let's just replace the text content with our count. So what I'll do here is I'm going to say value text content. So the variable that holds the value my span and then change the text content in that span and set it equal to the count. So if of course I'm checking only for a decrease, I'm going to be clicking only on a decrease as well. So as I'm clicking, notice I'm decreasing the value. Again, I selected all the buttons I used for each. I looped over those buttons. Then for each button, I added event listener as I'm clicking. And then I'm using the event object and getting the current target and a class list. So get me the classes that the item that I'm clicking on has. So one is going to have button decrease, button reset, button add increase. And if the item I clicked on has the class of decrease, that means that that is decrease button. So we'll just decrease the count. And of course, we can do the same things for the rest of them. And here I'll say else if, and then I'm looking for styles, contains again, I'm just checking whether that style exists, whether that class exists, more specifically, increase. So if that is the case, of course, that is the increase button. What are we doing with increase? We're just going count plus plus. Again, semicolon, and off we go to the last one, which is an else one. And here I'm cheating a little bit. Since I know that I only have three buttons, I mean, I checked already for decrease, I checked for increase. So I'm already assuming that my last option is reset. Okay, if you would want to be more diligent, of course, you can just say if and then style contains. But in this case, I am cheating a little bit where I'm saying, you know what, if I'm not decreasing, if I'm not increasing, I already know that I'm just resetting the value, and my value will be equal to zero. Save it. And as always, let's test it out. Up we go, then we can reset. And of course, we can decrease. And in order to make things a little bit more interesting, we're also going to change the colors for our value. And we'll take a look at how we can rewrite this using only the if statements. So instead of if, else if, and else, then we'll go with if, if count. And what I'm doing is I'm saying, what is the value for my variable? Because in here, I already performed the operation where I either increased or I'm sorry, decreased, I guess in this case, increased and then set to zero. And now I'm saying, okay, what is the value? If the value is bigger than zero, then I would want to change the color for my span. And my span is in the value variable. And then we have the style property. And then within the style property, we have access to a color. And since the count is bigger than zero, you might as well set it equal to green. Now, of course, the moment I click, notice now I'll get my green color. And then I just need to keep on typing these ifs. I could say if, and then what is the other option? Well, count could be less than zero, correct? And now again, what are we doing? I'm grabbing my span. I have the style property. And then in the style property, I have a property by the name of color. And if it's less than zero, what I would want to do, set it equal to red. And last one is the zero one. So in this case, I could say if, and then count is equal to zero, then I'll just use my black color. So again, value, so the span, style, color, and I'll use the hex color. So I'll go with quotation marks, hashtag, and then two, two, two. So that's the black color. I'll save it. And you know what, in order to test it out, I'll navigate to a bigger screen. I think it's going to be a little bit more interesting. So I can increase, of course, I'm changing the color. I can decrease, I'm changing the value as well as the color. And of course, we can reset. So congrats on finishing the counter project. Awesome. Up next, we have the reviews project, where we'll have reviews, and we'll use JavaScript to loop over those reviews, back and forth. And we'll also set up a random review. And as a side note, this random review will be a challenge. Since we have already covered random number and all that, at the end of the project, I'll tell you what I would want you to do. And then, of course, I'll show you my solution. But this is going to give you an option to try to find the solution for yourself. And at the moment, if I'm looking at my starter, of course, the only thing I have is the heading one with a value of review project. 
So I'm gonna head back to my project and then I don't want the heading one anymore. We will set up main tags here. And as always, we're just starting out with HTML and then we'll have the section with the class of container. So container and then within the container, we'll start with a title. So I'll add here comment and then there's gonna be a div with a class of title. And then within a title, we'll have two things. We'll have a heading two with whatever text you would want. So in my case, that will be reviews. And then also I'll place the underline and let's save it. And now, of course, I have my our reviews and then I have my underline as well. And after that, I would want to set up the actual review. So let's see where the div ends right here. We'll have the comment with a value of review. And then you know what? I think I'm going to scroll down a little bit just so I can see it better. We'll have the article with a class of review. And then within the article, we'll start by placing the image container. So there's going to be a div with a class of image container. Within the container, we'll have our image. And you'll see that in the setup files, you'll have the person one JPEG. So that's the image you're looking for. Now, of course, later, we'll use our data from the JavaScript. But for the time being, while we're still setting up the HTML, we'll just use a local image. So I'll say here, I'm looking for person one JPEG. And then I would want to add the ID for my image. So in this case, I'm going to say the ID will be person IMG. Let's save it. And we should have our card, at least some part of the card. And then we should also see the image. Okay, awesome. After that, we will have the heading four with an ID of author. So let's write here ID. And the ID will be author. As far as the name, we'll hard go in the beginning. So I'll have it as Sarah Jones. Then let's have a paragraph which will represent the job. So what job the person is doing. And then in this case, I'm going to go with UX designer. UX designer. And once I have the job, I think I'm going to go with an info. So paragraph with an ID of info. And then here I'm going to go with 20 words and we'll save it. So that should do it for the card. And now I would want to add, of course, my buttons. So I'll go first with a next one and previous one. So where I have the article still within the article, I will set up my prev and next buttons. So prev next buttons. And then in this case, I'm going to go with div button container. And then within this container, I'll have my two buttons, one with a class of prev button and the other one with a next button. And in there, I'll place my fantastic icons, which also, by the way, you have access to. So you have a folder. Well, we have the font awesome icons. So let's start with a button. The class will be prev btn. And then within a button, we'll have a FAS, FA Chevron, Chevron icon, and we'll have left. So that's the value Chevron left. Let's save it. That's the button. And now I'll copy and paste. And the only thing that I would need to change the class. So instead of left, we'll have the right one. And then if you want to do a challenge with me later, then I would suggest setting up the button right away. So again, if you don't want the button, then you can just ignore it. So right after this div, I'm just going to say a random button. And I'll have a button with a class of random button, random BTN. And then as far as the text, surprise me, we'll save it. We have our HTML. So of course, now we can start working on our logic using JavaScript. While hard coding all my values is awesome, probably a better option would be using JavaScript where we can set up our functionality. And in order to do that, we'll have to navigate to app.js. And once we arrive here, we'll see that we'll have the array. And then within that array, we'll have items. And each item represents specific person. So we have here name, we have the ID as a side note that we'll not use. This was just to mimic a more like real world response. Then we also have the job. So that of course would represent whatever we have right underneath the name. Then we'll have the image, which I'm just hosting on a cloud notary just for the easier access. And then also we have the text. And then before we continue, 
I would want to address the elephant in the room. Yes, normally you would get this type of data using Ajax request, so it would be somewhere else, and then you would just perform a HTTP request. Why we are setting up data locally? Well, it's very simple. We haven't covered what is Ajax and how to set up HTTP request. That's why, for the time being, we will use local data. And again, it is an array, array of objects here, and then each object represents a different person with different name, with different job, with different image, as well as different text. And we have total four items. That's why, as we'll be navigating back and forth, we will have four items. And what I would want to do first is get all the items that I would want from the index HTML. What am I talking about? I would want to access the image. I would want to access the author job info since we'll change these values dynamically. And as you can see, we have all of them with IDs. And also I'd want to target my prev and next buttons as well as the random one. Again, we'll do it at the very end as far as the random button, as far as the challenge, but I would want to select it right away. So in the app.js, we'll start with a bunch of get element by ID, as well as three query selectors. So we're going to have a comment here. Let's write select items. And then we're going to have const img. That will be equal to document get element by ID. And then for my image, I have the ID with a value of person img. Now I'll copy and paste four times. And once we have copied and pasted, now I would want to change these values around. But as a quick side note, yes, I'll collapse this reviews array because in my opinion, it takes up too much space and you have your own reference in your own app.js file. And like I said, the second one will be author. So I'd want to change this around. So you know what I'll use in this case, three cursors. I will delete this and then we'll also get rid of this image. So all of them will be gone and I'll use my two cursors to change these values. So the second one will be author. Then the third one will be job job. And the fourth one will be info. So again, two cursors and we'll have our info. Let's save it. And now let's select all of our three buttons. In this case, I'm not going to use a for each. So I'm not going to set up query select at all. I'm just going to select them one by one using query selector. So we're going to go with const, then prev btn is equal to document, and then query selector. And then in here, I'm looking for prev btn. Let's copy and paste these guys as well. And then we just need to change these values around. So next button. And then after that, I'll have my random one. So random. And then as far as the variables, we'll have the next button. And we'll have a random one as well. And then I'll start by setting up some kind of value. So I'm going to set up value of zero, which will represent my first item in the array. Again, because the arrays are zero index based, uh, that is going to be my first item. So I'll have the comment of set starting item. And I'll give it a value of current item. But of course, you can name it whatever you'd want as long as you remember that value as we're setting up functionality. So current item will be equal to zero. And the first thing that I would want to do is once my document loads, display the first item or whatever item you have here as far as the value. And remember the options you have are zero, one, two, three, because we have four items in the array. And that is going to be my initial value. Because again, at the moment, everything is hard coded. So what I would want to do once my document loads, then I would want to access whatever item from the array. So whatever number you have, I have zero. So I'll be selecting the first item and then all the variables that I have, the image, author, job and info. Well, I'll replace those values. So let's start very simply and we can do that by using DOM content loaded. So that's the event that I'm going to be listening for. So in here, I will have a load initial item, and we would want to add that event listener on the window object. So we'll go with window add event listener. And then again, the event name is Dom content loaded. 
and we'll start very simply by just console logging just to see when that happens. So I have my function, my callback function, and we'll have here console log with a text of shake and bake. And you'll see the moment my document loads, I'll have my shake and bake. And essentially this DOM content loaded event fires when the initial HTML document has been completely loaded and parsed. Okay, so we have our shake and bake in a console. Awesome, what's next? Well, now I'd want to access my first item and how I can do that. Well, technically I could just access it using reviews array, correct? Because we have reviews and then I can have my square brackets and then pass in my current item. But I think it's gonna be a little bit faster if I'll assign it to a variable. So I'm gonna go here, const item, and then we'll have reviews array since I would want to access items from my array. And then I'll just pass my current item. Again, whatever your value is over here, just make sure that you have values from zero to three. Because if the values are gonna be bigger, then of course I don't have any items. I only have items with indexes of zero, one, two, and three. And now of course I'm accessing my first item. Now why I think it's cool to assign it to a variable? Well, let's see. If I have, for example, image. On the image, I know that I have the source property. And then for the source property, I'll just set it equal to my image. Why am I setting equal to an image? Because now I assigned my item, my variable, to my first item. And then of course, in my first item, I have the image property, which gets me the image. So let's see. In the index, or oh, I'm sorry, not in the index. Let me actually collapse it. See, that's what happens if it's not collapsed. And then I'll just say item IMG. Again, why am I assigning this to a variable? Technically, I could have done this this way. So where I have reviews, then I have the current item. Sorry, not this one. Current item. And then I can look for the image, but I just find it easier if we have four instances to use item instead of reviews and then current item and then get whatever property I would want from the object. That's the only reason why I'm just assigning this to my item. And you'll notice the moment I save it, since my first item has this image, of course, now I have this image once my document loads. And if I'll change this value around to, for example, one, then of course, I'll have a different image. If I'll change this to two, then now I'm accessing the third item in my array and you get an idea. This is gonna be my number four. Now, if I'll go with number four, the actual number four, you'll see that we'll get an error in the console. That's why we can still see the image because we have card coded one, but in the console, I have the actual error. Why I have the error? Because it says, well, can I read the property image of undefined? Why? Because our item is undefined right now. Because in our array, we have only four items. So the last index is three. So if I'm trying to access something with a value of four, that would mean index of four. Of course, there's nothing there. That's the only reason why we're getting this error. Again, I'll go back to my zero one, and now I'd want to target the rest of them. Now, when I say rest of them, what do I mean? Well, I have the author, I have the job, and I have the info. So one by one, we'll have the author, and we'll go with text content. That's the property we're looking for. Since I don't want to add any kind of HTML, I just want to add text. And in here we'll have item.name. We'll save it. And of course, now the name is Susan Smith. I think we can collapse a little bit of DevTools just so we can see all the items we're adding here. And then we'll have job and then text content. We'll do that too. And this is going to be equal to my item job. Again, the property in my item object. And then last one will be my info and then text content. And that is equal to item and then dot text. We'll save it and of course all these four values are now applied once the document loads okay awesome and now i guess we can start working on this functionality where once i press i'll change the item so if i'm currently targeting zero i'll be just changing this value around and then of course i'll access different item in my array so if i'll go to next and of course i'll increase this number so now I'll access not the first item in my array, but then the second one, and you get an idea. Now, before I do that, 
I would like to refactor my code a little bit. Because even though the initial setup looked okay, imagine if we'll be increasing or decreasing that number, what do you think we'll do? We'll each and every time have to do something like this as well, correct? Because we'll have to not only get the item, but we'll also have to change the values. So it wouldn't be better if we would have a function that does that for us. So that way we don't need to set this up in our click events because we'll set up two click events for pre event button and also as a sign off for random as well. I'm giving you already hint what we'll do. And then I don't want to copy and paste the same code in all three of my event listeners. I might as well set this up as a function and then I can just reuse that function. How's that function going to look like? Well, we'll see in a second. So I'm going to go first with a comment of show person based on item here. And then I'm just going to have a function. Then the function name will be show person. Pretty self explanatory. And it's going to be looking for the number. So pass here the number. However, I'll name this number a person. Again, you can name this number, you can name this item, whatever you'd want. It's just a parameter. And then I'll have the same logic. So cut it out from my DOM content here and copy and paste. However, of course, I'm not going to be looking for the current item. I'm going to be looking for whatever is passed in here. So I'm just going to say here person. And this is exactly what I'm passing. So I'm going to say here person. Let's save that. Now I have my awesome function. And then within the callback function, I'll call this function. I'll say show person and now I'll pass in my current item. So I'm just going to say current item. Again, the functionality will not change. However, now we can reuse this function. So based on when we would want to call it, I'm just going to say show person and then pass in current item. Show person, pass in current item. Now, technically, you could access current item at the way it is. But since I wanted to practice of how we can pass in some arguments and then actually use those arguments, that's why I set up here as a parameter. Again, technically, if you really wanted to, and I'll show you that at the end, we can just access the current item since it is global anyway. But again, that is as a side note. So now let's set up those two event listeners. We have one for the pre and one for next. So we'll have comment, I guess, here. We'll say show next person. And you know what? Let me scroll down so we have more room. And I'll have my next btn and then i'll have add event listener so we'll be listening for the click event so once we click on our next button and then of course we'll have our function so our callback function and then within the function body i'll just increase current item i'm going to say current item plus plus so where is my plus plus and now of course i would want to call my show person and again i'll pass in my current item variable Let's save it. And at the moment, you can see, all right, so can it read property at event listener of no? Okay, what is happening? Well, I don't have this button. So I would need to check what is happening with my button, why I'm not accessing my button. And I'm going to check the actual index HTML. Let's see. And of course, I didn't change the class. So my bad, I did not change the class. Let me save it. Now I have next button. And now, of course, we're selecting correctly. And I'm just showing you that that yes, mistakes happen. That's part of being a developer. Once in a while, we make a mistake. And of course, when we talk about me, it's probably more than once in a while. But anyway, that's a different topic. So we have a show person. Okay, now I'm calling it. And now you'll see that each and every time we'll click, we'll access different person. So again, I click. Again, now notice I'm accessing the third item. And now I'm getting my fourth one. Now, what do you think is going to happen? when my current item is going to be bigger than three. And we already looked at it. We'll get an error, correct? So once I click on it, notice I'm getting my big fat error. Why? Because, again, we cannot access that item because it doesn't exist. So if the current item is four, then of course I cannot access it. And what would be the fix? Well, the fix would be very simple, where I'm going to say if and then I'm going to check my current item. If the value is bigger than reviews, and now we're looking for interesting thing. We're not looking just for the length. 
because let's think about it. What is the reviews length? That would be four, correct? Since I have four items. And what I'm saying here is if the current item is bigger than four. Well, if it is bigger than four, I'll still have my error because bigger than four means that my item will still be at least four. And if the item is four, I'll have no item in reviews that reflects that index of four. So what I need to say here, not only reviews length, but also I need to add minus one, which will mean that that reflects the actual last item in my array. So if that is the case, I'm just going to set my current item equal to zero. So I'm going to say if I'm at my last item in the array, then the current item is zero. So start from the scratch again. See, we keep on clicking. Once we get to the last item, we'll start from the scratch. And of course, we'll have to do the same thing with the pre one. So in this case, in order to speed this up, we can just copy and paste. I'll change this to pre button. Hopefully I have selected correctly this button. So I have my pre button. And now you know, I also add here a comment. I'll say show previous person. So pre person. Now, in this case, I don't want to do plus plus. I want to do minus minus because we'll be showing the previous person. Or again, at one point, we'll get an error because our value will be less than zero. And again, there's no items that have the index that is less of zero. So again, we would have to set up some kind of a statement. And in this case, I'm going to say if current item, current item is less than the zero. So if it's less than zero, then it's just going to be current item is equal to again, reviews length. So whatever is the length, length in our case will be four minus one. So now my value is three, which is equal to my last item. We'll save it. And now I can navigate both ways. I can go up. And once I reach my last person, I'll start from the scratch. And the same works back ways. So if I go back again, once I get to my first item, if I'm less than zero, then I just set it equal to the last one. And I'll start from the back of the array. Now, just to showcase that technically, if we didn't want, we didn't have to pass here the person, I could just remove this person. And then we can directly access our current item. I just thought it would be an awesome practice if we're passing in as an argument. So now, of course, each and every time where I'm calling the current item, can just delete it because I'm not passing in anymore as a parameter. So there's no point for me to set it up as a parameter. Because again, current item is a global variable. So I can access it from my show person. And then each and every time where I'm running the show person, well, I'll display the correct info anyway. So I'll do it this way. And we'll also delete the last one. Again, either way, how you have the functionality, it will work. Again, see? We're still clicking and we're still accessing the items. And now the last thing is the challenge. We already have used the random number quite a few times, correct? So here's what I would want you to do. We have our button, random button. Let me just double check that I have the class. Yes, I do. Everything is fine. So I'm selecting my button. I would want you to add a event listener to our button. And then once the user clicks the button, I would want you to get a random item from my reviews array. Again, we have the button, random button, add the event listener, listen for click events. And then in the function body, remember how we set up random number, how we used array length to get the specific number in the range of our array. And then of course, use the show person once you have accessed that particular item. So pause the video and resume once you're done just so you can see what is my solution. How did you do? Hopefully everything went fine. And this is my solution. So right after pre button, I'll go with a comment of show random person, show random person. Remember, we had our random button. So I'm going to add event listener, I'm going to be listening for click events. And here I will have my function. So I'm going to have my callback function. And then within a function body, I'm just going to have to access the random number that is from my array. So I'm going to have to create a random number that reflects the numbers 
that are possible in my array. So I would have numbers between zero and three because I have four items. So my possibilities would be zero, one, two, and three. And then I would want to assign it to my current number. So since I would want to get the random number and I'm using the current item, I'm just going to have to assign my current item to that random number. And again, we have covered already random number. So this should feel like home where we have the current item. So now I'm just saying what is going to be value for my current item. We use the math floor since we would want to round it down to a closest lowest integer. Then we'll use math and then random. So this is going to generate that random number. And then again, we'll multiply by the reviews length. Why? Because the range should be between zero and three. So those are my possible numbers. Zero, one, two, and three, because those are my indexes. And then, of course, once I have this particular item, if you want, you can test it out with console logging like so. So we can just say current item. And then right after that, we can just call our show person. So we'll call here show person. And you'll see in the console, I'll have my random numbers. So for example, this is zero. And then, of course, I'm also displaying that item. So this is my first item. Then I have the first one, or I'm sorry, more correctly, this is the second one. And then again, I'm getting my last one now. And off we go. So all the time I'm getting my random person from the array. And of course, we can switch to a bigger screen. And we can see that we can iterate over array, like so back and forth. And also we can get a random person from our array. Awesome. And up next, we have navbar toggle project, where we'll have a navbar. So this is how it's going to look on a bigger screen. And then once we make the screen size smaller, then of course, we would want to toggle the links. So I wouldn't want to display them right away. Only once we click on a button, then we will display the links. And as always, we will start with our HTML. And at the moment, if you're looking at the file, that's the only thing you can see is the heading one with a text of nav bar project. And I'll start by creating a nav. So of course, I will delete my heading one, my awesome heading one. And then within a nav, I'll have a div with a class of nav center. And I'll place a nav header and the links. Now, don't worry, we'll not have to type out all the links. The actual HTML is already provided. So I'm going to go here with nav header comment. And then, of course, I'll have my actual div with a class of nav header. And then in here, I'll place the image with a class of logo. Now, first, we need to find our logo. So the file name is logo SVG and class. And like I said, the class name was logo. And in here, we can just write as alternative also a logo. Now, the second thing that we'll have within our header is going to be our toggle button. So we're going to go here with button. And then the class will be nav toggle. We have our button. Now within a button, I'll place my font awesome icon. So F A S F A bars. Now I'll have my icon. And once we have created a header, now I would want to set up my links. Now, since I wouldn't want us to waste our time and type them out manually, I did provide them in resources. So I'll open up the sidebar, then I'll look for utils txt. And then in here, you'll find the links. Again, it's just a straight up HTML. That's why we will not type it out altogether. I will copy that and then we'll navigate back to index HTML. And then I'll look for the end of the header. So this is going to be my div end of header. Good. And then we'll copy and paste our links as well as social media icons. Now, of course, there's a little bit of CSS already. That's why you cannot see the social icons, but you can definitely see the links. So that's going to be look on a smaller screen. But then once we get to the bigger screen, of course, we'll have our full blown nav bar. Now, let me test it out. I have the current project. As you can see, this is going to be the nav bar on a bigger screen. But then once we get to the smaller screen, we have our links displayed like this. And of course, we'll have to set up our JavaScript where once we click on a toggle, we will toggle the links. Now, before we start typing away our code, the functionality in the JavaScript, I think it's extremely important for us to understand the general concept of how the toggle will work. And we'll start by getting the height for our links. And again, we're talking about two things. 
effectively, we're talking about the links class. That's what we're interested in. That's what will toggle the height for our links for our links around the pages. And then, of course, we'll do that once we click on the nav button. So those are the two things that we will look in the JavaScript. So target them, we'll assign them to a variable. And then, of course, we'll set up a add event listener to the button. But what will happen, technically, we can actually do manually. So I'll show you first the manual example without clicking the button. And then, of course, we'll set up all the JavaScript. Now, like I said, we're looking for two things. We're looking for nav button and the links. And in order to have our setup, we'll need to know what is the height for the links when they are open. And I think the easiest is to do it on a bigger screen. So let me inspect the element. And you'll see that if I'm looking for my links, I have the height of 160, which effectively is 10 REMs. So that's already a good start. And then by default, I would want to hide the links. And only once I add a specific class, then the links will get the height. So let me show you quickly CSS. In the style CSS, you'll have a links class, which at the moment has this height zero, overflow hidden, and then transition is equal to transition. And then another class, show links, has the height of 10 RMs. Now, why this height is 10 RMs? Because my height over here, once the links are open, is 160 pixels, which is 10 REMs. So that answers this question. But then, like I said, I want to hide links by default. And the way I can do that is by adding height equal to zero. Then also, I would want to set up overflow hidden, because otherwise, you'll see that even if I have the height of zero, I'll still be able to see the links. And you know what? I think it's going to be easier if I just uncomment it. And now, as you can see, if I just have the height of zero, you'll see that I can still see the links. That's why we're adding this overflow hidden. Okay, good. And then why we're adding this transition, because I would want that change from height zero to 16 REMs to happen over time. So if I'll check it out the finished project, you'll see how this change is happening over time, not instantly. That's why I added this transition. And of course, I already have some kind of value in the CSS variable. And then the only thing we'll do is we will toggle this show links class. So when we click the button, we will check if the show links is already there, then we will remove it. If it's not there, then we'll add it. And that's how we'll set up our toggle functionality. So let me show you a manual setup. And then of course, we'll do the same thing using JavaScript. Again, remember, the class name is show links, and we'll just manually add it to a links and then remove it. So I'll navigate to my developer tools, and then I'll look for links. Now remember, by default right now, we're hiding the links. We have height zero, overflow hidden, and then this transition. And now what I would want to do is just manually add this class. So notice I have my honor list with a class of links. And in here, I'm just gonna write show links. Now once I add it, check it out. Of course, I can see the links. Now if the class is already there, and if we remove it, then of course, my class disappears. And this is exactly what we'll do using JavaScript. We'll target the button. Then once we click the button, we'll check whether the show links class is already on the on our list. If it is, then we'll remove it. If it's not, then of course, we'll add it. And that way, we'll be able to toggle our links. Beautiful. Once we understand the general concept behind the toggle functionality, now it's time to implement it. So I'll head back to my project and I'm looking for app js and then in the app js you'll find some comments and of course i will explain what they mean in a second but we'll start by targeting two things we will target our nav toggle as well as links and i'll assign them to some kind of variables so nav toggle and that will be equal to document then since i have a class there i think i'm going to go with query selector and then the class i'm looking for is toggle then we'll copy and paste and I'm looking for the links. So not nav toggle, but I'm looking for the links. Of course, I'll have to assign it to some kind of variable. And in my case, I'm going to go with links. Of course, I would want to set up some kind of event listener as I'm clicking on a button. So that's our next job. I'm going to go with nav toggle, then add event listener. I'll be listening for click events. And then we'll have our callback function. So we'll have our function. 
and then within the function body, we'll start by console logging the class list. Now, what is a class list property? It returns or shows or gets however you want to call it all the classes that the element has. Now, in our case, which element are we looking for? We're looking for the links. So I would want to know what classes links has. And the way we write that, we just go with links. So that is, of course, our element. And then I'm looking for the class list. And of course, I'll open up the dev tools since it's very important us to see what is happening here. So console. And then once I click notice, I have the list of classes that the links currently have. Now, of course, the only class that's there is the links class because we haven't added the show links. OK, that's awesome. But then what are our next steps? Well, what happens is not only we have a class list, but then we also have methods. We have contains and that is going to check whether specific class is there and then we can add the class. So that would be add method. Then, of course, we can remove it. That would be remove method. And then we have the most beautiful one the toggle one. Now we'll do a long way just because I would want you to understand how everything works. And then, of course, at the very end, we'll just use a one liner using the toggle. And we'll start simply by looking at the contains. So what happens once we run the contains with some kind of random class? So copy and paste. So in this case, I'm not looking for the links. However, I will leave this for your reference. So I'll comment this out. And then I'll say links class list. And then, like I said, the method name is contains. And then within the contains, we are passing in what class are we checking for? So in our case, I'm just going to go with some kind of random class, which definitely is not there. So what I would want to see is what is going to be the response. And then once I run it, once I click on it, notice I get the response of false. So what that means is that this random class is not on the links, which we already knew because the only class that's there is, of course, the links. Now, if I'll copy and paste, and if I'm going to add here links class, I should get true, correct? Because that's the class that should be already on my on order list. Once I click, of course, my next response is true. So knowing this, we could set up a if statement, correct? So I could say if links class list contains, and then, of course, the class that I'm looking for is show links, not the links. If the class is already there, then I would want to remove it, correct? Because we're toggling. But if the show links class is not already added to my links, then of course, I would want to add it. And again, I will come this out just so you can have it for your own reference. But I'm going to go with if, then links, then again, class list, and we're looking for contains method. And I'm going to pass in show links. And if that is the case, if the show links is already there, again, we're setting up a toggle functionality. So if it's there, what I would want to do? Well, then I would want to remove it. So I'm going to go with links, then class list, then the method name is remove. And then again, I need to pass in show links class. Now, what happens if my response is false? Because at the moment, of course, I'm setting up functionality based on the fact that this is true. So if the show links is already there, then of course I'm removing. But if it's not true, if it is false, so if the class is not there, then I'm just going to say else. And now I would want to add it. So I'm going to go with links, then class list, then add, and then we'll pass in show links class. And now let's test it out how our functionality will work. Again, I'll look for my toggle button. Check it out. Once I click, I'm adding the class. And then once I click it one more time, then of course I'm removing. And that's how we can toggle our links. Now, like I promised, of course, there is a one liner and that one liner is a toggle method, which just takes a class. So it's looking for a class again, in our case, show links. And then if the class is there, then of course it removes it. And if the class is not there, then it adds it. So instead of writing one, two, three, four, five lines of code, we can do it in one liner. And the way it will work is going to be links, class list, then toggle. Just make sure that you pass in the correct class, in our case, show links, and you'll see how our functionality will still work. So I'm going to comment out my previous code, and you'll still see that everything works as expected. So as I'm clicking, 
I can still toggle my links now just to show you that it is exactly the same as our manual setup. The only difference we are adding the JavaScript, as you can see, if I navigate back to my project, I have my links and show links. And as we're clicking, we're just adding the class or removing the class. Now, one more gotcha that I would like to mention is the fact of what is happening on a bigger screen. So you see, I'm setting up here the media query. So once we get to the bigger screen, I remove the toggle button and then I show the links as well as the actual social media icons. Now, it is important when you are setting up that media query that for the links, you have to add this height auto. Now, let me show you what happens if you don't do it. So I'll comment this out and you'll see that right now, once I get to the bigger screen, I have this weird height for my links. Now, why do you think this is happening? Well, I can tell you right away it is happening because we added, of course, the show links. So what was the height for the show links? My head, of course, was 10 REMs or 160 pixels. And that's why these links are going to be so massive. And not only that, if, for example, I remove those links. So if I make sure that I click on a button and then I hide the links, if I'll get to a bigger screen, you won't see the links at all. And why is that happening? Because in this case, we have, of course, the height of zero and then overflow hidden. So that's why it is important once you get to a bigger screen, once you set up your media query, make sure you add height of auto to the links. And once you do, regardless whether the links were shown or hidden, they will appear on a bigger screen. So that's how we can set up toggle functionality using JavaScript. Beautiful. Up next, we have sidebar project where we'll have the sidebar and we'll use JavaScript in order to toggle the sidebar as well as close the sidebar. Now, don't worry, you will not have to write any CSS, but I will show you that on a smaller screen, sidebar will span 100%. So all across the screen, then on a bigger screen, it's just going to have a fixed width. And also we'll add some links as well as social media icons. But again, I already prepared some code for you. So we'll not have to spend countless hours typing out HTML. But we will have to start with HTML. And once I navigate to my setup project, I can see that the only thing I have is sidebar project. And of course, we would need to add some items here. And I'll start with a close button. So there's going to be a button. And then that button will have a class of sidebar toggle, class sidebar, and then hyphen toggle. And then within this button, we'll go with FAS, FA, and then bars. That is the class name. So now, of course, I have my close button. And then once I have the button, I will set up my sidebar. So here I'll have a side. That is the name of the element. The class will be sidebar. And then within the aside, we'll just set up a header. And we talk about header. We have the image. So that's our logo as well as the close icon. And then the rest of it, I'll provide the code for you because again, I think that it is important to have it because it represents a proper sidebar, but I don't think that it is important for us to type out the HTML. So the code is already prepared. We only need to set up a header. So I'll go here with sidebar header. And then within this div, I'm going to add first an image. So IMG for the source, we'll use logo SVG. I do want to add a class here. Class will be logo. And right after that, I would want to have a button, my close button. So let's write button, then class close BTN, close BTN. And then within this button, we'll go with FS, FA, and then times. Let's save it. And now, of course, I can see the sidebar. Don't worry about the fact that you cannot see the close button. That is on purpose. And we'll fix that in a second. Now, after the header, like I said, I would want to add the links, but I wouldn't want to type them out. And in order to speed things up, if you'll notice the files, you'll see utils.txt. And in here, you'll have the links. So again, it is just a on our list. Each list item represents a page that we don't have, however, we do have the link, for example, to index HTML, about HTML and all that. And then the same goes for social media icons where we have on our list, list items, and then each item is just a link 
to a social media account. Again, it's just a straight up HTML. So I thought we could save a little bit of time and skip to typing. And I'll select everything. I'll copy that. And then in the index HTML, I will look for the end of the header. So make sure that you copy and paste in the sidebar, but right after the sidebar header. Paste. And you should see here the links as well as social media icons. Now, of course, I can close my sidebar and we can figure out how to add functionality using JavaScript. Before we start typing away our JavaScript functionality in the app JS, I think it would be very crucial that we understand our setup and the way it will work if we look at the styles CSS. And if we navigate down, the last thing you'll see here is the class of sidebar. So that is my sidebar. I'm using here position fixed. I'm placing it on top left corner and width and height is 100. That's why it's taking up all the space. And then once we get to a bigger screen, then I'm just using the width of 400. How are, how are we going to show and hide the sidebar? Well, by default, I would want to hide the sidebar. How I can do that? I could use the transform property and then set it equal to a value of translate minus 100. So what this will do, it will push the sidebar left 100% of its own width. So what it means, it will disappear from the page. So the moment you will uncomment it, you'll see that our sidebar disappears. Now, in order to show the sidebar, again, we'll add this transform and translate. However, in this case, the translate will be zero. What that means is it's just going to go back to its default position, which was exactly what we saw a second ago. And we'll add that in a show sidebar class. And what we'll do with JavaScript, we're just going to toggle this class. So if this class will be added to our sidebar, then of course, we will show the sidebar. If the class won't be there, then of course, we'll go back to default, which is translate minus 100%, which means that the sidebar has been removed from the page. And there's no better way than doing it manually, because this will give us a clear understanding what we are doing with a JavaScript. So I'll navigate to a bigger screen. I'll look for a current project. Notice my sidebar is gone. But then if I open up the dev tools, and if I look for my elements, I can just manually add the sidebar class, and you'll see that our sidebar will appear. So I'm looking for my sidebar. Of course, at the moment, our sidebar has this class of sidebar. But what is the class that shows the sidebar? Well, that is this one, the transform translate. And the name of it is show sidebar. Now, as a side note, by the way, you can also toggle it here in a dev tools like this. But since in a JavaScript, we will add and remove the class, I'll type it out here. Notice where I have the sidebar, I'll just say show sidebar class. So that's the class we'll add later with JavaScript. Once the class is there, check it out, we can see our sidebar. Now, if I'll remove that class, then of course, sidebar won't be there. So it's going to be a little bit of mix. We have already CSS prepared, but I'm just showing you that effectively, this is the only thing we're doing. We'll add or remove the class. And that's how our functionality will work. Excellent. Once we have covered what is our goal, let's proceed to AppJS and start tapping away. And I'll start by selecting three things. I would like to select my sidebar toggle. I would like to select my actual sidebar as well as the close button. So those are the three things that I would want to select in my AppJS. And I'll start with my toggle button. So toggle BTN. And in this case, again, we'll use the query selector. So I have query selector and the class is a sidebar toggle. Now I do need to add, of course, my dot sidebar toggle. And then I'll copy and paste two more times. And the next one is the close button. So this is going to be close button. And the class is also close BTN, close, close BTN. And then we have one more, which is our sidebar. So let's write here sidebar. And then instead of sidebar toggle, we'll have our sidebar. We'll save it. And then I would want to add event listener to my toggle button. And I would like to listen for click events. So we're going to go with toggle button 
then add event listener. We're well, listening for click events, and then we'll have our function, our callback function. And then within the callback function, like I said, we'll just check whether the sidebar, which we have, of course, selected, has the class of show sidebar. If it doesn't, we will add the show sidebar class. If it already has the show sidebar class, then, of course, we will remove it. And just so we all are on the same page, I'll start by console logging the class list of the sidebar. So right here, sidebar and then class list, just so we can see what classes we'll have. So I'll open up the dev tools. We'll click on a toggle and a console. We should see only one value. So that's the only class that currently our sidebar has. And then we have two options. We can go the long way or we can use the toggle. Now, since I would want to torture you a little bit, I'll write the long way first, and then we'll do the short way also. So we'll say if sidebar, so if sidebar, and then we have the class list property, of course, and then we have the contains. And using the contains, I can just say, if the sidebar has the show sidebar class, then of course, I would want to remove it. But if it doesn't have the class, I would want to add it. So in here, I will say sidebar, then class list, and then I'll say remove. Why? Because in this case, I'm checking if the sidebar has the class. Then, of course, since I have the toggle button, I would want to remove that class. And what class am I talking about? Of course, I'm talking about show sidebar class. And I'll set up also the else. What does that mean? It means that the sidebar does not have the class. So if I'm hitting the else, that means that sidebar doesn't have the show sidebar class. So just add it. So say sidebar class list and then add. And of course, the class that I'm talking about is show sidebar. We'll save it. I'll navigate to a bigger screen. It's going to be easier to see. And you can see that as I'm clicking, of course, I'm doing exactly what we did previously when we were manually controlling it. So now we're just checking if the sidebar has the class. Awesome. We'll remove it. If it doesn't, then we're just adding the class. But we can save ourselves quite a bit of code, considering the fact that there is a method called toggle. So I'll leave this for your reference. So that is still going to be there. But a much faster way is writing sidebar, then class list, then toggle. And now I just need to say which class I would want to toggle. And again, in our case, that is show sidebar. We'll save it. And now again, I'll check on a bigger screen because it is much more easier since the sidebar is not covering my button. And of course, still the functionality works. However, I was able to do it in one line where previously I believe I had five. So that would be a little bit faster way where we can use our toggle and then just pass whichever class we would want, which in our case, of course, is show sidebar. And then, of course, I would want to work on my close button as well. So I'll open up my sidebar. Now I need to target my close button. So I'll go with close BTN, then add event listener. We'll listen again for the click events. We'll have our function, our callback function. And then within the function body, we'll just say that we will remove the class. That's the only thing that the close button needs to do. Because at this point, we already have added that show sidebar. If we can click on a close button, that means sidebar is open, and that means we just need to remove the class. So what code am I looking for? This one. Sidebar class list remove. And I'll speed things up by just copying and pasting. We'll save it. Again, let's open up the sidebar, then close it, and we're good to go. So as you can see, we have our functionality. We can see our sidebar. We can hide our sidebar, and we're good to go. Again, the main thing is to set up the CSS where you hide the sidebar by default, and then you're just toggling the class that has that value of transform translate zero. Great. And up next, we have the model project, where if I open up the project, you'll see that we'll have some kind of background image. In the center, there's going to be some content. So some kind of banner, of course, in our case, it's just going to be a title of our project. And then we'll have a button. And the moment we click the button, Notice we'll get a model with a nice overlay 
and then some modal content, which in our case, again, is just going to be a one sentence. And of course, we'll have an option of closing the modal. Once I click the modal, notice modal is gone. And we'll start with our HTML. So I'll head back to my setup project and then probably make this side a little bit smaller. And I don't want the heading one. In fact, we will set up our hero first. And we talk about hero, we talk about a massive background image and then some kind of content in the center. That's why we're referring to as a hero. So go with hero and of hero. And then within hero, we'll go with a header with a class of hero. Of course, CSS is already added, so we don't need to worry about it. And then we'll go with a banner. And then with a banner, we'll place a heading one with a text of modal and then project, as well as the button that will open up the modal. So we'll have a button. And then for the button, I would want to add two classes. One is going to be the generic button class that just going to add some styling. And then also we'll have a modal BTN, which of course we'll utilize in our JavaScript. As far as the text, I'll write open modal. I'll save it. I should have my hero. Awesome. And I would want to set up a modal. Now, this project is going to be a little bit different because I'm going to give you a challenge in the beginning of the next video. That's why as we're typing out the modal, you won't be able to see the modal. And again, that is done on purpose because I would want you to start the next video with a little bit of challenge. So don't worry, as long as your classes are exactly as mine, everything will work. But at the moment, as you're typing everything out, nothing will change on the screen. So in this case, what are we looking for is modal. So I'll have a comment of modal, then I'll have a modal overlay class. So div with a class of modal overlay, like so. And then within this div, we'll have a modal container. So we're looking for the class of modal container. And then within this container, we'll have two things, a heading and a button. So pretty much the same setup. Only in this case, of course, what we're talking about is the close button. So if I open up the model, notice we'll have some kind of content. And that is going to be a heading three, and then the close button. But again, at the moment, as you will be typing this out, you won't see anything because the CSS is already added where it hides the model. Okay, so don't worry about it. Just keep on typing away and make sure that the class names match though. Otherwise, if they won't match, then of course, you'll not be able to follow along. So I'm going to go with heading three modal content, and then I'll have my close button. I'll add here a class of close. So class close BTN. And then within a button, I'll place my font awesome icon. And the classes are going to be I F S A F A times. And once I save, as I keep on repeating, we won't see anything in a browser, but we can start working on our functionality. Since it's not our first rodeo, essentially, we have done quite a few projects together. And the setup is almost the same as we had for the sidebar and the nav bar. I would want to give you a challenge where I would want you to try to create the project yourself. Now, don't worry, I'll still give you a guidelines and all that. But instead of giving you a general concept like I was doing for the sidebar and for the nav bar, I would want you to try doing the project yourself. And the way it will work. If we head to style CSS, you'll see the modal overlay class. Again, the class is modal overlay. Now we're using position fixed. We're placing on top of the rest of the content. But then, like I already previously mentioned, I already added CSS that will hide the model. That's why at the moment we cannot see the model. Now, if you'll comment out these two lines, then of course you'll be able to see the model. Now, the class that shows the model like in a previous project is called open model. Again, remember with the sidebar and then with the nav bar for both of them, we had a class that was just toggling the sidebar or the nav bar. So the same works over here where the model is hidden by default. And then we're using this open model class to toggle the model. So here's what I would want you to do. Head to app.js and then you'll see the comments. And as you can see, these are the steps that I would want you to take. I would want you to select model button, modal overlay, and close button. So what are those three things? Well, if we check out our HTML, I could see the model button. 
I can see the model overlay. And of course, I can also see the close button. Then once you have selected them, I would want you to add a vent listener to model button and the close button. So both buttons and add event listener. And of course, you'll be listening for the click event. And then when the user clicks the modal button, I would want you to add open modal class to a modal overlay. But then when the user clicks the close button, then of course, I would want you to remove the open modal class from the modal overlay. Now, of course, I will show you my solution in the upcoming video. And also, if you would like to take a peek of how the final project looks like, of course, you can head to final directory. But I would really want you to at least try doing it yourself because you'll notice as you're struggling with things, you'll learn way more than just watching me type out everything in front of you. All right, hopefully you're able to complete the project on your own. And here goes my solution. So I'll start by targeting three things, modal button, modal overlay, as well as the close button. So go with const modal btn is equal to document, then query selector. And then the class that I'm looking for is modal btn. So not particularly original, but it will do its job. And then I'll copy and paste two times. And then of course, I would want to change these values. So for the second one, I'll have a variable of modal. And then the third one will be my close button. So close btn. And now, of course, I do need to change these classes around too. And then the modal has the class of modal overlay. So let me delete the button part and just add modal overlay. And then, of course, for the close button, the class is close btn. And then, like I said, I would want to add two event listeners, one for each button. So I'll go with modal btn. And then I'm looking for add event listener. I'll be listening for click events. And here I'll have my callback function. And I'll do the same thing for my close one. So let me copy and paste. The only difference is that, of course, I'm going to be adding this to my close button. So I have both of the event listeners. And then once I click on a modal button, I would want to add that open modal class to a modal overlay. And again, just to recap, in the CSS, we are hiding modal by default. That's why we have this visibility hidden and then Z index minus 10. So this open modal class has the visibility of visible and then Z index of 10. Well, that's why when we add this class, we'll be able to see the modal. And then once we remove the class, again, modal will be hidden. That's the whole setup for our modal. And I already have selected my modal. So I have modal. Then remember, we had a property with a value of class list. And then since I would want to add it, I'm going to run add method. And then the class name that I'm looking for is open modal. That's the class. And then I'll copy and paste. And in here we'll have a remove. So once we click on the close button, then of course we'll have remove. Let's save it. And then the moment I press on the button, of course I can see my modal. And then I also have the close button. So of course I can hide the button. Now, if you'd like to test it out on a bigger screen, of course, we can navigate there. That is my current project. I click on opening the model. I have some kind of content and then I can close it. Now, if you'd want to test it out, of course, you can head to index HTML and just add more stuff within the model. So it's more than just a simple heading three. Well, that should do it for a project. Hopefully you were able to solve the challenge and I'll see you in the next project. Awesome work. And up next, we have questions project where we can imagine that in one of our sites or in one of our projects, we'll have a Q&A section. And then, of course, we have some general questions. And then if the user wants to see the answers, of course, he or she needs to click on the plus icon and we can see our answer. Now, a few cool things that we'll learn during this project is how we can close the rest of the items once we open the second one. So notice once I opened up the second one, then only this one stays open and the previous was closed. And also this project will have two solutions where in one solution, we will traverse the DOM, we'll navigate up and down the DOM tree. And then the second option will be selecting elements from within the element. And I completely understand that this sounds like a gibberish right now, but don't worry, once we get there, 
you understand completely what I mean. But as always, we do need to start with our index HTML. Effectively, we do need to add our HTML. And of course, I don't want questions project heading one, which is in my setup. I'll delete it. I think I'll close the sidebar for time being as well, just so I have a little bit more real estate. And then what I'm looking for here is a section with a class of questions. So section class of questions, not question questions. And then I'll start by having some kind of title. So let me add here maybe a comment first. So title and then div with a class of title. Then within the title, I'm going to place a heading to with a text of general questions. And then right after the title, I'll have my section center. So let me add again comment of questions, questions like so. And then the div with the class of question center or you know what? No section center. Sorry, not question section, section center. And then within this div, we'll have three articles, which each of them will represent a single question. So I'm going to go here with the comment single question, and I'll copy and paste. And this is just my preference when I'm copying and pasting something to have the opening comment and the closing one, because that way I know that I just need to grab both of them and I'm good to go. And then, like I said, it will be an article and then it will have a class of question. And then within this article, we'll have two things. We'll have the title. So again, depending on your question, this will be your title. And then, of course, we'll have two buttons. Now, at the moment, you can see only one. But in order to set everything up, of course, we'll have two buttons here. We'll have a plus one and then the minus one. Now, technically, they both will be spans within the same button, but don't worry, we'll get there. The general idea is like this, where we have the paragraph and the button. So I'm going to go here with the paragraph with some kind of text. Now you can come up with your own text, but I'm just going to go with, do you accept all major credit cards? And then question mark. And then right after the paragraph, like I said, we'll have a button. And then for the button, we'll add a type of button just to stay consistent. And then class is important. And that one is question BTN. And then, like I said, within this button, we'll have two things. We'll have two icons, one plus and one minus. Now, both of them are placed within these spans, and both of them will have some kind of unique class. So for the span one, we'll have a class and the value will be plus icon plus hyphen icon. And then within the span, I'll have my font awesome where I'll have classes of F A R and then F A hyphen plus and then sorry, plus here and then hyphen square square. Now that is going to be my plus icon. OK, good. Once I save it, that should be my look. And you know what? I think I missed out on a div. So my apologies. Instead of just placing it willy nilly, you know what? Within the question, I'll have to have one more class. So I'll have here question and then hyphen title. My apologies. I should have added it in the beginning, but I guess I'll have to do it right now. So let me move it up. I'll have question title. And in this case, I think I'm going to add here a comment as well of question title. And then within this div, we will place the paragraph and then the button with two spans. At the moment, we have one, but don't worry, we'll fix that in a second. So I have my first span, awesome. And then I'll have a second one. Now for this guy, though, the class will be minus icon. So that's the class on the span. And then for the font awesome, I'll have FAR and then FA, FA plus, or I'm sorry, minus, I guess, minus square. Like so, let's save it. And now I have two buttons. Now, don't worry, we still need to do some general setup. So at the end, we'll have only one as we're clicking, but for the time being, we'll have two. So that should do it for our title. Now, let me see where my title ends. All right, over here. And then I'll have my question text. So question text. And of course, there's going to be corresponding div as well with a class of question text. And then within the question text, I'm just going to have a paragraph with, I don't know, 20 words, 30 words. It's really up to you. I'll save it. Okay, awesome. 
And now I'm just going to copy and paste. Now I'm not going to go really crazy. I'm just going to have three questions. Just remember, functionality will work regardless. So if you want to add 20 questions here, feel free to do it. But in my opinion, you probably don't want to watch me how I add 20 questions. So I'm just going to add two more. So like I said, I'll select everything starting with single question to the end of single question. And I'll just copy and paste two times. So one, two. And then I'm just going to change some values around and I'll take a look at the text. So do you support organic ingredients? Or I'm sorry, do you use organic ingredients? I guess I was reading both questions at the same time. And that also happens sometimes. So in this case, I'm looking for my third question. And I just want to change the text. That's all we have to do. So again, we don't need to change any classes or anything like that. We just have to have a different text here. And I'll do the same thing for my second question, just so I can speed up a little bit. Let me get my text. I'll scroll up. And this should do it. We'll have our second text as well. And now I have all the questions, I can see all the answers and all that. So now of course, we can proceed and start setting up our functionality in a JavaScript. Before we start typing away our functionality, like in some of the previous projects, I would want you to understand general concepts first. So essentially how it will work without JavaScript. And then once we start adding JavaScript, we already have general idea of what we need to accomplish. So if we head to styles CSS, keep on scrolling in the bottom, you'll see a bunch of classes that have been commented out. And what we would want to do is hide this question text by default. So the moment page loads, I'm hiding this question text. And then only once we click on a button, then we'll display that. And the way we'll do that is we have a question text class, of course. And that's why we have equal to display none by default. So the text will be hidden. And then again, we'll introduce a class by the name of show text. Now, once this show text has been added to a question, then question text class will have a value of display block. What does that mean? That means that question will be visible. And as far as the icons, by default, I'll hide the minus icon. That's why I'll have minus icon display none. But then again, class will be added by the value of show text. And then once that class is added, then minus icon will be displayed and plus icon will disappear. So we need to uncomment this. And we'll right away see that text is gone. Minus icon is gone. And then again, we can do the manual setup, where we'll add this class show text manually, just so we can see how everything works. Now I'm not going to a final project, even though technically I could, but I'm just going to go to the project where we're currently working. I will crack open my dev tools. I'm looking for the question. And then again, you can add it to any questions. But of course, I'll do it to the first one because it's just convenient. And I'll add here quotation mark, which I just deleted. And then like I said, the class name is show text. And you'll see the moment I run it, I have two things happening. I have the minus icon instead of the plus one. And then I can see the text. And then of course, the moment I'll remove this class, what do you think will happen? Well, it's just going to go back to the default. And again, effectively, this is what we'll do with JavaScript. We'll dynamically add this class. And then the moment we click one more time, then of course, we'll remove it. We'll just be toggling like we did for the sidebar, for the nav bar, as well as for the modal. But there's going to be some more interesting things here. Because again, we have multiple items. So now we'll take a look at how we can make sure that we close one of them if we open the other one, and that sort of stuff. Like I mentioned in one of the previous videos, in this project, we'll take a look at two possible options. One will be traversing the DOM, and you'll see what that means in a second. And the second one will be using selectors inside the element. And I would want to start with traversing the DOM option. So I'll open up the sidebar. I'm looking for my app.js. And as you can see, I have two comments. So we'll type out first traversing the DOM. And then we'll comment this out just so we can have it for our own reference. And then we'll use the second option using selectors inside the element. And I would want to start by selecting all the buttons. Now, what buttons am I looking for? I'm looking for the question button. So what I would want to do is I would want to select all 
three question buttons. And then once I have selected them, I'll loop over them. And then I'll add click event listener. And then I'll just make sure that the parent is in fact the question. And then we'll just add that particular class. Remember, show text to the parent to the question. So let's start by selecting all the buttons. And again, we just need to come up with some kind of variable. In my case, that is going to be BTNS. So BTNs and then document, then query selector. But I do need to add all because there's going to be multiple of them. And the class name is question BTN. So once I have selected all the buttons, awesome. Then I would want to loop over them because I would want to add that event listener to each and every button. So I'm going to go with BTNS and then for each. And then remember, we had a callback function. And then within this callback function, as a parameter, we could access each and every item, which in our case is just that button in our list. Okay, good. And then as far as the button, and by the way, since it is a parameter, I just need to add it here. So I'll name this button, but you can name this orange. And then I'll say button add event listener, listen for click events. And then we have another callback function. So in this case, I would like to access the event object. So I'm going to go here with E. And then for the time being, we'll just console log the current target. So I'm going to go with log, then event, and then current target. Let's save it. I'll open up the console just so you can see that there is no black magic. And once I click, check it out. Of course, this is my button. And I can clearly see that as I'm hovering, notice it tells me that this is the button that I just clicked. So if I'm going to click on a second one, of course, this will reference the second button. So now what I would want to do? Well, I would want to traverse the DOM, which is a fancy way of just moving up and down the DOM tree. And then if you would like to know more, we can just head to our bigger browser window and then notice, of course, I have my question, right? And then I have the question title. So what I would want to do? Well, once I click on a button, I would want to check who is the parent. Now, direct parent is the question title, correct? Because I have a question title and then the button is sitting within the title. But what I'm looking for is this question. So that is going to be the parent of the parent. So the moment I click on a button, I know that I have clicked on one of the buttons. And then I'm just going to say, get me the parent and more specifically parent of the parent. So once you get that parent, then just add that show text to a parent. And we can do that because in JavaScript, we have a property by the name of parent element. And we can simply do this this way where I have current target. And let's just test it out. Parent element. Now, once we click, what do you think is going to happen? Am I going to see the current target, which would be the button where I'm going to have the title? And you can probably tell already, by the way, I'm asking the question that probably the answer is title. So I'll click here. Notice, is this a button or a title? And this right away tells me which actual title it is. So since I clicked on a second button, of course, right now I'm referencing the second title. I'm not referencing the third. I'm not referencing the one. I'm referencing exact same title where the button is sitting. And if we put two and two together, so if we have event, so that is, of course, our event object, and we have current target, which is our button, then we have a parent, which is a title. What do you think we would need to add here in order to access our question, since question is the one that's looking for that show class, the show text class? What do you think we would need to add? And I can give you a hint that we just need to repeat the same thing. We just go with parent element. And now you'll notice something really, really cool that if I click here, not only I'm referencing the button and the title, but I can also right away access the actual question. And that is it. That's all we actually need. Because again, remember, once we have access to that parent, what do we have to do? We already know class list, toggle, and then show text. So each and every time I'm going to click on a button, I'll just toggle. I'll either add or I'll remove show text class from the article. And I think I'll assign it to some kind of variable just so it's a little bit more interesting and a little bit more structurally sound. So I'm going to go with const question. So this will reference, of course, the question. 
Now let me delete the parentheses. And then the only thing I'll add here is question class list toggle, the property and method that we have covered before. So question. Now, of course, I'm referencing the parent for the button that I'm clicking on, then class list, class list. And remember the property name, or I'm sorry, I guess more properly, the method name was toggle. And then what class I would want to toggle? Well, that would be show text. Let's save it. I'll navigate to a bigger screen. And then I think I can just close or you know what, I'm not going to close it just so you can see actually how we're adding this class. So I can see that I have my first question. And I'm just going to click on my first button. Notice once I click, I'm adding the class of show text. And then the rest of the magic is done already in CSS, where we're showing the text, we are displaying different icon and all that. And of course, the moment I'll press, of course, I'll hide my question. And I can do the same thing for the rest of them like so. So I can just open up close. And I think I'll close the dev tools just so you can see that it's happening. And yep, everything works like we expected. Again, this time we use traversing the DOM option, where I selected the buttons. And then I start looking for the parent elements. And of course, we can look for children, we can look for siblings and all that is just in this case, it was very convenient for us to find a parent. And we used parent element twice. So first we got the title, then we got the actual question. And once we got that specific question, that's it. We were good to go. We just toggle the method show text, and our project is complete. Okay, we were able to find a solution by traversing the DOM. So that would be one option. And then of course, I'll comment this out just so we can have it for our own reference. But now we'll use another option where we can use selectors inside the element. And this is going to be the case where it just makes way more sense for me to show you with an example. Now, in this case, I'm not looking for the buttons. What I would like to do is select questions. So those articles, so those bad boys that are looking for that show text class. So I'm going to go with const. Then I'm looking for questions because again, I'll use query selector all. So I'll go with document, then query, selector all. And then remember, the class was question, single question, question. Okay, I have all my questions. And if you want, you can console log and you'll see that you'll have a list of three articles. Now, I would want to loop over them. So I'd want to call my for each. So I'll go here with a questions, then for each. Remember, again, we had our callback function. So I go with my function. And then as a primer, I can access each and every item in my array. And just to make things a little bit more interesting, I'll try out the orange. And then we'll also console log the orange, just so we can see that we have our articles. And beautiful. We do have the articles. Good. What's next? Well, here's the kicker. Same way how we use a document and then query selector all or query selector or get element by a D. I can also add this query selector to my element. So once I have access to that one specific item in my loop, I can also use query selector all or query or whatever get element by D. Now you're probably wondering, okay, how does that help me? Well, that helps us because we can select that specific button. So for example, I'm looping over and for each and every article, I can select that specific button. And you'll see why it's so useful in our use case. Now, I would want to get a little bit more serious, though. And I'll reference this as a question. Now, again, technically, I can name it whatever I would want. But I think it's just going to give you a better representation if I'll have a more meaningful name here. So I'm going to go back here to a question. Now, I'll leave this console log for you. Just again, you would want to test it out. And then I would want to select a button from within the each and every question. And how it will work, I'm going to go with const and then btn. Now, in this case, we're not typing document. Because you'll notice that if we'll type out here document, I'll be selecting again, all the buttons. So for each and every time I'll be looping over, I'm just going to be selecting all three buttons. That's not what I would want. I'm not going here with the document. I'm going here with a question. Now what that does is just limits where we're looking for. So now I'm just looking either in the first one 
or second one or a third one. So I'm going to go here with query selector. Again, the method name does not change query selector. And I'm still looking for the same class. The class is question BTN. Now again, let's console log it. Let's see what we'll have for the buttons. And we should have three buttons. And all three buttons reference exactly what we have in items. Notice as I'm hovering over them in my dev tools, I right away can see in a browser which document I actually have selected. Okay, good. Now, what does that give us? Well, that gives us an option of adding a event listener to our button. And then again, once we'll click on a button, then our question will toggle it. And let's see how that will work. So I have my button. Again, I'll comment out my console log. I'll leave it for your reference. And then I'll say BTN. So again, I'm just talking about each and every button in my question. So I'm going to go with BTN, add event listener. I'll be listening for click events. And I'll go for my callback function. And then within the fallback function, I'm just going to say question. Now, why am I saying this question? Because that is the name of my parameter. So this question references my article. And then the button references the actual button that is within the article. And again, the unique thing here was that we used question, not a document. So I'm not just flying around the document and looking for that button. I'm saying, hey, listen, now I'm within that question, because that is, of course, my loop. So that is my iteration. For example, first one, second one, or a third one, in my case. And in my iteration, I'm saying, okay, I can access my article, beautiful, then look for that button within the article. Don't go looking around the whole document. Just look in my question. And once I have access to that button, I just say, all right, I would like to add the event listener. And then I'm just going to say, all right, so that specific question, that specific iteration, that article, well, I'll just toggle it. So once I click on a button that is within the article, I'll again toggle the class on the actual parent, on the question, which is that article in my iteration. So in here, I'll say class list, and you guessed it, again, toggle, and then we're looking for show text class. We'll save it, and I can, of course, open it, and I can close it. I can open it, and I can close it. And one last thing that I would want to add is the functionality that if, for example, I have my first one open, and if I click on any of the other ones, I'll close my first one. So I'll close all the other ones that are open, and then I'll open the one that I clicked the button on. All right, how do we do that? So within the event listener, I would like to select all the questions again. So before question class list toggle, I would want to select all the questions. Now I already have selected them, so I have access to them. So the only thing I need to do is just reference them. I'm just going to say question. That is my list. And then again, I'll write a for each. So that is my loop. And then in this case, I'm going to say function. Again, that is my callback function. And again, I do need to reference each and every item as a parameter. Now, since I don't want to repeat the same name instead of question, I'm just going to call this item. Just again, understand it is the same thing. Those are the same articles. Only in this case, I'm referencing them as items instead of the questions. And here I'll have the functionality where if the item, so if the article does not match the article where I'm clicking the button, then just close the actual article, meaning remove the show text class. And again, if you'd want, you can just console log and you'll see again that those are all our three articles. There's nothing really specific over there. I do it here and notice. Now this just shows me all my three articles. Or in this case, since I clicked on a second one, this also lets me know that the second one is the one that is already open because it has the show text class. And the way I'll set that functionality is by using the if statement where I'm going to say if the item, so if the article in this setup does not match the actual article where I'm clicking the button, then remove that text. That's why you'll see that the moment I, for example, click on the third one, well, it's not going to match the article. So the articles are not going to be same. And that's why I'll close the text by removing the show text class from the second one. 
So in this case, I'm just gonna say if the item does not match the question, then we'll write item. So that particular article class list remove, and then we're looking for show text class. That's all we have to do. So now what happens if I click, for example, on my first item, of course, I can see my text. But then now, once I'll click on a second one, what do you think is going to happen? So I'll click on a second one. And then I'll loop over my questions. Now, is the second article equal to my first one? No, it's not. So now, of course, once I click on that button in my second question, I will have my loop. And then since the first item does not match the article where I click the button on, well, then, of course, I'll remove that show text. So check it out. I click. I will close out the text here and here, even though on the third one, of course, it wasn't open to begin with. And then I'll just display on the second one. And I can do the same thing. Close it, open, close it, open. And now our functionality works. So that's how we can set up questions project using two approaches. One was by traversing the DOM parent element. That is something you should probably remember the property. It is very, very useful. And then, of course, we also have a very, very nifty option where I can select elements already within some kind of selection. So I don't have to each and every time look around the whole document. So if I already have selected some kind of specific item, I can look within that item. I can say question and then use again the method query selector or I don't know, get element by the and this is very, very nifty because again, you can select specific items, you don't have to select all the buttons or or the articles, you can select very, very specific things within that selection. Awesome work and welcome to our next project, the menu items project, where we'll take a look at how we can display products or any kind of items dynamically. So once the page loads, We'll use JavaScript to populate our page and also we'll set up some filtering options. Now, why I really, really like this project, because displaying items using JavaScript or maybe even with React and Vue and Angular is going to be your bread and butter. Now, granted, most likely you'll do that by getting that data somewhere externally, whether that is a database whether that is a third party API, or that sort of thing. But in our case, of course, data will be local because we haven't covered those Ajax requests. But that doesn't mean that what we will learn is going to be useless. In fact, the only difference is that once you get that data externally, well, you just add a few lines of code, you get that data, but then still everything that we'll do in this project, you'd have to repeat anyway. So don't dismiss it just because data is local. That is our setup. The rest of the things that we'll learn in this video are going to be very, very useful because, like already said, this will be your bread and butter. Getting some kind of item and then using JavaScript to iterate over those items, then decide what you'd want to display on a screen, what kind of functionality you would want to add, and so on and so forth. So we have our project, of course. As always, we will start with index.html. In this case, it is very important because we will add this dynamically, this HTML syntax. So I'll show you why I always like to set up my HTML first, see how my project will look like, and only then dynamically add it in JavaScript, because it's going to be much more easier. We just need to copy and paste two lines of code, and we'll be good to go. So we head back to our setup. And then of course, at the moment, the only thing I have is my brave and proud and awesome heading one with the text of my new project. So of course, we would want to change that around and we'll go with a section. The class will be menu. I'll close the sidebar just so I have more real estate. I'll have a title class here. So title class. And I'll add, you know what, a comment as well. So comment title, then my div. And then within a div, I'll have the heading two. And I'm going to add the text of our menu. Okay, beautiful. And then underline just some fancy CSS. And of course, when I say fancy, I'm being sarcastic. 
And then I have my filter buttons. So right after the title, let's see where it ends. Let's add a comment for filter button, which at the moment we're not going to add them, but still have the comments of filter buttons. Okay, awesome. And then we'll have our menu items. So another comment here, and we'll say menu items. Then I'm going to add a div with a class of section center again. So section center. And essentially, this div is just responsible for my column layout. And then I would want to select that single item. And that's going to be the code that we'll later grab and just copy and paste in our JavaScript, because it's just going to speed up our workflow. So let me save it and see the way it is. Okay, I have our, our menu. Beautiful. And like I said, now I'm creating that one single item. So we'll not worry about the buttons at the moment. But we care about this one item. So at the moment, we'll just structure one. We'll do a little bit of copy and paste, just so we can see that our column layout works. And then, like I already said, probably 50,000 times, we'll just grab that code that we have for that item and add it to our JavaScript. And as always, I do like to have the comments here. So single item, just because I think it gives a little bit of structure. So I'll go here end of single item. And then it will be an article and it will have a class of single item or you know what? No, sorry, menu item, not a single item menu item. And then within this article, I'll have the image. Now at the moment, I'm just looking for the item that is in my root folder. So I'm not looking in the images. Later on, we'll also take a look at the images folder. But at the moment, I'm just looking for the menu item. So this guy over here. So I look over in my files, and I'm looking for the menu item. Okay, beautiful. And then I'll add here the class of photo class will be photo. And then as far as the alternative, we'll just write menu item. Let's see what we'll have. I save it. Awesome. And then I'll have a div that will have the info. So I have the photo that was one part of my item. And then the second part will be this info. And since I need it for my layout, I'll place this in a div. So I'm going to go here with a class of item info. And then within a div, we'll have a heading for butter milk. And of course, you can write whatever you want. But just to have a little bit more real world scenario, I'm just going to go with a real text. So butter milk pancakes, we'll have a heading for I'll add here a class right away. And the class will be price. And then I'm going to have a dollar sign of $15. Let's save it. Okay, I do have my text beautiful. And then I'll place this actually in a header. So let me go with the header. Let me select both of them, both things here, and place it in a header. And then right after header, I'll have my paragraph. And the text over here is going to be item text, or no, that is going to be the class. The text will be whatever you'd want. In this case, I'm going to go with 20 words, but the class will be item text. Let's add here item text. Now let's save it. And just to double check that my column layout works, I'm going to take my item and then copy and paste a few times. Now we don't need to change the values or anything like that. I just want to see whether on a bigger screen, I'll have two column layout and I do, which is awesome. So now in this case, I can press command Z and go back to that one single item. So once I save it, I have all the HTML that I currently need. And we can start setting up our functionality in the JavaScript. Okay, so let's add the logic where the moment the page will load, then we'll dynamically populate our menu with an items. So if we head to app.js, we'll see a menu array. And then in the menu array, we'll have a bunch of objects. Now each object represents that one single item. Again, we'll have a property of ID, which as a side note, we'll not use. This is just to mimic a real world response. Then we'll have title. And then of course, we'll have some kind of value. There's going to be a category because we'll use it for filtering. We'll have some kind of price, some kind of image. Now this is a tricky one where again, since we're not getting this from external API, if you ever would want to use that menu array somewhere else, just make sure 
that you also have this images folder. And in fact, it is in the root. So as you can see here, the path, the dot and then images, that just means that this code will be located in the index HTML. And that just references that images array. So if you'll try to run this code without those images, well, those images won't show up. Or even if the images are going to be there, but the path is going to be different. For example, you'll nest images somewhere in a different folder. Again, the functionality will not work because this specifically references the images folder as they are in the root. And then we have some kind of description that is going to be displayed here in the bottom. And yes, like I mentioned before, normally you would get this data externally. You would set up some kind of Ajax request over here and you would get the data. Now, once you get the data, again, everything is going to be exactly the same like we will write in this video. There's going to be no difference. You will get the data and then you'll iterate over the data. You'll decide what you would want to display, what kind of functionality and yada, yada, yada. But the initial setup, yes, would be a little bit different. Eventually, once we learn Ajax, we'll see how we can set up that request, get that data, and we'll be good to go. But like I previously already mentioned, we haven't covered the Ajax. And I think it is crucial that you understand the basics of how to display items on a screen because it will. It will be your bread and butter as you're working with JavaScript. So I have my menu. For the time being, I'll collapse it. I will reference it once in a while, just when I would want to show some properties or maybe some values and all that. And just always remember that you have it in your own app.js. So if you ever need to take a look at it, just open it up and you can take a look at the specific information you're looking for. And I'll start by selecting the section center. Now, why am I selecting the section center? Because remember that DOM content loaded. That was one of the events that we already used in the previous project where I had window add event listener. So I was listening for that DOM content loaded. So when my page loads and then I had a callback function. So here's what I would want to do when my page loads, I will access my menu. So my array and I'll dynamically populate these items. However, I need to place those items somewhere, correct? So if I'm checking out my index HTML, which is the parent for all my items, for all my single items? Well, that is a section center. And that's why I will need to start by targeting the section center. So I'm going to go here with const and then section center. Again, you can call this variable however you'd want. I just went the long way. And then a document. Then you guessed it, query selector, since that seems to be my favorite one and then section center. Awesome. I selected my parent. Now what? Well, remember, we had DOM content loaded. So when our page loads, we would want to do something. So I'm going to go here with window, then add event listener. And then I would want to listen for that DOM content loaded event. So I have my parentheses. Okay, I have my quotation marks. And I'm listening for DOM content and then load it. And then of course, in here, I'll have my callback function. Now within the callback function, we'll start very, very simply by just console logging, shake and bake, just so we can see that everything works. Uh, we'll head to my console, I already have the shake and bake. Once I refresh notice, again, I get my shake and bake. Beautiful. Now, what? well, now let's see what we can do with our menu array, what would be the plan? Well, we could set up a map method, correct? So I have my items. Now, I would want to iterate over those items and dress them up in HTML. Now that is the term that I came up with. Again, that is not official uh, terminology, but just let's think about it. So we have our HTML, right? So we have our article and everything. And then in each of these elements, whether that's image, whether that's heading four or whatever, I just have some kind of data. So this at the moment just points to some specific image. This one just says buttermilk pancakes, but I have that data already in my items. So I would just need to come up with some kind of way where I can iterate over those items and then I can just add some HTML and then place this data in that HTML. Again, 
my terminology is dress them up in HTML. But of course, that is not official or anything like that. Now, the way it will work is first of all, I will collapse this and we'll use our map method and we'll assign it to some kind of variable because that would make sense. Since we're creating a new array with a map, we might as well do that. So let now I'm purposely using let and you'll see in a second why. And again, we need to come up with some kind of name. I'm going to go with display menu here and then I'll use my menu array. And like I said, we'll use map method. Now, the way map method works is just like with filter, we could access each and every item in the parameter. And as always, it is a parameter. So in this case, I'm just going to call this item. Now, what's really cool that with map, we can modify our array. And just to showcase, let's just start very simply by returning the same item. So I'm just going to go here item. Now, if you would want, you can also console log item. If you don't believe me that you'll access each and every item. And then in here, I'll just console log display, display menu like so. And then let's see. So notice I have all these items. I have nine of them. So for each and every iteration, I can see my item with all the IDs, with all the categories, prices and all that. So all the properties are there. And then in the bottom, of course, I have the same array. So in this case, I didn't do anything. I just looped over it, iterated it. And then said, okay, just return the same item. Okay, that's an easy part. Now let's make it a little bit more interesting. Where what if I would want to access, for example, I don't know, title property. But then what's really cool that with map, I can customize or you can say you can modify the new data structure that you'll have. So in order to make it a little bit more interesting, instead of returning the item, why don't we try this one out? Why don't we say, you know what? I'll return a template string. And remember, within the template string, we could just write HTML. And then I'm going to say hello, hello world. And then we'll close out the heading one. Now, what do you think is going to be in the display menu? It's going to be nine items, correct? Because that is the total of my menu array. But what do you think are going to be the values? So let's see, let's save it. And now I have bunch of hello worlds. So I have hello world, hello world. So again, same amount of items that I had in the menu. In this case, I modified what was my response. So now my response is, of course, hello world. Okay, that is good. But what I'm really looking for is this guy, the title, correct? And I already know that when I'm using the template string, what I can do, I can place a variable in there. And since I can access each and every item, we already saw that in a console log. What do you think I can do over here? I can delete hello world. I can use the dollar sign and I can access my variable. Now, what is my variable name? So this is my object, the item. And what is the property for my title? Item dot and then title. That's it. Now, what do you see here on the right hand side? I have heading one with button milk pancakes. I have a second one, third one, and again, all the way till the end of my array and all the titles are unique so all of them have been added like so and then the actual values are referencing exactly what i have in my array don't believe me you can double check and you'll see that the titles are exactly the same as the values in my title property okay good now what well remember we were setting up the index html and this was the whole point this was why we went through all the hassle to set up all the HTML because I'm not going to be returning the heading one. I'm going to return everything that I have in my single item. Just grab the whole article, head back to app.js, and then instead of heading one, copy and paste your article. So now you're returning the article. And now let's think about it. What do we need to do? So right now, of course, I'm returning the hard-coded article, but we already saw with a heading one example but of course, we can make this dynamic, correct? So how do we make this dynamic? We start accessing the variables. We start accessing the properties in our object. And we'll start with our image, of course. So instead of hard coding this menu item, I will go with my dollar sign. Of course, I'm accessing my variable. And then the property name is item IMG. So that's where I have my image. As far as the class, I will keep the class, of course. But then as far as the alternative, I'm just going to go with a title, actually. 
So item title, just like I had in heading one, then heading four. What do you think will place here? Yes, you are correct. We'll look for item dot title. So the same one as for the alternative price. Well, the property name is price. So I'm going to go here, item price. And then the last one is the text. Now for the text, the property name is description. So I'll delete my hard coded option. Then again, I'll use my variable here and we'll go with item and then description like so. We'll save it. And now, of course, I can see that I'm getting these items. And what do you think is going to be our next step? Well, next, I would want to join them in one string. Why? Because I would want to place them in my section center. And I can do that by using join method. So since this is an array, we're getting back the array, the display menu, we have an option of running the join method, which just joins it in one string. Okay, now let's see how it's going to look like. I'm going to go here with display menu. So since I'm using let, of course, I can override it. And I'll just say, all right, yeah, display menu will stay the same, but I'll run display menu join. And then we need to have here empty quotation marks. Now there's multiple values that you can add here. But the reason why we're adding here empty parentheses is because then we won't have these annoying commas in between. So let's save it and you'll see that we will have a one giant string. Now, if you won't add that, you'll see that in between them, you'll have those commas. So let me find we have article here. And then notice in between articles, you have this comma. So what will happen that will be the item that will be displayed. And you don't want that. So you for sure want to add those quotation marks here, the empty ones. And that way you won't have those commas in between those articles. So now we have that big giant string. And what do we do now? Well, we just add it as our data. So the way it will look like, we'll go with section center. So remember, that was our parent, of course, then we go with inner HTML. And then we just pass it here, we say display menu, because this is the data that we're getting back. We looped over our array, we return new setup. We actually added here a string with HTML syntax, we dynamically populated it. Then at the very end, we joined all of them together. And then we're just placing it in the section center, which is the parent, then we're using inner HTML property. And we're just setting it equal to our display menu. And you'll see that the moment you navigate to a bigger screen, voila, we have all the items, and they reference exactly what we have in the array. Again, this is going to be your bread and butter, you'll have some kind of items, you'll have to iterate over items, you'll have to decide what you'd want to return. So what kind of info, as you saw with heading one, we can return whatever we would want. In our case, we had specific HTML, then we joined everything together, and then just placed it in the parent element. And then we use the inner HTML, and then just assign this to whatever we got back once we run join method on our array. So that's going to be something that you'll do very, very often as you're working with JavaScript. Great work. We are done with our initial setup. However, in order to set up filtering, if we wouldn't want to repeat ourselves, it would be better if I would place all this functionality in a function. And then as a parameter in a function, I'll pass in the array. And again, it will make way more sense as we set up the filtering. At the moment, you would be like, okay, why is this guy refactoring the code again? Again, in order to set up filtering, it will just make sense if we set up this functionality in a function, because that way it's going to be much more easier. We won't have to retype this. And I'll name this, I don't know, display items or display menu items. Maybe that would be a nicer name for my function. So I'm going to go here with function then display menu items like so that is my function. And then like I said, this item will be looking for the array. So this function will be looking for some kind of array. Now in this case, we'll still use our menu one. But since it is parameter, I'm going to call this menu items. So 
So that's going to be my parameter. And as an argument, yes, initially, we will still pass our menu. But as we start filtering, you'll see why it's so convenient for us to have it as a function. And now what I would want is just grab everything that we have within a function body, within a callback function, everything up to here, cut it out. So now it's just going to be empty, copy and paste. But what I would like to change right now is instead of iterating over the menu, that is, of course, our array, I would want to iterate over the array that will pass in the function. So I'll have here menu items array. And now, of course, since I would want still everything to work, I'll call my function. I'll call display menu items function. And like I said, initially, yes, I'll still pass in my menu array. So what happens is I have my menu items array. That is, of course, my parameter. And as an argument, I'm passing in the menu. And you'll see that our functionality will still work. So everything will still stay the same. The difference is now when we'll set up filtering, it's just going to be much more easier because we'll have our function. And then depending on situation, we'll call our function and we won't have to retype this. It is just going to be a faster setup. And as a side note, I have been adding some references for you. For example, if you check out basic TXT, you'll see the previous code. So just in case, as you're refactoring with me and something doesn't work, just remember that in the basic TXT, you'll have access to the code that you had in the beginning of the video. So that way you can just make sure that you don't make some kind of bug. Or if you make a bug, then you can find where is your actual error. But that should do it for this video. We now have our functionality in the actual function, and we are ready to start adding our filtering option to our project. Once we can display our items, and once we have refactored our code a bit, where our functionality is in the function, now let's start working on filtering. And as always, we'll have to start with index HTML. So where we have the filter buttons comment, we'll add here a div with a class of btn container. And then within this container, for the time being, we'll place four buttons. Now, why do we need four buttons? Because we have four categories. We'll have category for all. So that's when we'll display all the items. And then we'll have for breakfast, lunch, as well as the shakes. So we'll navigate back and we'll set up those four buttons. So I'm going to go here with a button, but then I would also want to, of course, select that button. So in order to do that, I'll have to add some kind of class and the class for all of them will be filter BTN. Let's add the button. And you know what? I'll also add a type here and I'm just going to say button and I'll just add a text. So I'm going to say all that's going to be my first button. And of course, like I said, I wouldn't want to copy and paste one, two, and three. Now the class will stay the same. We will target using the filter button, but I would want to change these values here. So the second one will be breakfast, breakfast, like so. The third one will be lunch. And again, they're just referencing the categories that I have in the atoms. So for example, first one was breakfast and I had lunch. And then I had shakes. So those are the three categories that I'm using. And the last one will be shakes. Let's save it. I have the buttons. Now, of course, I can click all day long and nothing will happen, but we'll fix that in the next video. Okay. So how do we set up the functionality so that when we click on buttons, we display specific items, whether that is the ones that are for the breakfast or lunch or shakes. So essentially, the items that have the category of breakfast, lunch, or shakes, or we just display all the items. And you guessed that we would need to head back to app JS. And I'll start by selecting my filter buttons. Now, for the time being, I'm going to close my menu. I don't think I need it. And then first I selected section center, and now I'm going to look for my buttons. So I'll create a little bit more space. So const then I'll name them filter BTNs, and that is equal to my document. Then query selector all, since again, I'll have a list. And then the class name is filter BTN. Once I have selected my buttons, then 
right after the window add event listener, I will just listen for the actual event on the buttons. Of course, I'll iterate over them, but then I'll attach a event listener for each and every button. Now, of course, you can place it here at the very end. It's really up to you, but I'll place it in between. So right after the first event listener, where we are just loading all our items. So let's say load items, and then I'll say filter, filter items. And then in here, I have my list, I have my filter buttons, and now I'd want to iterate over it. So we already know that we have filter buttons, we can run for each, and then we have our callback function, we're referencing each and every button as a parameter. So I'm just going to say here, btn. And then for all four buttons, I would like to add the event listener, I'll be listening for click event. And then this is going to be interesting. Well, we will understand how the data set property works. So I have my function, I'll still look for my event object, beautiful. And then within the function body, I'll console log something really cool. And that will be our data set. So I'm going to go with console log. And then I'm looking for event, event object, then current target. So what is going to be the current target that is, of course, going to be our button, the one that we're clicking on. And then I'll look for the property that we haven't covered yet. And that is a data set. Now, please keep in mind, data set property is not unique to a buttons but we're just using in this case. So you can add this data set also to, of course, all the other elements as well. Now, the way data set property works is that on the element, we can add the attribute with a data prefix. So for example, for my button that has the text of all, I could write here data. So that is my prefix. Then we have the hyphen and then whatever name we would want. So if you want to name this category, you can name this category. Since I would want to have a short name, I will go with ID. But again, that is your preference. You can name it wherever you'd want. In my case, I'm going to call this ID. But what's important is to have this data and then hyphen in front. So once you have this, then you'll be able to access in JavaScript using data set property. Because at the moment, you'll see that we'll have nothing there. So I go with data ID. And then I would need to set it up to some kind of value. Now, since I will be using my categories, I need to reference also. So in this case, I'm going to say all. Now, this is, of course, just because I have the text for my button as all. But then for the rest of them, for the rest of the buttons, I'll have to reference to that specific category. Now, just to showcase what we'll get back, if you click on all button, notice you get this object. And then within the object, you have this ID. So like I said, if you'll call this, I don't know, banana, banana, you'll see in the object also banana. Once you click again, that is the property name. That's why I keep saying that this is up to you. However, you want to call it. In my case, I just call this ID. What's important is to have the data and then hyphen. And then in JavaScript, you can access this specific value using data set property because data set property will return that object. And then you can already probably guess that if you would want to be a bit more specific, you would go with a data set. So that references the object, but then the property name is ID. And that way, once I click, check it out. Now I have undefined. Why I have undefined? Because of course I didn't save it and it was previously banana. So let me save it. I check and I get back this value of all, which of course just references whatever I have here as a value. So knowing this, I can just copy and add to each and every button. So I'll have one for the breakfast. I'll have one for the lunch. And you know what? In this case, I'll zoom out because I think it's going to be easier for you to see. And then last one will be shakes. And I just need to change these values. Like I said, I'll use them to access my category. So it needs to match not what you have here. I mean, it would be awesome if the text here also would reference the category but it's not going to break anything, but they for sure needs to match the categories that we have here within the menu. If they won't match, then again, functionality will not work. So let me zoom back in and then I'll change one by one. So I'll have my second one and I'll call this breakfast breakfast. Hopefully the name is exactly the same. 
third one will have a launch and then third one will have shakes. Okay, awesome. And now in the app JS, of course, I can close my menu. And then as I'm going to be clicking on a button, you'll notice that of course I'm getting those IDs. Okay, beautiful. Now what? Well, once I have that ID, I will assign it to some kind of variable. So I'm going to go here const and I'll call this category. And then of course, that will be equal to my current target data set and then ID. Great. And now I'd want to use a filter method. So here's what I'll do. Remember, we have our function. We have display menu items. Now, what is this function looking for? It is looking for the array. And I already know that I can use filter array where I can filter out what items are going to be left in the new array. So I could filter out array depending on what is the value for my category. So let me format this properly and now I'll create a new array. So I'm going to say const menu category and then that will be equal to my menu. So my main array, the one that I have up here, and then I'll use filter method. Again, we have the callback function. Each and every item is represented in a parameter. So I'm going to call this a menu item. And if I won't set up any kind of condition, of course, you'll see that I'll returning all the items. So if I'll write here, return menu item. So there's no condition. If you would want to console log at the menu category, menu category, you'll see that you'll get all the items. So once you click on a button, you have all the nine items. So of course, we need to make things a bit more interesting. Where now I would want to return only if the menu item has the category that is equal to whatever I have in here. As a side note, if you'd want to console log even more, so menu item and then category, you'll see that for each and every item, of course, you have this category. So now the job is very simple. I just want to return if the item matches whatever I have in a category. So what is going to be in a category? That is, of course, going to be the data ID that I place there in a button, which I'll access using data set. And then when I access it, I'll assign it to category. And then I'll say, OK, if the menu item category matches to the category variable, beautiful, return that item. If not, then I don't want it. So console log, let's say that one for your reference. And like I said, we'll set up our if. So menu item category, if that matches my variable value, then of course, I would want to return menu item. And I, of course, have already that text. So I'll just save it here. And then instead of just console logging, we can right away display it. And we need to be careful, though, because we'll use also all, correct? My first button had this all. That was the value for the ID. Now, if I'll use my filter, do you think I'll get something back if I use all? And the answer is no, because, of course, there is no category there with a the value of all. They either have lunch or breakfast or shake. So we need to set up another if statement in this case. And again, we can just leave that for your reference just in case you ever want to. But we'll go with if category, if that is the case, if the category is equal to all. So that would be all button. And I'll need to sign this to a string. Then I would want to call my display menu items. So that's going to be my function. So that's why we were setting up the function, because I did not want to repeat this functionality. That was the whole point why we refactor our code. So now if the category is all, then I will call my display menu items with my menu array. And this is important menu array. That's the one that we we're using. However, if the category is something else. So if it is breakfast, lunch or shakes, then we'll run a display menu items. That is, of course, my function. And then since the function is looking for the array, what do you think is menu category? That is my new array. So instead of menu, I go with menu category. We'll save it. We'll navigate to a bigger screen and we'll see that once you press on all, of course, you'll display all of them. And then once you add breakfast, you'll have breakfast, lunch, and then shakes. And again, the biggest thing over here is the data set. So you have this data and then hyphen, and then whatever value you'd want over here. Remember, that will show up in the data set object. 
and then you just need to come up with some kind of values here. So in our case, it was all breakfast, lunch, and shakes. And then in the app JS, we used current target, but of course we can assign this data set to other elements as well if you would want. So data set property. And then we're looking more specifically to ID because that's how I named it. Assign it to category, used filter, filter out the items that have the same exact matching category. And then at the end, we just check if the category is all, then I would want to display all the items. If the category was there, so whether it's breakfast, lunch, or shakes, then we'll use our filtered out array. And then we just call display menu items and then pass in the array. Great work on setting up our items dynamically, as well as setting up our filtering options. However, there is a tiny issue. And that issue is falling where at the moment our setup is a bit naive. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we hard coded our buttons, correct? And then each button was referencing the category. But then what happens if these values changes for the categories? What do we do then? Do we run to index HTML each and every time and then change this value? Or it would make sense if we would set this up dynamically. And I'll give you an example. For example, in the app.js, remember we had a menu. And then what if I would add one more item? And this is going to be a steak dinner. So what I'll do, I'll copy and paste. I'll change the ID again. Not that we'll use it, but it's just a little bit realistic. As far as the title, I'll go with steak dinner. Now the category will change, so we'll add a new category, and that will be dinner. Now, as far as the price, usually steak is quite expensive, so I'm going to go with $39.99. And for the image, I already have the image with a value of 10, and the description, of course, can stay whatever it is. Now I'll navigate back to my bigger browser window, and I'll see that, of course, I have the steak dinner because items are being added dynamically. But then the button is not there. So of course, as I'm filtering, the only way I can see my steak dinner is if I click on all. And that is not the best setup. Because again, if we'll change any of these names, for example, in our data, then of course, our buttons are not going to match. And this is again, something that we need to remember that normally we'll do this with some kind of external API, where at the moment, of course, I know all my categories. So that's why it's so easy for me. But the moment when someone will start changing the data, we need to make sure that our data is dynamic, where I'll check all the categories. And then depending on those categories, I'll filter those items. So for example, once I added a new category, it should show up over here. And then once I click, then I'll display my steak dinner. And we'll do that in a multiple steps. Don't worry, we'll not do that right away. And I'll collapse the menu and the steps will be following. So we'll have to get only the unique categories. And as a side note, this is going to be the hardest part because we'll have to do a little bit of JavaScript magic in there. And then once we get our unique categories, and of course, I'll talk in great detail once we get there, then we would want to iterate over those categories and return buttons. So we'll still use our HTML or we'll do it like we did previously with our dynamic item setup. But then we incorporated JavaScript and then at the very end, we just need to make sure that once we actually set up the buttons, only then we select them. And again, this is something that I'll cover where once we add our buttons dynamically, this will not work. We won't be able to access them. We'll have to move this code in a different place. Like I said, we'll do this step by step. So don't worry. And I'll start by simply commenting out the buttons in the index HTML. So right now we have cart coded all our items. So I would want to comment them out, but don't delete them. Because similarly, like we had for the items, we will grab this code since I don't want to write it from the scratch. And as a side note, we can also comment out the article because we already have the code in JavaScript. So I'll comment this out once the index HTML is done. As you can see, we don't have the buttons, so we'll have to add them dynamically and we'll start doing that in our app JS. So let's navigate to app JS and then I'm going to look for my event listener, the DOM content loaded one. And then right after I display the items, 
I'll start setting up the functionality. As a side note, at the end, we will set up a function. Same how we have display menu items. We'll have one for the buttons. And then, of course, we'll just copy and paste everything within that function and then just invoke the function. But since I don't want to confuse you right off the bat, at the moment, I'll just write my code here and then we'll refactor our application a bit. I also want to let you know that since we'll be adding some changes to our JavaScript, we already have the previous code over here. So if you check out a naive TXT, you'll find all the code that we have at this point. So if you make some kind of bug or something like that, you can always reference this file, which is exactly what we have currently, since we'll be adding some changes starting with this video. And like I said, the first thing that I would want is get only unique categories, and it will be the hardest part. And we can start very simply by running a map method. So what I would want is display the categories. So I'm going to go with const, then categories, and that will be equal to my menu. And then I'll run my map method, because this is what I would want to do. I would want to iterate over my menu array and then return only the categories. Remember, each and every item had that property of categories. So I would want to store this in the categories array, since I know that map returns a new array. So I'll have my callback function. I'll have my item. I'm not going to be very creative with my parameter. And I'm just going to say that as we're iterating over my array, I would like to return item and then category. And as always, I do prefer console logging everything just so we can see that we're all on the same page. And if we'll check the console, you'll see that I have array of 10 items. Now, why do I have 10 items? Because I have 10 categories. So everything works really well. But like I said, I would want to get unique ones. And that is very important. Because otherwise, if I'll display my buttons right now, if I'll actually iterate over these categories and return my buttons, then I'll have 10 buttons. And I don't want 10 buttons. I only want buttons for unique categories. So how do we set this one up? Well, instead of map, we'll have to use reduce. And as a side note, with an arrival of ES6, there is a easier way how we can do that. But again, since we haven't covered ES6 yet, we'll use reduce. And I also think that it's very useful that we'll practice with the reduce because reduce is a very, very powerful method. And the sooner you'll get comfortable with it, the better it's going to be. Now, I'm not going to comment out this code. In fact, I will delete it since there's already quite a few comments here. And we'll just run the reduce. So I'll have my reduce method. And then the same as for the map and filter, we need to pass in the callback function. However, the difference with reduce is that we have two parameters in our callback function. And also we need to come up with some kind of initial value. And most likely, if you have been looking at examples, you probably saw something like this, where they were returning initial value, because most examples online are how you use reduce to sum up some kind of values, but reduce can do way, way more than that. And in our case, instead of returning some kind of number, we will return an array, and we'll have one item in there. And the value will be a string of all. So why am I placing here the string of all? because I also have this button that references all the items. So that is, of course, not my category. So that's something that I would want to add manually. That's why I'm returning an array. And then within that array, I have this string of all. And once I have this setup, then I have two parameters in my reduce. Now, they are referenced as accumulator and current. But as always, it is a parameter. So you can call it whatever you'd want. So in my case, I'll call this values. So that references this array that I'm returning. And then actual item references each and every item. Because again, with reduce, we're still iterating over array. So we'll still iterate over each item in my menu array, since I'm running menu and then reduce. And here's my setup. We always, always, when we use reduce, need to return the values. So that's going to be our total. So in each and every iteration, we need to return the values. Otherwise, this functionality will not work. And here's what I'll do. If you'd want, again, you can console log just to see that you'll get the item. But since we have console logged quite a few times, I'll skip that. But I would want to check whether the item category 
So that is the property with the value is already in my array. So I can write here the if statement and I can say not so values. So that, of course, is my array. And then I can use includes method. And that is, of course, again, the array method. And then I'm just looking for item category. And if that is the case, then I would want to actually add an item. So I'm going to say values push. And don't worry, once we write out the code, I'll cover in greater detail what we're doing. But item category, let's save it. So here's what is happening. First of all, we can see in the console that I'm getting all my unique categories. I have all I have breakfast, lunch, shakes and dinner. And as you can see, I'm not repeating them. But what is happening in here in the function body is following where I have the if statement. And I'm saying, if values, so that is the array that I'm returning does not does not. That's why I have here the exclamation mark, include the item category, which of course is property on each of the items that I'm iterating over, then values again, my array, add please that category. If that is not the case, if for example, in the next iteration, already, that item category is already in my array, which of course, is going to be case, for example, for breakfast, lunch, shakes and dinner, then just skip, just return the array. So that's how we can get our unique categories using reduce. Again, with ES six, there is a shorter way, we can write a one liner. But I thought this would be a great practice for us to use a reduce, where again, we iterate over the items, we have two parameters in this case, one for total, and one for each item, we are returning array with already some kind of initial value, because we need to have this all category as well. And then I'm just checking if the item is already in the array, then just return the array and keep on moving. If it's not in array, so I'm saying here, if and not exclamation mark, then please array, add that specific value that you have in the item category. Like I previously mentioned, getting these unique categories was definitely the hardest part. And I can promise that starting from this point, it's going to be smooth sailing, since we'll be repeating a lot of the same stuff that we already covered. And we'll start by actually adding these categories as our buttons. And it's going to be very similar to what we did with a menu items, where again, remember, we had some kind of array, and then we just iterated over the array and grab the HTML and dynamically plug the values. And we just need to come up with some kind of name for whatever we'll be returning. So in this case, I will delete my console log. And I'll just come up with some kind of variable name, and that will be category buttons. So category BTN, so buttons, and then I'll use my categories array, I'll use my map method, we have our callback function. And in this case, I'll reference each and every item as a category. And then instead of returning some kind of string, I would want to wrap my value, my category value in the HTML. And of course, since I would want to return button, I'll just use one of the HTML for the button. So I'll grab one of the buttons, it doesn't really matter which one because we'll replace these values and just add it in my JavaScript. So instead of I'm sorry, like this, I need to set up, of course, the template string, copy and paste. And now I'm returning the button. And what am I looking for as far as the value? Well, since each and every item represents the category, wouldn't make sense that if we would dynamically place it where we have the data ID, as well as the value. So let's try it out. Instead of breakfast, hard coded breakfast, I'm going to go with my category. And then I'm going to do the same thing for a value here. So I'll have here again, the dollar sign. And then we'll have the category. Now, of course, once I have set up my buttons, that is only the start, I would need to set this up as a string, because we still have each and every value in our array. And remember, we needed to use join method for that. But then we have multiple ways, we can either do it the long way where we had display menu, and then I just reassign it to display menu join. But in this case, I purposely used cons. So we cannot do it this way. So we cannot reassign. What we can do is by adding the join here. So add your join at the end. 
So essentially, I will just chain my two methods. I will actually save it. And you'll see that again in the category button, we'll have our string. So in this case, I will console log category buttons here. And you'll see that we'll have our giant awesome string that contains all our buttons. And now, of course, I would want to target my container. So my button container, and that one has a class of BTN container, and just using our HTML to add my string. So then I'll have my dynamic buttons. So I'll go back where I have the selections. I'm going to go right after section container because as a side note, we'll have to move this one. So I'm skipping a little bit ahead, but this will be sitting somewhere else, the filter buttons. But in here, I would like to target, like I said, my container and the class was BTN container. So I'll go with container. That will be my value. And then I'm using document, then query selector. And then let me just double check the class. Yeah, there's button container because I tend to make some silly mistakes. So container. And once I have selected the container, now, of course, the same way how we place the items, I'll use in our HTML to place my buttons. So right after I have set up my buttons, I'll use my container since we just selected it, of course. And then, like I said, the property name will be in our HTML. And that is equal to my category buttons. We'll save it. And voila, now we have our awesome buttons. Of course, at the moment, as I'm clicking, notice nothing is happening. Now, why nothing is happening? Well, let's think about it. So I added the buttons. But then I'm actually selecting the buttons over here. So what do you think is happening? Do we get any buttons when we make this selection? with filter buttons. Because the difference right now is that we're adding these buttons dynamically. It's not like previously where we added in the HTML. So when the JavaScript loaded, it was like, okay, get me the buttons. And here you go. These are the buttons. Now what happens since we're adding them dynamically, when JavaScript tries to get those buttons, we'll get back undefined. So I can just console log it for your reference. So filter buttons, and you'll see that even though these buttons still have the filter button class, because we're adding them dynamically, we have no access to it. Our node list is empty. So there's no way for us to access them and then add that filter BTNs. Now, how we can fix that? Well, the fix is simple where we would need to select these buttons once they have been added to our DOM. So once we dynamically add them to our DOM, then we can target them by selecting them and adding also this event listener for each and every button. So we iterate over the buttons and then we add the event listener. So what we need to do is just move this filter BTNs and I'll delete my console log. And let me move this line down. Let's keep on moving, keep on moving. And then right after we have added them in the container, then I will select them. And now, of course, we'll have access to them. And of course, we can also iterate over them. And we're adding this event listener. So let me keep on scrolling. I'll cut everything out. Like I said, for the time being, I'll place everything within my event, the DOM content loaded. But then we'll set up, of course, a function because it just makes a little bit more sense. So let me save it just so I can show you that the functionality will work. So as you can see, now I'm selecting the items and I'm getting the unique items. And the reason why this works, because now I'm selecting the buttons after we have added them dynamically to our DOM, not before, not right away running and selecting because they're not in the HTML. They have been added dynamically. That's why we can only access them once actually they have been added to the DOM. And if you want to keep on practicing, remember, you could also use a more specific setup where we're looking for the container. Now, again, that is a side note. In this case, it doesn't really change anything. But just for practice, remember, we didn't have to use always document. We can also use a more specific selection if we have selected that element already. And I guess the last thing that I would want is to set up a function display. And I guess I'll call this, I don't know, display menu buttons. And I'll just invoke that function in my event listener, because I think the code is going to be a little bit cleaner. 
So I'll go with function, then display not menu items. We'll have buttons. So we'll have menu buttons. Now this function will not pass any kind of parameters. So it's not going to be accepting any kind of arguments. But what I would want is everything starting from the categories all the way till the end. And in this case, I just do need to be careful because I probably don't want to delete some unnecessary parentheses or the actual curly braces. So let's see. Let's save it. I don't have any errors. Awesome. And now I just need to copy and paste where I have my menu buttons. So of course, once I save it, now I should see my buttons, but I do need to invoke that function. So I have display menu buttons. Again, we're still looking for the categories. We're still adding HTML to our categories. That's how we can see the buttons. And at the very end, we're adding categories to our HTML. And only then, and I know I said this 20,000 times, but it is very, very important. It will save you a lot of time debugging where you know that if you add something dynamically, you can only access it once it has been added already to the DOM, not before, not like normally, if you already have something in the HTML. And then of course, same old deal, we just iterate over them, and then check what is the category, and then only return the items that match that category. And like I said, the last thing that I would want is just to run my function. So display menu buttons. And in this case, we're not passing any kind of argument. And we're good to go. And now we have our categories. So if I head back to my project, I can see that I have breakfast I have lunch shakes, as well as dinner. And if I want to see all of them, I just click on all again, very, very important project, because it will be your bread and butter. Hopefully you are able to follow along. And I hope to see you in the next project. Awesome work. And up next, we have the video project, where we'll add video in the HTML. But then since we'll have a white text, we'll have to add some kind of darker overlay. So once we add the overlay, we'll not be able to access the controls, the video controls. And that's why we'll have to use the JavaScript to add the play and pause button. And also during this project, we'll take a look at how we can add a preloader. And actually in order to show you clearer, I'll navigate to network. I'll make sure that I have a slower speed. And you'll see that while the video is loading, we'll have a preloader. As a side note, it's not unique to a video. So effectively, you can add the preloader to any project once you'll know how. The only reason why I added to the video because videos are usually large assets. So it just made sense to add the preloader to this particular project. And just in case anyone is wondering, no, I have no idea what is this guy's problem, why he thinks it's okay to run barefooted in a desert. Hopefully he's okay. And with that out of the way, we can start working on our project. Okay, and we'll kick things off by setting up our HTML. So I'll navigate to a setup folder. I'm looking for index HTML. I might as well can keep the heading one with the text of video project because that is the same heading one with the same text that we'll use later on. And in here, I'll just place a comment for the header because eventually there's also going to be a preloader. So I'll go with my header element and within the header element, I'll place my video element. So I'll go with video element instead of placing the source in the attributes. I'm just going to go for the source tag, and then I'll have my source. And as far as the video, it is obviously available in the root. So if you look for the files, you'll see a video MP4. Now we do need to add here a type and type will be video forward slash MP4. Let's save it. And then I would want to add few classes here, or more specifically, few attributes and one class. So I'll go with class. And the class name will be video container, just because I would want to add a little bit of CSS. And also, like I said, we'll have few attributes here. So I'm going to go with controls, muted, autoplay, uh, loop, and that should do it. So once I save it, you'll notice that we'll have access to controls. So the user can control the video. Video will be muted by default. And the moment it loads, it will start playing. That's why we'll have the autoplay. And at the very end, we have the loop, which just means that once the video is done, we'll start playing it from the start again. I can navigate to a bigger screen. 
and this is what we should see. Now, I would want to place my heading one with video project because at the moment text is here in the bottom. So just make sure to place the heading one after the video. So let me move it up. Let's save it. And we should see our heading one. Now, at the moment, we don't see it. And the reason for that is because we would need to navigate to a styles. And then where you see the video container, we would need to add some kind of Z index. Because at the moment, if I'm placing my text right now, like so, it is not going to work. So I need to navigate to styles and then for the video container. So that's the class that we added to a video element we will add a Z index of negative two. So now, of course, we can see our text. So that should be our basic setup. We have the video. Awesome. And also we have our heading one right smack in the middle. Now, once we add our heading one, everything looks really well, but there is an issue because my video is really bright. And also my heading color, the white color is bright. So it's somewhat hard to see my heading one. And uh, you can simply say, okay, you can just change the color. Okay, I could. But what if I don't want to? What if I would want my text to be white? And instead, I would want to place some kind of overlay to my image. So that way, my background would be darker. And I could see much clearer what is my text. And this is exactly what we'll do right now. So I'll navigate back to my project and I'll look for the end of my CSS. And in here, you'll see a style that is commented out. And essentially what it does, it just adds an overlay to our image. So now as I'm looking at my image, you'll see a nice black background. So that way I can see my text much clearer. Now what is happening though, as we're adding our CSS, as we're adding our overlay, and as we were adding our Z index, at the moment, we cannot access the controls anymore. So essentially, you might as well can just remove them because there's no way for the user to access those controls and basically control the video. So that's why I remove the controls attribute altogether. And what I would want is to set up a button that will allow me to control the video. So if I will press pause, then of course, we'll pause the video. And if I'll press play, then of course, we will play the video. And we'll do that by just using the JavaScript. Now we'll still have to start with HTML. So I'll head back to my index HTML. And then right after the heading one, I'll place my button. And in here, I'll have a comment of video switch. And then we'll go with a button. Now I do want to add a class. And the class will be switch button. So class switch btn and then in here we'll have three things i'm going to add a span with the text of play and then i'm going to copy and paste so one two the second one will have a text of pause and the third one i'm going to leave it empty but i'll add here a class and the class will be switch we'll save it we have the button now at the moment of course nothing is happening i can click all day long and nothing will change, but we will set that up in the next video. And we already know that in order to add some kind of functionality, we would need to navigate to app.js. At the moment, we have there some comments. Don't worry, I will cover them a little bit later. But I would want to start by selecting two things. I would want to select my button, and then also would want to select my video container. So in the index HTML, the button has a class of switch BTN. And then the video one has the video container class. So those are the two things that I would want to select in order to set up my button. And I'm going to go with variable btn. Then I'll use document query selector. Again, the class name was switch btn. I might as well copy and paste. And then in here, I'll say video. And the class that I'm looking for is video hyphen container. Once I have this set up, then I'll add a event listener for my button. So btn add event listener, I'll be listening for click events, we have our callback function. And then within a callback function, I would want to check whether the button has the class of slide. Now, why am I checking for that class? So first of all, let me find the class. 
class name was slide. And the way the button is set up, I have my button, I have my two spans. And then that third span is this blue container that is going to be moving to the left or to the right. And the way I'll move it is using the slide class. So for example, if the slide class will be added to a button, then my container will move to the right. But then if the class will not be on the button, then the container will be here on the left hand side. And again, I'm just moving it using CSS. And that's why we'll head back to app.js. And like I said, we'll check if the button has the class of slide. And I'll go with my not operator. So I'll say btn class list. Again, I'm checking for all the classes. And I'm saying whether my button contains the slide class. But then, of course, since I have my not operator, what I'm saying is if the button does not does not have the slide class, then, of course, I would want to add it. So I'll go with btn class list class list. And then we'll go with add function. And then in here, I'll pass slide. So if the button does not have the slide class, then we'll add it. Or we'll also have an option for else. And in here, I'm going to go with BDN, class list, and then remove. Now, why am I adding this functionality in this case? Because in my if statement, I'm checking whether the button does not have the slide class. If it doesn't, then I'm adding, or in this case, else, of course, means that it already has the class of slide. That's why we are removing it. And I'll write remove slide class. And at the moment, we'll be able to click on a button. And you'll see how our container moves left and right. However, we're still not controlling the actual video. And in order to control the video, we'll have to access our variable. That is going to be our video variable. And then the method we're looking for is pause. And of course, I do need to invoke it here as well. And then we also have a method of play. So I'll go with video and play. So let's go over what is happening. Again, I'm selecting my button, I'm adding a event listener for click event. And then I'm just checking if the button does not have the slide class, then of course, I would want to pause it. Why? Because if you notice, this is my option, I have my span with a text of pause. So once I'll click on my button, you'll notice how my container will move to a right hand side. And I'll also pause my video. So that's the method name. If you want to pause the video, you have a pause method. And then if you would want to play the video, then you have the play method. And now if I'll click on my button, notice my container moves to the right. So that's why I'm covering right now the pause option. And I also paused my video. Now, if I would want to play the button, then I just need to click on my button. And of course, I'll be able to play my video. That's the setup. I can click on my button. Notice how I'm pausing and playing the video. And I'm doing that again by checking the class. If the class is there, then I would want to remove it. If it's not there, then I would want to add it. The reason why I did not use the toggle, because I also wanted to add a video functionality. So I wanted to add these two methods, one for pausing the video, and the second one for playing the video. Once we have our video controls in place, next, I would want to add some kind of preloader. So while the video loads, will display a nice looking GIF. And we'll have to start with HTML. So I'll head back to my index.html. And above the header, I'll add my preloader. As a side note, since we're using position fixed for our preloader, technically, you can place it anywhere in your HTML. But in my case, I'll just place it at the start. So I'll have here preloader, that is going to be my comment. And then it's just going to be a div with a class of pre loader. And then within this div, I'll place my image. Now the image is located again with the rest of the files. So you'll find here a preloader GIF. Get that file as far as alternative, you can just say preloader. And once we have set up the preloader, I can save it. And you'll see our preloader. Again, like I said, we're using position fixed for that. That's why we'll have to add some JavaScript in order to hide the preloader. Now, since we have covered this quite a few times, I'm not going to show you the manual setup, and we'll directly head to app.js. And in here, you'll have two comments, you'll have one for 
dom content loaded and the second one for the load event because what will happen is we will hide the preloader once the load event fires so remember previously we used a window and we added event listener for dom content loaded so once the page loads then we did something we had some kind of callback function and of course in there we place the functionality so in this case we'll do exactly the same however we'll use a load event not a dom content loaded and the difference would be that for the dom content loaded it fires when initial html document has been completely loaded and parsed without waiting for style sheets images subframes to finish loading however the load event is fired when the whole page has loaded including all dependent resources such as style sheets and images so that's why we'll use a load event so once everything loads then i would want to hide my preloader and as always we'll just do it simply by adding the class so i'll look for my preloader where is my preloader preloader and you'll see that it has position fixed like i said then the visibility is by default visible z index 999 but then we'll do the opposite of what we have been doing in a previous project where by default we show the preloader and then only once the whole page loads then we'll add our class of hide preloader and effectively our preloader will disappear so let's navigate back to app.js and then we can do it right after we have set up our event listener for the button first i'll target my preloader and i'll have here a comment preloader and i'll go with const preloader variable and then document query selector again i'm looking for the preloader class and preloader class and i would want to listen for the load event on the window so i'll go with window then add event listener and i'll be listening for a load event and like i said the same thing we have our callback function and what i would want to do in the callback function simply target my preloader and just add that class of hide preloader so i would want to hide the preloader once the page loads completely so I'll go with my preloader then class list and then we'll just add a hide preloader let's save it and you'll see that the moment our page loads then of course we'll hide the preloader and then the video will be displayed and in order to make things a little bit more interesting i'll head back to my bigger screen i'll open up the dev tools and in here i'll slow down my network speed so I'll make this a little bit bigger i'll look for slow 3g just so we can see our preloader i uh, will refresh and you'll see that while our page is loading will nicely display our preloader but then the moment our page load is complete then of course the preloader is gone and we have our awesome video and that should do it for this project hopefully you enjoy it and hopefully i'll see you in the next project all right and up next we have the scroll project and before we take a look at the actual project i just want to warn you that this project will be a little bit tedious so there's going to be a few gotchas so i would suggest paying attention as you're coding along now from my part i will split up everything in small chunks so we're not gonna jam everything in one video but from your part i would suggest if you don't understand something re-watch the video or if that doesn't help then utilize the external resources so for example if you don't understand the property that i'm talking about just search for the property yourself take a look what it does and then try to understand how to implement in our project and uh, the main idea about this project is to see how we can work with a scroll event so for example as we start scrolling notice how we will dynamically add the class to a nav bar so previously our nav bar was static and then the moment we start scrolling and the moment we pass some certain pixel size then of course we'll have our nav bar which will be fixed so we'll take a look at that then we'll also set up smooth scroll so once i click notice how we scroll smoothly to that particular section whether that is about whether that is the services 
or whether that is going to be tour. Now, also, as a side note, there's going to be more HTML than typical in our project because I wanted to make it a more realistic scenario where we have more stuff in our project. Now, as you can see, I did not add any items in the actual sections, but I wanted to showcase that, of course, your projects normally would have more sections. Then we'll also set up a date. So for example, here in the footer, you can see that we have the year. Now we will not hard code this year. We'll take a look at how we can use JavaScript in order to set that date dynamically. And we will also set up a back to top button. So once we click, notice how we nicely scroll back to the top. And then as we start scrolling, only once we reach certain pixel size again, then we have our button. So if we'll not go past that pixel size, then we won't see the button. But then as we start scrolling, notice again, at certain pixel size, we will have our button. Now there's also going to be two setups because on a small screen, we'll take a look at how we can set up the links. However, this is going to be a dynamic setup. And since I would want to show you with actual example, you'll see once we start working on it. Because remember previously, we kind of already did this kind of project where we had a toggle for the navbar. However, this is going to be a little bit different where it's going to be dynamically reading what is the size of the navbar. And again, it's just going to make more sense once we get to that actual part. And then, for example, if we scroll to services, again, we navigate nicely to the services. And the reason why the project is going to be a bit tedious is because we have multiple setups. We have one setup for the big screen. We have one setup if the nav bar is fixed or not. And then we also have a setup for the small screen. So again, just be patient. Try to follow along without falling asleep. And I have no doubt that together we will complete the project. Like I mentioned in the previous project, there's going to be more HTML than typical in this project. And essentially the first video I would want to spend on setting up all our HTML. Now, since it's not our first project, I feel quite confident that we can just add all the HTML first, and then one by one, we can start adding functionality in our app.js. Now, I'll start by getting rid of this heading one, and instead we'll place here a header. So we'll have here a header comment, and then of course a header element. Now, I'll close the sidebar just so I have more real estate in here. And then as far as the ID, I'm going to go with home. And don't worry, of course, I will cover why we'll use quite a few IDs in this project. Just wait, and we'll get there in no time. And then I would want to add here a nav bar. And then as far as the nav, we'll have a nav element. And then I'm going to add again the ID. And the ID in this case will be nav. Now, once I have my ID, awesome. Then I would want to place a div with the class of nav center. Now, within a nav center class, there's going to be a header. Now, header is my logo as well as the toggle button. That's what we'll place in there. So let's add comment nav header here. And then it's going to be a div with a class of nav header. So nav header. And then within this div, like I said, image. Now, the value for the image is logo SVG. And we'll just type logo as far as the alternative. And then let's also add here a class. So for the image, we'll add a class of logo. And also side by side, we will set up right away our button. So right where I have the image, after that, I'll have my button and we'll have a class of nav toggle. So nav hyphen toggle. And here we'll place a font awesome icon. So I F A S and F A and then hyphen bars. So now, of course, we're setting up our toggle icon. Good. And right after my header div, I would want to place my links. Now, the difference is going to be that in the index HTML, we will have a container for the links. So please make sure that you add them because this is going to be something different than a previous project. And of course, I will explain why we're adding this. So we'll have a div with a class of links container. And then within this links container, we will place our on our list. Now, since I don't want you to waste your time on typing out the HTML, if you'll head to utils HTML, you'll find the on our list that I'd want to add to my index HTML. So right within links container, copy and paste, and you'll have here 
an order list with a class of links. And then each and every item will be, of course, list item. And then in there we'll have our link. And the difference is going to be that it's not going to navigate to a page. It's going to navigate around the page. And then for all of them, we'll have this class of scroll link. So it's important that you don't delete anything here. And that should do it for the nav bar. But then right after the nav, but still within the header, again, that is extremely important, we'll have our banner. So I'm going to go here, banner, and we'll have a div with a class of banner. And then we'll have another container. So just a container. So not a links container like we had before, just a simple container. And in here, let's write a heading one with a text of scroll project. And we'll have some kind of paragraph with, I don't know, 20 words or something like that. So lorem 20, I have my paragraph. And then I would want to set up a link that will also scroll around our project. And as a side note, as you can see, my typing is just excellent. So this, of course, is going to be scroll project. And the reason why I'm setting this link, because I want to showcase that you're not limited to set up a smooth scroll only in your nav. So for example, here, if I click notice again, we will smooth scroll to that particular section. However, I can also add here the same link that I'm adding here in navbar, as long as I'm adding my scroll link class. And then of course, I can also navigate to the tours. So that was the whole idea behind this link. So right after the paragraph, I'm going to have a link. And again, the href will be specific where it's going to be hashtag and then tours. And then in here, I'll have class. And the class will be scroll link. So the same as in my navbar. And then just for styling, I'm going to add BTN and BTN white. And as far as the text, I'm going to go with explore tours. We'll save it. I have my link. Beautiful. And then, like I said, since I would want to set up a more realistic scenario, we'll just add some sections with some title just so we can nicely scroll around our project. And the way it's going to look like we'll have about and then in here we'll have a section. Now, what is important that we have the ID with an about. And the way it's going to work is that we'll have some kind of section with an ID. And then where we have the link, once we click, we will read that value. So we'll know which section we're talking about. And then we smooth scroll to that particular section. Now, what's important is that you have the names exactly the same. So you can call it, of course, however you do want. But if you would call this hashtag Bobby Lee, then also make sure that if you're adding the section, then also the ID value matches that. So in my case, since my link has hashtag and then about, that's why I'm adding ID to my about section with a value of about. And then since I would want to add a little bit of styling and more specifically a padding, so I'm going to add here a section class. Now within a section, like I said, there's not going to be too many things we'll just have a title. And then title will have a heading two with a text of our and then we'll add a little bit of styling with the span. And then we're just going to say us. And as you can see, it wasn't actually our it is about because I was reading already next section. So it is about us. Now I also want to quickly mention that I purposely added no padding in here, because it is very crucial for us to see that we are navigating exactly to the edge of the section. And you'll see a couple of gotchas that we'll have to solve. But again, I did this on a purpose. It wasn't like I forgot how to add padding on the top, just in case you're wondering, you never know. And now I'd want to copy my section. So selected one, two, and now I just need to change these values around. So I will select right now my comment as well as my ID, and we'll delete it. And in here, we'll write services. Okay, that's good. And then as far as the text, it's going to be our and then services. Okay. And then in here, we'll go with tours. So again, we select both of them. And we'll write tours. And then as far as the text within heading two, let's just write featured tours. And lastly, I would want to set up the footer as well as the scroll button. So can we can scroll back to the top. So right after my section, I'll add another comment. And as a side note, if you want to check it out, this is what we'll have. Again, nothing spectacular, 
but this is just going to give us a structure where we can nicely scroll around our project. So I have a footer. I think I'm going to add a class of section just so I can get a little bit of padding here. So I'll write here footer and class section. And then within the footer, I will have my paragraph. I'll start by setting up the copyright. We'll use a special HTML character. So I'm getting my ampersand and then I'm going to write copy. And then we'll write back roads, back roads, travel tours, company. And then I will hard code right now my date. But then, of course, we will use JavaScript in order to see how we can set it up dynamically. So for the time being, I'm just going to write 2020. And then we will add here a class and the value will date. And then right after the span, we'll set up another sentence. So let's write all rights reserved like so. And lastly, we will add our button, but I can tell you right away that the button will be hidden by default. Again, I didn't see the point of adding the button and then going over the same old stuff. We already have covered this quite a few times where we add something and then by default we hide it. And then, of course, we just add that class. So what I'm trying to say, of course, once we cover the button, I'll show you where you can find this in the CSS. But just don't get discouraged that as you're adding the button, you won't be able to see the button. So in here, I'll have another comment and it will just say back to top button or link or you would want to call it and it will be a link. Now I do want to add some classes here. So I'll go with class scroll hyphen link and then top link. So that is also another specific class. And then as far as the href, well, since I would want to scroll back to the top and the ID from my header is home, what do you think is going to be my href? Yep, of course it is going to be home. So I'm going to head down to my href. I'll look for home. And then in here, I'll have hashtag and then home. So that's my href. And then within this link, we'll place a font awesome icon and the values will be FAS and then FA arrow arrow up. Let's see how that will look like. And of course, I'm kidding because you won't be able to see the link, but that should do it for our indexation email. And then one by one, we can start setting up our functionality in JavaScript. Beautiful. And we'll start by setting up our date dynamically using JavaScript, more specifically here, because of course, it is okay to hard code the value if you want. But then what are you going to do on January 1st? Are you just going to look for all your projects and then update the current year? Or you much rather would set that up dynamically and then just forget about it? because then it always will display that actual current year. And I think the second option is a bit more nicer because we all have some other things to do on January the 1st. So we'll start by looking in the app.js. But one thing that I think I messed up in a previous video is that I have here a class update and I actually wanted to have the ID. Now, it is not a big deal if you want to keep the class. Just remember to use the query selector. But in my case, I'm going to go with ID of date. Again, not a biggest deal, but I just like to stay consistent how I made the project. So where I have the app JS, notice we have quite a few comments and don't worry. Of course, I'll talk about them once we get there, but we'll start by setting up the date. So that's our first task. And in here, I'll just have some kind of variable and it will be a date because why not? And then, like I said, I'll use get element by ID. If you want to keep the class, just remember to use the query selector. I'm looking for the date and then I'm going to go with date in our HTML and that will be equal to our date object. Remember, we covered global objects and one of them was date. So in this case, I'm going to go with new date, then I will invoke it. And right away on that object, I have a method with a name of get full year. So this is exactly what I'll use. I'll use this get full year and you'll notice that even after we remove this 2020 and technically we should have everything empty, you'll see that I nicely still have my 2020. And this way, again, I don't have to be a madman on January 1st and I don't have to update all my projects manually. So I set up my date and I'm good to go. All right. And up next, 
we'll take a look at how we can toggle our links. But again, this is going to be a little bit different setup because we'll calculate that height dynamically. And like I promised, I'll talk about it in more detail once we actually get there. So we'll navigate back to app.js and you notice where you have the comments for closed links. This is where we'll work. And we'll start by selecting three things. So not two things like we had in a previous project when we're set up to toggle. But in this case, we are looking for three things. I'm looking for a links container. Then I also would want to get the links. And of course, I also need that toggle. So those are the three things that I would want to select. And I'll start by setting up some kind of variable. And I guess for the button, I'm going to go with a nav toggle is equal to document. Then again, we're using query selector. And then as far as the class name, it is nav toggle. Okay, good. Let's copy and paste. And we'll change these values around. The second one will be quite long variable name. But I just thought that it would give us more clarity. That's why I'll write this as a links container. Again, of course, you can shorten it if you want. Just make sure that you remember the actual name. And then as far as the class for this guy, it is a links container. So links container. So that's the div where all the links sit in. And I think in this case, I can just make this one smaller. So I can still see everything in one line. And as far as the third thing, that will be my links. So in here, I'll write links. And then the class name is links. And we'll start very simply by repeating how we created the previous project. So we already know that we can just add a event listener. So nav toggle, add event listener, we're listening for click event, we'll have our callback function. And then within the callback function, well, we should have some kind of class in CSS, correct? So if I check out right now my CSS, and I don't know why I'm going to index HTML, if I need style CSS, and if I'll find my navbar, navbar, you'll see that by default, the links, the links container will be hidden. We'll have our links container, then height is set to zero, our flow is again hidden. And then remember, in the previous project, it was very simple. We just grabbed this class, we added the height, and we we're good to go. So we'll do exactly the same. But then, of course, at the end, I'll show you what is the downside of this approach. Uh, or more specifically, maybe when we'll have some downsides. I mean, you can use this approach. There's nothing wrong with this approach. You just need to know that there's going to be some specific setups where this is not going to work. So again, we hide our links container. That's why we cannot see the links. And then we have our show links class. And like we did in a previous project, I'm just going to grab, of course, my links container. Links container, because that's the one that's hidden. I'll add here a class list. And then we'll just toggle. We'll say toggle, and then the class that I'm looking for is show links. So let's add that class, and now you'll see that the moment I click, of course, I can see my links. Now let me show you the downside of this approach. Again, there's nothing wrong with this type of setup. You just need to be aware of the situations where you will have the issues. So I'll navigate right now to my current project. And now why do we add here this 200 on a small screen? So if I open this up, why do you think I'm adding this class of show links and then the height is 200? And if you remember the previous project, it is simply because if I inspect, I will know that for my links, the height is 200. Now, in this case, it shows like 201 and 0.14. Okay, that doesn't matter. But the whole idea is that, yes, of course, we'll have that height. And then, of course, we would get that height and then just add it in our CSS. However, what do you think happens if, for example, in the index HTML, and in this case, I actually do need the index HTML. I'm sorry, not the utils index. I would add another link or I would remove the link. For example, I add another link. Okay. And I'll see on the right hand side that my functionality still works. But I'm definitely missing here a link. And I can clearly see that if I click on the links, you'll notice that, yeah, one is missing. So one is somewhere here and I cannot see it. Why I cannot see it? Because in my CSS, and for some reason it's closing all the time. So let me open up so all of them are open. This height is hard coded. Again, awesome setup. 
but we always need to make sure that this is going to be the exactly the height. And there's going to be cases where this will be dynamic. This value will be changing. Yeah, for the links, you're probably the king of the castle. So you will be the one who's setting up the links. So of course, you'll be the one who's controlling the height and all that. But again, there's going to be some dynamic setup once in a while where you're not going to be able just to add that height manually and then just forget about it. Okay, you might run into specific issues. For example, in this case, what if these links are changing? What if one time you have four and then the second time you have five? Or maybe in one case, you'll have three. So in that case, of course, I would delete it. So now you can see that I will have my height, but then I have this space. Again, not the best scenario. So of course, in the next video, we'll take a look at how we can do this dynamically. Again, I'll repeat this for 55th time, but you can use this approach. There's nothing wrong with this approach, but just keep in mind that there's going to be some situations where you will have to calculate this height dynamically. And we're adding this manually in a CSS and just adding this class will simply not work. Wonderful. Once I have spent half an hour talking about the setup that we will not use in this particular project, I'm just going to comment out for your reference. So you always know that you can still use this if you are not using any kind of dynamic data. And then we'll take a look at how we can actually calculate the height and toggle that actual height. So the height of my links, not the hard coded value that we're using in the show links. And in order to do that, we'll use this method, the get bounding client rect. And as you can see, it is a method and it just returns the size of an element and its position relative to a viewport. As always, it is going to be much more faster if we'll start using this particular method. And I'll come up with some kind of variable. And in this case, again, I'm going to go with the long one and you'll see in a second why, because there's going to be another variable that is very, very familiar, or I'm sorry, similar to this one. And I would just want you to see clearly which one is which. So in here, I'm going to go with container and then height. And this is going to be equal to a links container. So remember, we had that div where all the links were sitting and the one that we were toggling this class. Well, in this case, I'm going to go with links container and then I'll use that method. So get bounding and then this client rect. Now, in order to actually not make any kind of pronunciation errors, I think I'm just going to say get bounding. That I think is going to be a little bit more faster. So I'm going to here invoke my method, of course. And now let's console log it what we have here. So I'm going to go with log and then container height. Let's see. Of course, I would like to open up my console. And then in a console, I should have some kind of value. Now, the interesting part is that I'm getting the object. Okay, good. That is awesome. But we're also noticing that we're getting this height of zero. Now, why are we getting this height of zero? Well, by default, we set this equal to zero. So of course, this is going to be my value. So I'm getting this height of zero. Okay, these two match. Now, why I have this height of zero? Because of course, by default, I want to hide these links. So that's why I have this links container wrapping around my links. Because by default, I wanted to hide them. However, you're probably wondering, okay, why you're telling all this? Because I just want to let you know that we purposely use this div to wrap our links. So we still get the height, not this height, not the height of zero. I'm just showing you where you would get an error. If, for example, you wouldn't have this wrapping div and you would just use your links, then set them to height to zero. So there's no way for you to access what is the actual height of the links. So what is the height that you're looking for? Because if you're just going to be looking for the element where you set it equal to height to zero, it's not going to work. So yes, we used a parent container, we set it equal to height to zero. And in fact, we'll use this value, but not to actually set it up our new toggle. For that, we will use this links. Why? Because I did not change the height for my links. And I think it's going to be easier for you to understand if I just delete my container height. And then let's look for this links height. So not the container, not the parent container, but the links. 
And again, I'm gonna go with links and then height. Like I said, pretty similar variables. That's why I wanted to have a longer name just so you can see what is what. And then we go with links, and then again we go with this get and bounding whatever method name. So get and let me get my get bounding client and whatever method name. And in this case, again, I'm looking here for the height. Now, of course, since it is an object, I can just access the height if I would want. So I don't need to go with the full object and then get that property. I can just add here dot. And then, of course, I will get right away my height. Now, once I have both of them, now let's check it out. What is the link height? So container height, we already saw that it was zero. But what if we go with links height? Let's see. If we click the button, we have some kind of value. Now, what is the value? Value is 150. Why the value is 150? Because I have three links. So in order to show that, I'm going to copy and paste two more times. And now we should have larger value. What do you think is the value right now? It is 251. Why? Because I have a five links and I'm calculating this height automatically. Again, I'm going to navigate to a bigger screen just to showcase. So we're getting this value because this will be zero by default. This is zero. You can see it here. It has some kind of width, but the height is zero. And we cannot set it up if we're using this height of zero. It just won't work. It will work, however, if we're getting this link zero. However, for the parent, we have to have this height zero because I want to hide them. Okay, that was the whole point of the setup. So once we have both of these values, beautiful. I will get rid of this console log and now I'll set up a if statement. So I still needed my container height. Remember, I mentioned that. And in this case, I'm going to say if container height is equal to zero. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means the default setup, correct? So if the container height is equal to zero, then I would want to dynamically add height to my container. So again, we're still adding height to container because it is zero. However, we'll use this link site. And the way it will work, we'll look for our links container. And then we can just look for our style property. And then, not sorry, not this one. And then on the style property, we have the property of height. So this is going to be my height. And I'll just set it dynamically using template string equal to my variable. Now, what variable I'm looking for? I'm looking for the actual link site. Again, not the container height. That will be zero. But in this case, I'm looking for links height. And then I would just want to add these pixels here. So I'm going to go with pixels. Now, what is the other situation? Well, the other situation would be if the links are already open, correct? So in this case, we just need to go with else. And then we go with links container. And then again, style and then height. And probably I could have just copied and pasted. And I'll set this equal to zero. And you'll see how nicely. Once I open this up, I'll have exactly the height that I'm looking for, because this will be dynamic. This will depend on those links. And of course, I'll show you by deleting few links as well. And then since now height is not equal to zero, because we already added, of course, the height. Now I'll just close it up. That's it. Now the actual container will go back to the zero. So that's going to be our setup. Now, there's one gotcha that I want to show you. And that will have to do with once we get to the bigger screen. You'll notice that in our case, everything looks very beautiful. However, the reason why it looks beautiful, because in a style CSS, I'll look for my media query and you'll see this links container. So again, that is the container for my links has this height of auto. Now notice what happens if you comment this out. So I'll go back. First of all, I cannot see the links. Why I cannot see the links? Well, because I closed the toggle, right? So links were hidden. Now, in this case, if I'm going to go to the bigger screen, you'll see that my height is very, very big for my links. Why? Well, because I opened up the toggle. Because the way it works, you can see here in the actual developer tools. And by the way, let me make this bigger. You'll see that we are actually adding inline styles. So that's how it works here. When we're using JavaScript, this is inline. And if you remember from HTML and CSS, inline was stronger than our actual external CSS style sheet. So that's why 
whatever we type over here, well, we'll just override. That's why in a CSS, I needed to add this height auto. So that way it will always be auto, not zero or whatever I have the value for. And I just need to uncomment. And what's important is to add this important flag because again, this will be inline CSS. And as always, I uh, would just want to showcase that we can add or remove links if we wanted to. So if I'll go back to four items, you'll see that my height still be awesome. So I'll still have my services. And as a side note, I don't know what happened here. Should have been here tours. So let me go with tours. Probably messed it up in a previous setup. And let's see. Yep, we have our tours. Beautiful. Then if I would want to actually copy and paste, we'll see one more tour. And as you can see, now I can dynamically add, remove, and do whatever I want. And I'll always, always have my exact height that I'm looking for. That's it. So that's how we can set it up using this property. So again, we are setting up three things. We have the container, we have the actual links, we have the nav toggle. Then we're using this get bounding client rec. So that's going to give us an object What we're looking for is the height. The moment we get the height, we just check the height for the parent, which should be by default zero. That's how we will hide our links. And then of course, if the height is zero, then we'll add a height for the children, which in our case is links height. And then if it is already open, if we have toggled links, then of course we would want to hide them. So we set it back equal to zero, but we just need to remember that in a CSS, we need to override that. Otherwise, since we're using inline CSS, this is going to be more powerful. And that's going to be a dynamic setup for toggling the links. And next one up, we have fixed navbar and back to top scroll button. So here's what I would want to do. Once I scroll past the height of the navbar, then I would want to set up a class on navbar, the fixed class. So that way, notice as I keep on scrolling, navbar will always stay there. And the same will work with a back to top button where it will only show up once we scroll past a certain point. But then once we go above that point, and as you can see, we cannot see our scroll button. And the way I'll set that up is by using scroll event. So we have our window object, then we can add a event listener, and I'll be listening for a scroll event. So scroll event. And then again, we have our callback function. And the property that I'm going to be looking for is going to be page y offset. And as always, we'll start by simply console logging. And we'll write this as window, and then page y offset. That's the property we're looking for. And as a side note, if you're interested in page y offset, it is a read only window property that returns the number of pixels the document has been scrolled vertically. And of course, we can just double check that by opening up the console. And you'll see that in the beginning, I'll have zero. And as I keep on scrolling, notice these values keep on getting bigger. So that means that, of course, I'm scrolling down. And in here, I'll simply say that if this value is bigger than the height of my navbar, what are we going to do? We'll add a specific class to our navbar. The class I'm looking for is the fixed navbar. If we scroll up a bit, we'll see that we'll have our fixed nav, position fixed, top left, width, and then a little bit different background, where at the moment, as you can see on a bigger screen, it is transparent. So I have my transparent background. But then within this position fixed, the fixed nav class, I'll have background of white and then a little bit of shadow. So that's what we will add. So back in the app JS, I would want to start by targeting both the nav bar as well as back to top link. So for the nav bar, I'll have here a variable, of course, and I'll use my ID. So I'm going to have document get element by ID get element my ID and I'm looking for the nav ID. And then the second, remember, we had button all the way in the bottom. And I'm just going to call this top link. And that will be equal to the document. And I'm sorry, this should be a equal sign. So document, then a query selector. And I'm looking for top link. So link had the class of tap link. 
So once I have selected both of these things, then I would want to get the height for my navbar. And we already know how to do that. We can use our get bounding client rect. So we'll have two variables. One will be scroll height. So let's have here const and then scroll height like so. That will be equal to our window and then page y offset. Beautiful. And then in here we'll have a navbar height. So I'm just gonna have const nav height. And then nav height should be equal to a nav bar, then get bounding, get bounding client rect. And then I'm right away looking for my height. And I'm just going to set up a if statement where if scroll height is bigger than a nav height, then I would want to add that class. Now, what class am I talking about? Well, the class name was fixed nav. So we go to nav bar, then class list. Then we'll add and we'll have here fixed nav. That is the class name. And then, of course, we also have the else, correct? So we'll have else navbar class list remove. And then in this case, again, the class name is exactly the same. So fixed nav. Let's save it. We can navigate to a bigger screen just so we can see it better. And you'll see that the moment I'll scroll past the height of the navbar, I will get my fixed navbar. So, of course, it is sitting right here. And the same thing will be for my button back to top scroll button. So, as I keep on scrolling, I just need to come up with some kind of value. Now, I went with 500. Of course, you can change that value however you'd want. And in order to show and hide our link, our back to top link, you'll see that we have our show link class. So, again, this is going to be a scenario where link is hidden by default. That's the reason why you cannot see. If you'll comment this out, you'll see that we'll have our link over here, but it is hidden by default, like we already have covered in a previous project. And then in order to show the link, we'll toggle this class, show link class. And we just need to decide what is going to be the point in the document where I would want to show my back to top link. And we'll set up another if statement. And in this case, I'm going to say if scroll height is bigger than, for example, 500. Again, that is arbitrary number. You can add whatever you'd want. In that case, I'll have my top link. And again, I'm looking for a class list and I would want to add a show link class. And what is the else? Well, then I would want to remove it, correct? So I'm going to go with else, then top link, again, class list, and then we'll remove. And the class we're removing is the show link class. And now you'll see. First, we start scrolling. And notice once we get past the size of the navbar, of course, I get my fixed navbar. And of course, I can toggle my navbar as well. But once I keep on scrolling and then reach 500 pixels, then of course, I'll display my back to top. And as a quick side note, the links, the actual scrolling will work already. Okay. Now, of course, in this case, I'm showing you the complete project, but yes, it will still work. Okay, that's something you need to keep in mind where it will work, but there is some additional functionality that we would need to add. So at this point, we can see that we're scrolling to a sections, but we're actually missing them. Okay, now, why is this working by default right away? Well, there's two things. First, in the actual HTML, or I'm sorry, CSS, I added a code for that. So the reason why we can navigate around the page, because that is a default HTML setup, where once you click on a link, you will navigate to that particular section. Again, this is not a sorcery that would happen. Now, the reason why it's happening smoothly right away is because in HTML, I added this scroll behavior smooth. So if I'll comment this out, you'll notice that yes, we can navigate around our page. But notice this is not happening smoothly. So as I keep on clicking, Check it out. Yes, I do navigate to those particular sections, but that is not happening smoothly. So in this case, in HTML, you would need to add this scroll behavior smooth. However, in our case, we do need to add even more functionality in our JavaScript. And we'll do that in the next video. Why? Because like I just mentioned, we are missing our sections. We can clearly see that I scroll past the, for example, about section or the same with services. As you can see, I cannot see my services. So we would need to fix that again using JavaScript. But that would be our setup 
if we would want to add these classes dynamically based on where we are in the document. And again, the functionality is following where we're checking for the page Y offset. Now, of course, the first we would need to set up a event listener for scroll event and that would be on the window. Then we're looking for our page Y offset, like I just told you. And then I'm just saying, what is the height for the nav bar? Okay. Once I'm past the height, I'm good to go. Then I'll add my fixed nav class. Now, once I'm below that number, then of course I will remove the class. As far as back to top, we just simply say the scroll height must be bigger than some kind of value, whether that's 500, whether that's 100, whether that's 1000. That is up to you. And then we just add the show link, where again, we just displaying that link. And then on the else, we just remove the link. And our final job is to set up a smooth scrolling, however, a precise smooth scrolling. So for example, I have my navbar notice. Once I navigate to about, I'm exactly where the about section starts. Same for services, the tours, and you get the point. And of course, I can navigate all the way back to the top. Uh, I can also do the same thing with my button. And it's going to do the same thing regardless of the screen size. So I can also do it over here, where once I click, we will hide the nav bar. So we'll hide our links, but we'll still navigate to that specific section. So for example, that could be tours. And of course, we can navigate back. Because like I said, even though we technically do already have the smooth scroll because of the CSS that I added, the problem is that we are missing our sections. So notice I can clearly see that I'm scrolling past the sections. And it's even worse on a small screen where, for example, notice I'm navigating to the tours and I don't know where I'm even at. Now, at the moment, what do we have in AppJS? Pretty much nothing, right? So we just have the comment for the smooth scroll. And remember, when we were setting up our links, I purposely added to all of them this scrolling class. And that includes this guy as well, this link that is in my banner. And now we'd want to target them, of course, in the AppJS. And we'll just iterate over them using for each. And to each link, we'll add a event listener and we'll listen to a click event. So let's start doing that. So const scroll links. So scroll links like so. And that will be equal to a document. So document. Then we're looking for query selector. However, we're looking for all, of course. So remember, now we're getting a list. So right here, a scroll link class. And then I'll have my node list. Okay, beautiful. And of course, I can access it by accessing the variable. So right here for each. Now I'm iterating over. I do have my callback function. In a callback function, I can access each and every link in my parameter. And I'll just name it a link. And in here, I'll write a link add event listener. And again, we'll be listening for the click event. And then we'll have our callback function. And the first thing that I would want to do in my callback function is actually prevent this default behavior. Where at the moment, as you can see, we are getting the smooth scroll, but we would want to add more functionality. So I would want to prevent this default behavior. And in order to do that, I'll have to access my event object. And I'll write here prevent default. And now you'll notice that once you click on a link, you'll not navigate anywhere. So you'll be sitting right exactly in the same place. And this is exactly what we want, at least in the beginning. So in here, we'll write a comment, we'll say prevent, and then default. Now, what are our next steps? I would want to use event current target. So that is going to give me my link. And I would want to get my attribute. Now, what attribute am I talking about? Well, in the index HTML, I can see that each and every link will have this href, and then hashtag of tours. So I'm looking for this value because I'll use this value to find that section dynamically. So in the app.js, right after prevent default, I'll go with a comment and we'll write here, navigate to specific, specific spot. Okay, beautiful. And I'll start by getting the ID. So I'll have my ID variable, and that will be equal to E. And then remember current target was the link we're clicking on. 
And then we have a method of get attribute. Now, what is get attribute going to give me? Well, that is just going to get me the actual attribute. And the attribute that I'm looking for is the href. So in this case, I'm saying get attribute. And then I need to be specific which attribute am I talking about? And I would like to get the href. And as always, it is the best case scenario to actually console log it just so we all are on the same page. So let me open up my toggle. And you'll see that now, of course, I'm getting this value, the about. Then, of course, I can also get services, stores, and you get the gist. Now, why do I need this value? Because I'll use document get element by ID, just like we have been doing it before. Remember, when we're selecting the navbar, for example, we use document get element by ID, and we passed in the ID. So this is exactly what I'll do right now, where, of course, that href will reference my section, the ID of the section, and I would just want to get this ID and pass it into document get element by ID with this specific ID. Now, the way I can access it is by using slice, and I'm just going to say one. Now, if we scroll up, you'll see that slice extracts a section of a string without modifying the original string. And why am I passing here this one? Because I'm just saying, you know what? Start from the index of one. So skip that hashtag. That's why if we console log it right now, you'll see that I'm just getting the about. I'm not getting this hashtag about. I'm just getting the about. And of course, I can select that element. If I just set up some kind of variable, in my case, element, then I'll use document get element by ID. And this is where I'm passing this ID. So whether that's about services and tours and tours. So within the ID, let's pass in our ID, and now we'll have our element. Now we're halfway there. We have the element. Awesome. Now I'd want to get the position of that element, whether that is a tour section, whether that is a services, or whether that is about. And I can get that value if I use offset top. Again, let's scroll up. We have offset top property, a number representing the top position of the element in pixels. So let's try it out. I will have some kind of variable. And in this case, I'm going to call this position. Now I'm going to be setting this up with let and you'll see in a second why. And I'll set this up to a element. So that is the element that I'm dynamically selecting, depending on which link I'm clicking on. And then like I said, offset top. So we we'll go with offset top. And this should give us a value for the top of that section. Now that value will be a little bit off and we'll cover that in the next video. So don't worry, we still have ways to go, but this should give us at least an idea where this actual element is. And as always, we can console log if you want. So we're going to go here with position and you'll see, for example, that once I click on the about, I'll have 838 pixels for the tours. I'm going to have 1645. Again, these numbers will be different and will change because we have a little bit different setup. Remember, we had position fixed involved. We had a bigger screen. We had a smaller screen. So again, in the next video, we'll get those coordinates exactly. But for the time being, I would still want to scroll somewhere, correct? So I have my position. And in order to scroll to that position, I can use window and then scroll to. Again, the method name is scroll to, and then within this method, we pass in the object. And in the object, we have coordinates. And the coordinates that I would want is left, and I'll set my left to be equal to zero, because I would only want to navigate vertically. And then, of course, for the top, I'm just going to use this position. So within the window scroll, we just say where we'd want to scroll to. We window scroll to, and then left zero, and then, for example, top. 100. So then, of course, we would scroll 100 pixels from the top. Now, just to showcase that it will work, I'm going to go with about and notice how we scrolled 100 pixels. Now, of course, I would want to use my position. So that is going to give me the value where I would want to scroll to. Again, it's not going to be precise because we have a little bit more complicated setup, but I can just add here position and you'll see that it is going to be somewhat correct but we'll have to do some modifications. Now, the last thing that I would want to add in this video before we start calculating the heights and all that, 
I would just want to close my links on a smaller screen. Again, I don't really care about the bigger screen because my links are in one line anyway. But on a smaller screen, don't you think it looks better if, for example, when we scrolled up and down, we would close our little toggle nav bar? Because otherwise, we just keep on scrolling and notice we're all the time we'll have these links open. And I don't think it is the best user experience. So right after we have our window scroll to remember in order to close our links, we just needed to target the links container and we already have access to it because of course up here I have selected it. Correct. So links container and what we needed to add here was style and then height and we'll just set it equal to zero. And now you'll see again. We will not scroll to a specific place. We will have to fix that in the next video, but at least we will close our little toggle nav bar on a smaller screen. So beautiful. In the next video, we'll start calculating our heights, and then we'll finally be able to scroll to that particular section smoothly, and we'll scroll to the exact beginning position of that section. All right, let's finally fix our smooth scroll. And we'll start by setting up again the heights. So we'll be interested in the nav height. We'll be interested in the container height. So that is, of course, going to be the container for our links. We'll be looking for the fixed class, whether we have added to a nav bar or not. And then we're also going to have to change this position a little bit. So here I'll add a comment, and I'm purposely pushing this position down because I'll change this value in a second. But what I'm looking for here is calculate the heights. So we're going to write here kites. And we'll start by getting the nav bar height. Now I already have selected the nav bar, so I just need to come up with a variable. So I'm going to have here nav height is equal to my nav bar. Again, I already have selected it. Then I'll use again this get bounding client rect. That is my method. And I'm looking for the height. Okay, good. Now I also want to do the same thing with my container. So again, I'm interested in my container. So I'm going to go with const, then container, and I'll go with the longer name for my variable, just because I think it will help you to understand which one is which. We have our links container, then we have again, our get bounding client rect. And then again, we're looking for the height. As a side note, if you want to select them somewhere globally, of course, you can do that. But In my case, since this is the last time where we're actually getting them in this project, I might as well do the whole setup here. And once I have both heights for the nav as well as for the container, then I'll set up another variable, which will hold the value whether the nav bar has a class of fixed nav or not. So I'll have const fixed nav. That is my variable name. And then nav bar again. And I'm looking for the class list and contains. And again, this is going to be either true or false. So if the nav bar has the fixed class, then of course, this will be true. If not, then it will be false. And once we have all these three values plus our position, now I would want to start by fixing up the position. So what exactly I'm going to be fixing? Well, you see, as we're scrolling, the first thing you'll notice is that once we get to that particular section, the reason why I'm not at the exact position where the section starts is because nav bar covers it, correct? So what I would want to do is instead of setting it to element and then offset top, which is just going to give me the position for that exact section, I would want to subtract the height of the nav bar. So I'm going to say minus nav height. And you'll notice that if the nav is fixed, again, this is important, nav needs to be fixed, we will nicely navigate to that particular section like so. Why? Because we just remove that value of the nav height. So we have offset top. That is the exact location of the section, correct? But then we subtract the nav height. And once we subtract the nav height, then of course, we just move a little bit up. So if we would be here, then of course, this would be the value for the section. But since I'm saying, yeah, but I have the section, but I don't want to navigate that far down because my nav bar covers it. That's why we subtract the value for the nav bar. So that's the easiest step. Okay. Then I would want to deal 
with a fact that if my navbar is not fixed and if my navbar is fixed, the values will change. And I'll simply show you that by console logging the position, like so position. And you'll see that if the nav bar is fixed in a console, you'll have one value for the section. And then if the nav bar is not fixed, then of course you'll have a different value. So at the moment, nav bar is not fixed. I click on the about and you'll see 443. So that is my value. Now, if I navigate to services and at the moment, of course, my nav is already fixed and then I navigate back, check it out. We have a difference. So in one case, it was 443. And then in the next case, it was 360. So I would need to fix it where I would need to check that if, of course, the nav bar is not fixed, then I would need to have a different value. Now, first of all, why is this happening? Well, you see, once the nav bar is fixed, we're taking it out of the normal flow. So originally here, we have one value, and that would be the height of our nav bar. But then once we remove that height, even though technically our initial value was correct, since we removed the nav bar from our normal flow, now this value does not match where the actual section is. Okay. That's why when we have actually nav bar not set to fixed, you'll see that once you navigate to about, you actually scroll past because the moment the nav bar goes to fixed, then we take it out of the normal flow. So now, of course, this value is not exactly where we'd want to be. The actual value is this one is 360. And as you can see, it is smaller. Why it is smaller? Because we take out the height of the nav bar out of the normal flow, where with the nav bar, the location for about, for example, was 443. Once we take out the nav bar, which we do with position fixed, then the value is 360. So it is actually less. So what I would want to do is check if the nav bar has that class of fixed nav, and then we would want to even subtract more value from the position. So the way it will look like I'll have my if statement. And in here, I'll say, if nav fixed, again, it is going to be our nav, or I'm sorry, the not operator. And I'm going to say if fixed nav is equal to false. Now, what does that mean? That means if the nav bar is in a static position, it is not fixed. We haven't scrolled past the height of the nav bar. If that is the case, I'll set my position. That's why I use the keyword of let. And I'll say whatever I have my current value, whatever it is over here, and we'll subtract even more the nav height. Again, why we're doing that? Because when we make the calculations at this point, we're still calculating the height of the nav bar. But in our setup, we already started scrolling. So of course, we removed that nav bar from the normal flow. And now we need to actually change that value. That's why once we add our code notice, even when we are sitting nicely at the top of the document, so our nav bar is not fixed, we can still nicely navigate to the actual section. Now, as a side note, you know what? In the index HTML, I already showed you how we're calculating this dynamically. So I think I will remove this towards one. And as you can see, even once I remove this particular link, because we're still using the value, we're calculating the height for a nav bar. Nothing here is hard coded. Our setup will still work. So if I'll navigate back, notice we're still navigating to services, to tours, and all that. Now, the problem is going to be on a smaller screen. This is one more thing that I would need to fix because if we're all the way on the top, we click on about, we're not going to be exactly where we'd want to be. Why? Because we're also here calculating the height for the container. That's why in our code in the app.js, we were still looking for this code as well. So let me set up one more if statement where I'm going to say if nav height is bigger than 82. Now, what am I talking about with 82? Well, that's just going to be a setup for the actual top of the nav bar. So that is the case. If it is bigger than 82, what that means is that I have already opened up my links. And if the nav height is bigger than 82, then I would want to set my position equal to position and then plus the container height. And of course, container height will be whatever I have the links there. So I'll save it. We'll try out on a bigger screen. Now, let me see what I'll have. So at the moment, I have the home. So 
of course, in navigate home, I open up my links, then I navigate to about and of course, I navigate there, I close my links, and I'm exactly where I want it to be. Now, in this case, of course, I would like to also look for services. And we navigate to a services, we can try out on a bigger screen. In this case, we don't need to worry about the height being bigger than 82. Because this is not the case where we're toggling the links. So of course, in this case, we can just simply do whatever we we're doing before. Again, the gotcha there is that we're just calculating for the height. So we're just checking if the nav height is bigger than 82. That means that I have these links involved. And that's why I would need to add that value to my element. Because if you remember, in the beginning, when we were subtracting that value, this is exactly what we're doing right now. So what I'm saying here is position is equal to element offset top and nav height. Now, what do you think is the nav height right now? And I can tell you right away that this is going to be a sum of the top of our nav bar with our container with our links. That's why once we actually subtract, and if we don't add this code, you'll see that we'll navigate way more higher than we should be. So I'll click on about and notice, I should be way lower. Now why am I not lower? Because we subtract the nav height. And that is of course, are going to be our big one. That is going to be the total of our top of our nav bar with our container height. So that's why in this case, if I check and I can see that nav height is bigger than 82, then I just add this value of the container height, because I subtracted way more to begin with. So I'll navigate again to a bigger screen. And we can just clearly see that if I navigate, for example, to about everything works, services still works. And then we can also navigate back to the top. So this was our project. Hopefully you guys enjoy the project. And I'll hope to see you in the next project. Beautiful. And up next, we have the tabs project, where we'll have a bolt section. And in there, there's going to be some kind of image. And then of course, we'll have some kind of information. But in here, notice how once I click on a tab, I'll have different info displayed. So for example, these would be our goals, then we have history, and then the vision. Now, as always, we'll start with a fresh new project. So in setup, you'll find index HTML. And in here, we would need to add the HTML first. Now I'll start by setting up the section. So we'll go over here and have section. Then within the section, I'm going to start with a title. So div with a class of title. And then with the div, I'm going to have a heading to with a text of about. So that's going to be my section and then a paragraph with I don't know, 10 words. I think that should do it. Beautiful. And then after that, I'm going to set up my center. So right after my title, I'm going to have a div with two classes about center, which will set up our columns and then section center that just going to make sure that we have a certain width for our section. And then there I'll have two columns. So I'll have two articles. So article number one and two. Now, if you'd want, you can add here comments, but there's not much in there. So I'll just leave it without comments. And I'm going to have a image. And I'm going to be looking for my hero one. And then as far as the alternative, I'm just going to say about picture. Let's save it. I should have my picture awesome. And within the second article, I'll place my container. So the way it will be is I'm going to have my article. And then I'll have my buttons. So this is going to be my button container. And then in here, I'll have my content. So at the moment, of course, once you click, you notice only one content. But in general, there's going to be three divs, each of them will have the content. And of course, once we add JavaScript, dynamically, we'll show only one content, and then hide the rest of them. And we'll start with setting up our buttons, the container, so in this case, I'm going to add here a class of article or I'm sorry, about so class about for some reason, I was looking at the article. And then that's why I said that the class name is also article, but the class name is about then I'm going to add my button container container. And then it's going to be a div with the same class. So button container, 
and then within this div, I'll have three buttons. So button, all of them will have a class, and the class will be tab btn, but then one of them will have the class of active. And you'll see how it will work in a second. But then I also want to add data ID. Remember, we already covered this particular setup where we have a data set in the JavaScript. So that's how we were able to access it. But then in the HTML, I'll right away set up my data attribute. So I'm going to go with data hyphen. Again, you can name it whatever you want. But since I like short names, I'm just going to go with data ID. And the first one, I'll set it equal to history. And you'll see why we're doing that. So history. And as far as the value, it's also going to be history. Now I want to copy and paste two more times. And then class will stay. So that will be still tab BTN. But then these values, of course, will change. So instead of history, the second one will be vision. So let me set up two selectors or two cursors more properly. And I'm going to go with vision. And I'm going to do the same thing for this guy as well. So instead of history, it is going to be goals. And instead of goal, should be goals. So now I'll set up my goals. Awesome. Beautiful. And you know what? I will add here the class. My apologies for the first article. Also add about IMG. And you'll see just a little margin propping up and some other CSS. And then as you can see, these are my buttons. Okay, beautiful. Now, the way it will work is we'll have this active class that will just showcase which button has been clicked like so. And then, of course, for our content, we'll also use this active one, the class of active to show or hide the content. So the content that will have the active class will display whatever is the content. And then the rest of them who don't have that, of course, we will hide that particular content. Now, we will do it dynamically with JavaScript, but for the time being, we're just hard coding. And you know what? In this case, I think I can make it even smaller just so I can see a little bit more here. And once I have my buttons, awesome, I'll set up my contents. So a article with a class of about content. So let me make sure that I'm right outside the article. And in here, I'll say article with a class of about about content. And then, like I said, there will be three items in here. And I'll add comments and I'll copy and paste. So single item, copy and paste. And let's add here end of single item, end of single item. And in here, I would want to have a div with a class of content. And again, eventually, we'll add a class of active. Or you know what, for the time being, why don't we add class of active for all of them? And then eventually we'll just remove that class because otherwise we won't be able to see what we're adding. And then we would want to also add the ID. Now these IDs need to match whatever you have here as a value. So if for the button you add a value of history, also the ID should be history. So of course, for the time being, I'm going to have the ID and that will be equal to history and I'll copy and paste, but then we'll have to change these values so they match for example, vision or the goals. So that, of course, will be my div. Beautiful. And then within a div, I'm just going to have a heading four with a text of history. So let's go with history. We'll save it. That should be my first item. And as you can see, it is displayed. Awesome. And then also, I would want to add rest of the text in here. So let's see. We have our single item and I'll copy and paste. So now I'll have three of them and then eventually we'll add a little bit more content in here. So for the time being, I have the active, active, active. Don't worry, we'll delete it actually later. But then first I would want to change these values here. Like I said, they would need to match whatever I have for the IDs. So if I had history, vision and goals, same thing should be here. So the second one will be my vision and the third one will be goals so let's fix them like so and then also we can do the same thing for the values let's write over here vision vision and then i also add goals now technically you can add whatever you would want over here as far as the paragraph 
But if you'll check it out, the finished project, you'll notice that I added some different HTML just so it's a little bit more interesting. For example, in here, you'll have a longer paragraph and then some kind of honored list and all that. Then in here, you have a different text. And in order to set that up, if you'll check it out the files, you'll see the utils HTML. And then in here, as you can see, I just prepared for you a paragraph that you would need to add. Again, technically, you don't have to do it if you want to. You can just write lorem and then add whatever text you would want. But I just thought that would be cool if we would actually add them different, because that way we would be for sure able to see how we're switching the content. So in this case, I'm going to copy and paste and I'll place it where I have the history. So I copy and paste. I have my history. Now, of course, don't worry. We will be displaying all of them. But then the moment we'll remove that class of active, then we'll be able to see only one item. And then I'm looking for my vision, of course. Vision where you are. Here you go. Let's keep on scrolling right after our heading. Copy and paste. And the third one, we have also goals. So you know what? Of course, I missed out on my on order list. So let me head back to index HTML. I'm looking for my vision right after paragraph. Again, just to spice things up, I'm just going to add this on order list. And then last one is goals. So again, let me copy and paste my paragraph right after the goals. I should have something like that. And then, like I said, I would want to remove this class of active from all of them, but just leave it on the first one. Okay. Because again, this class of active will be the one that's responsible of hiding or showing the content. So let me delete from the second one. I believe that was vision. And then also from the goals. So as we're going to change this class of active, then we'll show or hide the actual content. Now you'll notice one thing that is missing, and that is a little bit of CSS. So what I would need is to grab my article about content and place it within the about. So I'll have my article, that is my about, but then also I'd want to grab my about content because within the section center, I should have only two articles. The first one with about image and the second one with about. So let me grab my about content. And if you want, you can, of course, collapse it. That's going to be faster. Then I'll cut it out. And then I would want to copy and paste right after my button container. So notice where I have the button container. I'll copy and paste. And now I'll have a proper CSS. So again, we have our class of active. And as a side note, if you want to see how the styling will take place, navigate to a bottom of CSS. And you'll notice that once we have a class of active background will be white. And for the content, the display will be set to block. That's why, for example, if I'll remove the class of active from the first one and attach it to a second one. So where I have the classes, you'll see that now, of course, I'm displaying the vision. Now, I didn't change the button. That's why the button still says history. But as you can see, as far as the content, I have the vision. So let me remove from the second one. And I'll leave it with the first one because, of course, that is my button. So let me go back to my single item and then just add here my class of active. And now we can head to JavaScript and add this functionality where the moment I will click on the tab, then, of course, I'll display a different content. All right, let's make our project a bit more dynamic. And we'll start in the app.js by selecting three things. I would want to select my about. So let's look for our article that has the class of about. Then I would want to target all my buttons. And I can see that all the buttons have the class of tab BTM. So that's what I'm going to be targeting. And then also I would want to get all my articles. And since all my articles has the class of content, that's how I also will target all my articles. So three things about buttons and articles. Let's come up with some names. And I think I'm going to go with BTNs, I guess. I'll go with document, then query selector all, since it's going to be a node list. And in here, we'll type tab BTN. That is, of course, class that all the buttons have. Then I would want to target my about, and I'll name it about. 
document, then query selector. Now the class is, of course, about so just about class. And then last, like I said, I would want to target articles. So I'm going to go with const and then articles. And we're looking for document, then query selector all. And then the class that is on all the articles is content. And once we have selected all three of them, now I would want to do something interesting where I would want to attach a event listener, the click event to a about. So not the buttons, not the articles, but the about. And just to showcase one more time, about is the parent container. And we will use the target, the event target, to actually check it out what we are clicking on. And you'll see that, of course, in a second. So again, not the buttons, not the articles, but the about. So I'm going to write about, then add event listener. I'll be listening for click events. So say click. And then, of course, I'll have my callback function. And then in a callback function, I can access my event object. That's why I'm typing in here the E parameter. And then I would want to see what is my actual target. As always, we can just simply console log. So console log and not the current target, because of course that will be about I'm looking for my target. So say E target. And because of event bubbling, what will happen is as I'm clicking on the content or the buttons, I'll see in a console what I'm actually clicking on. For example, if I click here, notice it tells me that I clicked on a paragraph. So if I'm going to click on the top over there, you'll see that I'm actually clicking on the article. Now, if I'm going to click on buttons, then of course, it will display that I clicked on a button. Now, knowing that, what do you think is unique about the buttons? What is unique about the buttons regarding the articles or the paragraphs? And what's unique about the buttons? That we have this data ID. And remember, data ID, we could access using a data set. So here's what I could do. I could say, you know what, get me that data set ID. And then if it actually exists, if it's not undefined, then I know that I'm clicking on a buttons. And just to showcase that I could say, okay, e target, that of course means whatever I'm clicking on, and then data set remember that return the object and then since i named my one data id of course the property i'm looking for is the id let me save it and now you'll see that if i click here of course it's going to be undefined why because paragraph or the article does not have this data set id or data id attribute which i can access with data set id however buttons do so if i click on here notice i nicely get back my value so whatever I had there as a value for my data ID, that is, of course, displayed in a console. Beautiful. So now what I can do is have some kind of variable. And I'm going to name mine wine ID. You can name it whatever you'd want. And I'll still do the same thing. Event, target, data, set, and then ID. And here I can just set up a simple if statement. Where if ID exists, so if it's not undefined, then I would want to do something. If it's undefined, then I'm not going to do anything. And basically what I'm doing is I'm just responding if I'm clicking on a buttons. Because if I'll be clicking on an article, of course, nothing will happen because it doesn't have this data ID attribute. So it's going to come back as undefined. So here we'll set up our logic. And I'll start by removing the class of active from all the buttons. Why? Because once I click on a particular button, I will add this actual class of active. But before I do that, I would want to remove it. How I can access all the buttons? Well, we already have the variable, correct? Because we used query selector all, and we selected all the buttons. And I'll add here comments. I'll say remove uh, active from other or all buttons, I guess, buttons. And we'll have our variable, of course. Then we'll set up a for each. Remember, we had a callback function. Each and every button we could access using the parameter. And of course, since I'm accessing the button right now, I can just say class list, then remove. And then I would want to remove the active class. 
So now you'll see if I click on a button, I'll remove that class of active from all of them. Okay, again, why I know that I clicked on a button because it has the data set, the property that I'm looking for. Awesome. What's next? Well, now I'd want to add that class of active to a button that I clicked on. So how can I access the button that I clicked on? Event target. That's the item that I'm clicking on. So I'm just going to go with E target class list and then add and class of active. And now you'll see as I'm clicking on a button, I am removing the class of active from all the buttons right from the get go and then adding to a button that I clicked on. And of course, now I would want to do the same thing for my contents because at the moment I am clicking on a buttons, but the content stays the same. All right. How we can do that? Well, I could again remove class of active from all the contents because I would want to hide the rest of them. Same like we did with buttons. And then I'll use that ID. Notice the value that I got back from data set ID to target my specific content. Because remember, all contents had the ID and the value matched exactly what I had here for data ID. So we'll use get element by ID. We'll grab this actual content and then display it. So let's try it out. Like I said, I'll start by hiding all of them. Let me see where my actual setup ends for the buttons. Still within the if statement, of course, because if I'm not clicking on the buttons, then I wouldn't want to do that since buttons only have the actual data set or data ID attribute. And then let's add comments here. Hide other articles or I guess basically hide all the articles and then we'll display the one that actually has the matching ID. So again, we have the articles. We do a for each. Then we have a callback function and we can access each and every article with a parameter and I'll name my one article and then article, then class list, same spiel, class list, remove and what class I would like to remove active class. That's all I would want to do. And then which I would want to display, which content I would want to display. Well, the one that has the matching ID, how I can get it. Well, I can use document get element by ID, correct? So I'm going to set up some kind of variable and I'll name this element. Then I'll use a document get element by ID. And what value am I passing in? Well, this one, because remember that return either goals, vision or history. So pass here the ID. Awesome. I have access to my element. And what do I need to do? The same like I had for the button. Just add a class of active. So I have my element class list add and I'm looking for my active class. Let's save it. And now you'll see that the moment you click on, you'll target the vision, of course, and you'll display the vision. You'll click on the goals. Of course, you'll target goals. So this is a awesome project where we can practice on event target. So not the current target, but the event target and what event target gets back is whatever you clicked on. And uh, it's just using the fact that we have this event bubbling where if we set up event listener on a parent, even as we're going to be clicking on a children, the actual event will bubble up and we'll be able to access the item that we clicked on using event target. If you want to check it out on a bigger screen, be my guest. And I'm noticing right away that I have a missing class. So for some reason in this project in the index HTML, I decided to skip few classes that a reason why you don't have any padding there on the top, because we should have here a section class. And then I'm looking for the section class. So once I add it, you'll see that we will have our padding on the top. Back to the JavaScript. If I have history, of course, I'm displaying history, vision or goals. And I can click all day long. And then as long as you have the data set that is matching the ID, every time you'll click on a button, you'll display the matching content. Hopefully you guys enjoy the project and I hope to see you in the next project. Awesome. And our next project is countdown timer.
again, we imagine some kind of giveaway, whether that is an old iPhone or subscriber or whatever you would like. And then, of course, we have some kind of date. So that is going to be date when the deal ends. And we'll set up a countdown timer, which counts correctly. What is the remaining time? And then we will start with our index HTML. We navigate to our setup folder. I'll close the sidebar for the time being, and we'll start by placing in the section. We don't want the heading one. We want a section with a class of section and then center class. Now within a section, I'll place my image first. So let me have my image comments. Then we'll have the article. And then for the article, we right away will add a class of gift and then hyphen IMG. Within the article, we'll place our image and the actual path is gift. As far as the alternative, I don't know, say gift, gift picture, picture. And once we save it, of course, we'll see our image. And then, of course, we'll have another article where we'll have all the info. This is where we'll have the heading. We'll have our actual time, some kind of a random paragraph and the container for our countdown timer. And we'll place it right after the first article. We'll have the info comment, info comment. And in here again, the article. Now the class will be a little bit different. We have a class of gift and then hyphen info. And then within this article, we'll start by setting up heading three and whatever text you would want. In my case, it's going to be old iPhone giveaway. And then right after the heading three, I'm going to place a heading four with a class of giveaway. So this is eventually where we will set up our deadline. But for the time being, we'll just hard code. that. Now I do want to add the class because we'll target in the JavaScript. So giveaway. And then as far as the values, I'll say giveaway and on and then again, whatever date you'd want, because eventually it will be set up dynamically from JavaScript. For the time being, we're just hard coding. So I'm just going to be spitballing here. 24 April and then 2020. And then I don't know, 8 a.m. So 8 colon 00 and then a.m. Okay, good. Then we'll have some kind of paragraph again with some kind of a random text. So lower um, 20. Okay, beautiful. This should be our text or you know what? I think it's going to look better if I'm going to go with 30. I think a little bit more text looks a little bit nicer. And after that, we'll set up our deadline. So right after the paragraph, we'll have a div with a class of deadline. And then within this div, we'll have days, we'll have hours, minutes and seconds. And all of them are going to be divs on its own. And then within the div, there's going to be some more info. So for all of them, we'll have to do a little bit of work. And within a deadline, I'll start with days. So let's add here a comment of days, then div. And for the div, we don't need any kind of class. So I'm just going to have a div. But within a div, I'm going to have a heading four with a class of days. And these classes will change. So for hours, we'll have hours, minutes, and seconds. And again, we'll start by hard coding, for example, 34. And then right after the heading four, I'm going to go with days span. So text, technically, you can write wherever you'd want. Just make sure that you have the same classes over here. Now, let me see where my div ends. And I'm going to add here comment and of item, for example, because the rest of the values will change. And I'm going to copy and paste. And instead of days, this will be hours. And you know what? I'm missing something. And what I'm missing is one more div over here. I apologize. We have deadline and then format. So I'll take my div with my heading four and span in place within the div. So that would be the difference. So let me delete what I just copied and paste. So we have a div with a class of deadline format. And then within that div, we have another div with a heading four and the span. 
So now let me select it and we'll copy and paste and we'll change it to hours, minutes and seconds. So one, two, three. So three copies. And here, like I said, we'll change these values around. It's not going to be days. The second one will be hours. So let's change that. Then we have minutes and for the minutes. I'm just going to write a short way. So mins like so. And of course, we also need to change these values around. So hours means and last one is the seconds. So I'll select my comment, the class and the text value. And we'll write here seconds. Now, once we are done, of course, now we can start setting up our JavaScript. And with our HTML out of the way, of course, we can bravely navigate to app JS. In there, you'll find two arrays, one for months and the second one for the weekdays. At the moment, we don't care about them. So of course, I'll just collapse them. But the moment we'll need them, of course, I'll explain why we have them in there and what is going to be the use case. And we'll start by selecting three things. I'm looking for the deadline. So div with the class of deadline. Then I would also want to get the giveaway where I have the heading four because of course, we'll place this dynamically. We will not hard code our date. And then also I'd want to get all the heading fours. And the heading fours I'm talking about are the hours, minutes, and then days and seconds. So let's start by selecting all three things. So const, I guess I'll give the same variable name. So give away, and that will be equal to document, then query selector. And then I'm looking for my class of giveaway, giveaway. And also I would want to select my deadline. So const deadline and that is equal to document again query selector we're looking for deadline and then last i would want to select my heading force now of course we have multiple options of how we can do that for example you could select them one by one correct i could say well get me an hours get me the days get me the minutes get me the seconds yeah definitely you can do that you can also maybe add here a class for example i don't know item and then add the same class to all of them and then just select that item. But just to show you how powerful is the query selector, I could also do it something like that where I have const. Then I'll name this items because I'm just lazy to come up with some kind of meaningful name. So document then query selector. And then in here, I'll write a deadline deadline hyphen format. Now, what is that? That is, of course, the div, the parent div. And then I can just say, you know what, grab me the heading four that is within that div and result will be exactly the same. If you'll console log items, you'll see in a console that the result will be exactly the same where we'll have a node list, of course, of the items. Now, I didn't use all. That's why I have this issue. My apologies. I should have used node list. I'm sorry, the query selector of all. And that's, of course, when I get my node list. So now I have my heading force again. Could we have added here a class? Of course, we could add, for example, item class to all of them, and we could have selected that item class again using query selector. All could we have, I don't know, used a query selector for each and every item, for example, days, hours, and minutes? Yes, but the reason why I'm showing you that is because I would want you to know that query selector is very powerful. We can write whatever CSS selector we would want over here. And also later, I'm just going to show you a shortcut where we will loop over these items and then add these values. So instead of selecting them one by one and then adding the values one by one, I'm just going to loop over my node list and then using the index, I'll just add my values. And the values that I'm talking about are, of course, the days, hours, means and seconds. And of course, we haven't calculated these values yet, but don't worry, we will get there in a second. And once we have all our three selections, now I'd want to start working on a date. So I would want to show dynamically using JavaScript when my giveaway will end. And I'll start by setting up new date. Now, of course, if you would want to just get a current date, it is somewhat simple where we need to come up with some kind of variable future date, and that will be equal to a new date. And you'll see that once we console log it, our future date, future date in a console, we will see 
a current date. So this is just going to give me a string of current date. Now, of course, it is a far cry of what I'm looking for, because I would want to show what is the weekday, what is the actual date and all that. So how we would fix that? Well, we would need to start by actually adding the values in the date. So if we would want to have a current date, then we just type new and then date. But if I would want to have some kind of specific date, then I would just need to add these values in the date. Now, the way it will work is for the time being, I'll just console or I'm sorry, comment out the future date. And then if you would want to have some kind of specific date, you just need to add them as values. And you'd start with a year. So I'm going to write here 2020. Then you're looking for a month. Now, one gotcha with the month, though, is that it is zero index based. Now, what does that mean? Well, for example, we know that May would be written as fifth month, correct? But since the arrays are zero index based, in fact, you'll have a value of four. So if I would want to display May of 22nd or something like that, then the value for the month is going to be four, not five, because again, the array is zero index based. So we're going to go here with four. So now I'm looking for the May. Then what date I would want? I don't know. I'm going to go with 24. And then we go with hours. So as you can see here in the suggestion, we have right away, we have the year, then we have the month, then we have the date, then we have hours, minutes, seconds, and also we have option for milliseconds. So I'm going to keep on going. I have my date, and then I'm looking for the hour. Now, as far as the hour, the values are from zero to 24. So for example, if you would want five o'clock in the afternoon, you'd write 17. And that's how you'd write that in this date function. And then, like I said, I'm looking for some kind of value for the hours value. I'm going to go with 11 and then 30 for my minutes. And as far as the seconds, I'm just going to go with zero. So I'll set it up like this. And you'll see that once we console log the future date, of course, this is going to be Sunday, May 24th, 2020. And then we have the actual time, 1130. So like I said, if I'm going to go here with 17, then this is going to be a five o'clock in the afternoon. So that's something you need to remember that when we talk about months, they are zero in next base. So instead of normal month, like you would have, for example, for May to be five, it is going to be four. And then as far as the actual clock it is zero to 24. So five o'clock in the afternoon is going to be 17 or nine o'clock in the actual evening is going to be 21. So those are the gotchas that you would need to remember. And now, of course, we would need to start extracting these values because eventually I would want to set up some kind of logic where I'll place them within my heading four. I will start with the simple ones. I'll start with year, hours, and minutes, because months and the actual days, the weekdays, are a little bit tricky. So I cannot just grab this value, correct, and just place it in the heading four. That wouldn't work. So I would need to extract them one by one. And like I said, I'll start with the simplest ones. And those are going to be years, hours, and minutes. So I just go const, then year, and then future date, and get full year. Now I'm not going to right away type it in a console, I might as well right away, set up my functionality, where I'm updating that in the HTML. And the actual value that I'm looking for is this guy is the giveaway, I already have selected it. So I'm just going to say giveaway, then text content. Remember, that was the property that controlled text content. I'll set it equal to a template string, I'm going to write giveaway and then ends on. And then there's going to be multiple selections. But like I said, we'll start with a simplest ones. And I'll start with a year, because that's the one that I just selected. And you'll see that once I run it, I should see in heading four, giveaway ends on 2020. Awesome. So this was easy. If I wanted to access the full year, the only thing I needed to run was get full year. So this is going to return from that date a get full year. Now that date could be a current date, or that could be our future date. That doesn't really matter. As long as you run get full year, you'll get the actual year. Now we also covered that when we were working with our scroll project, remember, 
when we placed it in the span. So that way, of course, you'll always get the current year. In this case, of course, I'm getting the future date. Now, since I would want to keep you up to date, I'm still going to use my console log. And I apologize that I keep on removing and then adding. For some reason, I thought I would need it, but actually, I think it will serve us well. So I have our year awesome. And then, like I said, we're looking for two more easy things because months and the weekdays are a little bit harder. And two more easy things are hours and minutes. So I can go here, hours, again, some kind of variable, whatever you would want, future date. And then the function you're looking for is get hours. We invoke it. And of course, I would want to place it right after my year. So of course, the one that I'm looking for is this one. This is the format that I would want. Giveaway wins on Monday, then 4th May 2020, and then whatever is my actual time. So in my case, it was 1130. So that's why I would want to look for minutes right now. So hours, sorry, I already went ahead with minutes where I'm still looking for my hours, then I'll have my colon. And then of course, I'll add my minutes. And minutes are also going to be easy where instead of hours, we'll write minutes. And then the function that we're looking for is you guessed it, get minutes, not milliseconds, get minutes. And then of course, once I have my minutes, I can add it here as a variable minutes here, and then we'll add AM. So once I save it, check it out. Of course, now I have my five o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm writing this as AM. So of course, I would need to set this back to 1130. And that should do it. Now I have the year, the hours and minutes. So those were the easy ones. So what are the hard ones? Well, those would be months, because again, you would get some kind of value instead of the value of May, even though in a string, we saw May, there's no way for us to access it. What we'll access is this array of months. Now, what we will access actually is going to be numbers from zero to 11. So let me show you. I'll go with let month because I'll change this around. So let month and that will be equal to future date. And I don't know why I added here a dot. So we'll have a get month. And once we run it, notice we will get a value from zero to 11. In this case, we're getting four. So like I said, since arrays are zero index based in array, we're getting zero to 11 array. And then since May, of course, is the fifth value. That's why the index is four. So this is where the array of months come into play, where you would need to set up this month's array. And you can either write it as full name, the January, or for example, you can also write here, Jan, it's up to you. But you need this type of array where you can access that value. So for example, if I'm getting here four, then of course, I would access here May. Now, if my month would be different, then of course, the actual value from my array also would be different. So let's test it out. I'm going to go with my months array, months array. And then I'm looking for the actual month. So let me get my value month. And you'll see that of course, I have the May. Okay, so again, we cannot access this May from JavaScript, we're accessing this number. And that number represents the month. Again, the gotcha is that it is not exactly like we would normally think of months, where May would be fifth one. In fact, it is zero index base. So that's why we're getting this value for now, if I'll change this around, and if I'm going to say 11, you'll see that it's going to be December. Why? Because that is, of course, the last month. So that should do it as far as the months. Now, how we'll set this up? Well, very easy. We're just going to say that month is equal to months month. Again, we can write it however we would want. But since I already used let purposely, just to show you multiple ways, I'm going to go with months. And then I'm looking for the month. Now I'll save it. And I would want to place it before my year, of course. So where I have the year, another variable. And then in here, I'll have month. And I'll say that, of course, I have June, I have June 2020. Because June is the sixth month. And in the array, that is a index of four. So if I'll go back to four, then of course, I'll have May. If I'll go back to April, 
course, I'm going to use the value of three. Beautiful. Once I have this particular setup, then I would want to work with a days because I would want to display whether that is a Friday or Monday or Sunday. So how do we do that? Again, with days, we would need to use get and then day. So that's going to be interesting one where if you would want to have get date, then of course, we'll see the actual date. So maybe let's start with this one. I'm going to write const date is equal to future get date like so we will invoke that. And then if I would want to display that, I want to do it before the month. So let me write date. And that of course, will give me the date. Now, in this case, it does complain that future because I should have used date. My apologies. Now, of course, I'm using the 24th. Why? Because that is my current date that I'm looking for. If I'm going to have here 26, then of course, I'll have 26. If I'll have 28, then of course, I'll have 28. And I'm going to go back to, I don't know, maybe 25. We'll save it. And then, of course, this is going to be the value. So date is still one of those easy ones where we just need to get a date. Now, again, in my case, I'm setting this date manually in here when I'm setting up new date. Normally, probably you would just have a new date, which is the current date. And then you would just access this value of getting the date. And last one is our weekday. So how we can get that one? Well, we would need to get get day. And again, this is going to be a value zero to six because the weekdays are seven of them. And then, as you can see, they are, of course, zero index based. So, for example, Sunday is going to be zero, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So, right after the date, if I go with get day, so let me write this as const weekday is equal to a future date get day so not date that was the easy one that just gave you a date but if you look for a day you'll see in the console that we'll have a response of week day and like i said this is just going to give you a value from zero to six because there's seven weekdays so of course it is zero index based so that should mean that it is a saturday Awesome. And of course, again, I can use my array that I already set up, where if I would want to access that value, of course, I just need to say weekdays, and then whatever index I have. And in this case, I'm not going to override that like I did with a month. Of course, I can just simply say weekdays, and then access that value. So in here, I'll have my square brackets. And then within the square brackets, I'll just place future date, and then get day. Of course, that will return me the value, whether that's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I use my array, my weekdays array, to access that particular day. And then once I have the value right before the date, I'll have my weekday. So week day. And then we'll add here a comma. And of course, there it is. Now we have the future date. Now, like I said, you're not limited to accessing these values only when you're setting up some kind of specific date. If you'd want to see that for the current date, just remove these values, save it. And then, of course, you'll see that it is Friday, 24th, April, and 2020. And at the moment, it is 10.07. Now, of course, we would need to fix this value. If we have, let's say, less than 10 minutes, we would probably want to add zero before it. But we'll work on it a little bit later as we're working with these values. So let me go back to my specific date. The one we'll use as our deadline. And I guess I'm going to go with, I don't know, 24th sounds good enough because that is still in the future because currently we have April 24th. So again, just remember when you're setting up new date, you have two options. You either just get a current date and you can get it by just running new date without any kind of values in the arguments or you have multiple ways how we can add arguments and this is one of them where you can just go one by one you'll start with year you'll start with a month just remember that it is zero index based then you have actual date then you have hours then you have minutes seconds and milliseconds and then you'll get this value back you'll get this awesome string and then in order to access specific things you need to start running the functions 
40 year hours and minutes. It is as straightforward as it gets. You just have whatever variable name, then get full year, get hours, get minutes. You grab those values, but then for a month, you'll get a number from zero to 11. And you would need to, of course, set up some kind of array with months if you would want to actually display some kind of text value. And then the same works for the days where you get a zero to six. And then you just need to choose which day it actually is. Now, date technically is still a simple one where you just have a variable again and get date. So this is going to spit back what is the actual date. So those are the basics of working with a date object in JavaScript. Awesome. Once we can display when is going to be the end of our giveaway. Next, of course, I would want to set up my countdown timer where I'll correctly show how many days are left, hours, minutes, and seconds. And I'll start by getting rid of this console log of future date. And the way it will work, we'll have to use milliseconds. So what happens if you get this future date, you also have an option of using milliseconds. So get milliseconds for our future date, and then we'll get milliseconds of our current date, and then we'll have to subtract them. Now that is going to give us a value that difference in between dates, and then we'll have to calculate how many days are there, hours, minutes, and seconds. And since I'm a big fan of console logs, right after setting up our text content for the giveaway, we'll have some kind of comment here, and I'll say future time in milliseconds and we'll have a const future time that is of course my variable name and it will be equal to my future date so whatever variable i have over here and then the function you're looking for is get time now once you invoke it you'll see that you'll have a large number in a console now don't worry we'll discuss them we'll discuss how we get this large awesome number. But what we need to know that we'll need two of these values. We'll need one for the future date and then one for the current date. And then we will subtract them. That's the way how we can find this difference. Because of course, this is going to be in the future. And this is just going to show how many days we have left, hours and minutes. And in order to set up that functionality, I would want to create a function. So I'm going to write here function. And then the actual function name will be get remaining, remaining time. And then I'll invoke the function, or I'm sorry, I'll actually set up my function body and I'll invoke the function right after that. So let's say get remaining time. And then within the function body, I would need to get the current date and also get time. So get the current date in milliseconds. How it will work, I'm going to go with some kind of variable. Today, for example, I'll type here new date. I will invoke it and I'll right away call my get time function. And again, in the console, we'll see that today also has some kind of value in these milliseconds. So right here today, and of course, in the console, we'll see another value. Now, of course, our first value, the future time will be bigger. That's the whole setup for the functionality, because, of course, once the current time is bigger than our future one, well, then there's really no countdown because we already passed our future date. And like I said, the way the functionality will work, we'll take our future time and then subtract these values, because as you can see right now, we're not dealing with May 5th or whatever. We're just dealing with numbers. So we can subtract these values because the first one is bigger one than the second one. And then we'll have some kind of difference. And then we'll just have to calculate, well, how many days we have in that difference and all of that. So I guess we can just remove both of these things, the console logs, and let's set up our math operation where I'm going to have some kind of variable. Now I will just set it up as T because I need to use it in quite a few places. And I just think it, just speeds up our typing. So it's just going to be T and that will be equal to a future time minus the today. So minus today. And once we set that up again in a console, we'll have a value. Now, of course, this value will be smaller than the other ones because this is our difference. And now we need to talk about these milliseconds. So why we have these large numbers. 
you see in one second we have thousand milliseconds so one second is equal to thousand milliseconds then we already know that one minute is equal to a 60 seconds correct now what is one hour equal to that is equal to 60 minutes so we'll have here 60 minutes 60 minutes over here and then what is one day that is 24 hours correct so again another comment one day is equal to 24 hours i'm sorry not two hours 24 hours and the whole point here is that this value is in these milliseconds so we would need to set up some kind of functionality where one by one we get actual values so how many days are in this large number of milliseconds how many hours how many minutes and how many seconds and the only thing again we need to remember that one millisecond has thousand milliseconds and then within one minute we have 60 seconds within one hour we have 60 minutes and within one day we have 24 hours so we'll start by actually calculating how many milliseconds are in one day because that's what i'm interested in. if i'll know that value of how many milliseconds are in one day then of course i can just divide it correct so this is going to be my total value some kind of large value in milliseconds so once i divide that by how many milliseconds i have in a day that is going to give me the value of how many days are in there correct so in here why don't we add a comment and i'm going to say values in milliseconds and we'll start with the days so one day how many milliseconds it has so one day and that should be equal to 24 because day has 24 hours now how many minutes does one hour have 60 correct so we would need to multiply this by 60. okay good now we also would need to multiply this by another 60. why because one minute has the 60 seconds correct so go here with 60 because remember we always always looking for this milliseconds value and then once i have multiplied 24 by 60 and then by 60 because one minute has 60 seconds then i would want to multiply this by 1000 why because one second has thousand milliseconds now this is going to give me a value of how many milliseconds are in one day so once i console log it of course this is going to be my value so this is going to be the value of how many milliseconds are in one day and this is not going to change so as you see right now our actual t is changing all the time if you'll console log it notice how it's going to actually get smaller why because of course the current time is catching up to a future date but this one will always stay the same why because regardless of the day one day we'll have 24 hours one hour will have 60 minutes one minute will have 60 seconds and then one second will have 1000 milliseconds so these things won't change and in the same way i would want to set up of course the milliseconds in one hour and then also in one minute because we will use these values so we might as well set them up so one hour is equal to 60 minutes multiplied by 60 because one minute has 60 seconds and then we'll multiply this by a thousand now this is going to give me a value of how many milliseconds are in the hour and if i want to check how many milliseconds are in one minute i'm just going to go with one minute is equal to 60 that is of course my minutes and multiply by a thousand so i'm going to go here a thousand because one second has a thousand milliseconds let's save it beautiful and now we can start finally calculating well how many days hours minutes and seconds we'll have and we'll start with our days so days so some kind of variable and that will be equal to t so that of course is my difference so what is the difference between the current time and the future time and we'll divide that by one day again remember this value is in milliseconds that's why i want my milliseconds value I don't want to divide it by 24 hours since this value is in milliseconds i also would want to actually divide it by the mini seconds value and you'll see that if we console log days that we'll have a number so one day 
Okay, that makes sense because I'm looking for April 25th. And actually, I have April 24 currently. And then I have one point something something. Now, I don't care about this something something because these are hours, minutes and seconds that we'll calculate later. What I care about is only the actual round value. And which one is that? And that is, of course, this guy. Now, just to showcase that our functionality works, if I'll change this to 26, you'll see that, of course, right now I have two days. So two point something something days. Now, what I'm looking for is this only two value, because I don't care about this point something something, because those are the hours, minutes, and seconds that we will calculate later. So what I can do is I can just use days and reassign it to math, floor, and then I'll pass in my days. So this, of course, will give me this integer, the two, not the value that is coming after the comma. We'll save it. Okay, I have my days. And of course, once I have the value for the days, now I'd want to calculate the same thing for my hours. However, there's going to be a gotcha. And let's start working on that. And of course, you'll see what I'm talking about. So I'm going to set up hours. So let hours is equal to a T. And then we'll have divided by one hour, correct? Because that's the value we should be looking for. However, we'll see something interesting where once I console log the hours is going to be 48 point something. Now, why is that happening? Because of course, the date that I have is sometime in the future. So in my case, that is going to be April 26th. And that's why I have this big value. But now let's think about it. If we are already displaying days, do you think it makes sense that we are having all these hours, the 48 hours, or we would want to display two days because that would be two full days in 48 hours and then whatever hours are left. So I would want to get this remainder and then divide that remainder with that one hour instead of dividing the whole value. And the way we can get a remainder in JavaScript is following where I have console log and then I'm just going to place here a different code. So I'm going to say eight modulus three. Now, what will happen here is we'll get the remainder. So check how many full values we can place in eight. That will be two. So we can place one, three, and then the second three. And then whatever is left over, that's the value we'll have. And of course, you can check it out. If, for example, you have nine and I don't know, two. So if I multiply four by two, I'm going to get eight. And that, of course, just leaves a one as a remainder. So that's how we can get a remainder and JavaScript. Why do we care about it? Because we'll use our T modulus one day. So that is going to give me the leftover after I have checked how many full days are in there. So instead of one hour, instead of dividing by one hour, I will set this up as modulus T because I wouldn't want to get all the hours that I have in my difference. I would want to get only the ones that are left over. So T modulus and then one day. So get me the value that is left over and then divide that by one hour. And of course, if I'll just console log, I'll see that my hours is this value. So something like 0 0.8 something something. Now what that tells me though, is that there's not too many hours in there, at least currently, because I still have two full days. But what I would want to do is use the math floor, because I would want to even round it down more. Now, just to show the actual situation where we would use that, why don't we increase this number to maybe 15? And then, of course, in here, I'll just remove that AM because that's not going to work. So now, as you can see, I have four full hours, correct? So I have some kind of day value that is left over. So I have two full days and then four hours. So this is left after we used T, then modules one day. So this is where we check how many full days we have in there, and then we divide the remainder by one hour. However, again, I don't want this actual value after the dot. So you do the same thing where we have math, floor, and then we will pass in the, our math operation. So let me run this one. And now, of course, I'll have four. And the same thing I would want to do for the minutes and for the seconds. Now, the only difference is going to be what I'm passing as a values, 
because for the seconds, I would want to check how many hours are full there. And then for the seconds, I would want to have the minutes. Okay, so let's go here with minutes. And that will be right away equal to math floor. Then I have T and let me set up another parentheses. So T modulus, and then I'm looking for the hours. So again, I want to check how many full hours are in there. And then only what is left, then I would want to use that one hour, or I'm sorry, the one minute. And I can get that one minute by dividing of one minute. And you're probably thinking, okay, in this case, I didn't care about the full hours. So why am I passing in here the full hour? And you know what? Sorry, not hours, one hour. So one hour. Why am I passing this one hour? Because it's just much easier. Because in this case, I don't care if this gets me back 48. I really don't. What I'm looking for is this remainder. So I just say, whatever the time difference, modulus the one hour. So see how many minutes are left. Okay, the same how we had here with days. I said, in order to get the hours, just get me the days first. And then whatever is left, I'll just divide that by one hour. And of course, we would need to do the same thing with a seconds. However, we'll have to change these values. So seconds here, then instead of one hour, we're looking for one minute. And then we're dividing this by 1000. Why? Because one second has 1000 milliseconds. So this is, of course, going to give us the values for the days, hours, minutes and seconds. And now we can either place them directly where we have it over here, or we can do a little bit of formatting. And I'll start by setting up actually my array. So let me set up set values array. And then since I was using the setup, where I was actually selecting them with a query selector all in my value in my arrays value, I will just place days, hours, minutes and seconds. So I'm going to go here with const, then values, and that is equal to days. So my first value, then hours, then minutes, and then seconds. So whatever I got back, I'm just placing in this array. And I would want to iterate over my items. So of course, items are right here on the top, and then use the index and just place these values inside here. So the way it will look like, we'll have items for each items for each. Now that is a function, of course, that we can pass in as a callback function. And then within a function, I am looking for two things. I'm looking for the item, but optionally, I can also access the index, correct? So that is going to give me the index of the item in my array. And in here, I can just say item, since I can access each and every item days, hours, minutes and seconds. And then I'll say inner HTML is equal to a values, and then index. So here's what I'm doing. I'm iterating over my items. And I know that the first one will be days, hours, minutes and seconds. And the same setup I have here in this array. Again, could you have selected them one by one, and then actually assign them to these values? Yes, of course. But in my case, I just wanted to speed it up. So I selected all of them. I showed you how you can nicely work with query selector. And now I'm just iterating over that array, and then using inner HTML, and then I'm just grabbing. So since the days will have the same index as days in my values array, I can just say values, and then index, then the hours will be same, minutes will be same, and seconds will be same. So of course, once we save it, you'll notice that I'll have two days, four hours, 42 minutes, and then 49 seconds. Now, of course, the moment I'll refresh, notice how the seconds are going down. We're going to refresh, and now we have 36. Now, there's one thing that I would want to add. If the values are less than 10, I would want to add these zeros in front of it. And the way I'll set that up is by coming up with a function. And I'll name this format. And I'll pass in the parameter of item. And we'll have just a simple if statement. So if item value is less than 10, then I would want to return item and set it equal to template string, add in a zero, and then whatever value I have for my item. That is, of course, if the value is less than 10. 
if the value is bigger than 10, then just return my item. And instead of passing in values and then index, we'll first pass our format function. And then within a format function, I'll pass this values of index. So of course, we'll get the same days, hours, minutes, and seconds. We'll just run it through this function. And once we run it through the function, if the value will be less than zero, or I'm sorry, less than 10, then we'll add this zero. We'll save it. And you'll see that I have 0 0.2 days, 0 0.4 hours. And as you can see, the seconds again, will be all the time going down. Okay. Now, of course, it is annoying for us to refresh. And we would want to set up some kind of functionality where this is all the time changing. And we can do that by setting up the interval. Now, one thing that I would want to do right away is assign it to a variable, because a little bit later, we'll add here functionality in our get remaining time function, where if, of course, the time expires, I would want to have some kind of different value here. So above the get remaining time, I'm going to have the countdown. So count down, and that will be equal to a variable. So let countdown, and that is equal to my set interval. And remember, set interval needed two things. It needed the callback function. And also we needed to say, well, how often we'll call this function. So first we'll start with our get remaining time. That is, of course, the function we would want to call. And the second one is how often I would want to call it. And I would want to call it every second. That's why I'll write over here 1000, which is, of course, one second. So those are my milliseconds in one second. And since I would want to call it every second, that's why I'll right here, this 1000. And as you can see right now, on the screen, we're displaying how many seconds are left. Now we have in a console, this console log that I would want to remove. So I don't want to show that T. Let's save it. And then of course, our functionality still works. So as you can see, we are having our countdown, where for example, if we change these values around, and if I'll say here, I don't know, maybe April 24th, and let's save it. Now you'll see that I have only four hours left. So four hours, 36 minutes, and then 40 whatever seconds. And of course, these seconds are going down. Now, as you can see, days are already zero, zero. Why? Because this is the same exact date that I have right now. So since I said future date equal to my current date, that's why I have only four hours left. So if I'm going to go over here and say, for example, 1130, course, what you'll see that I have only 36 minutes left. And if I'll just say that my deadline will be 1030, then of course, I'll have these errors. Why I have the errors? Because already we passed our deadline. So how do we fix that? You see what happens when we have our set interval, we're getting back a value. And we have another function. And that is clearing the interval. And that way it's important that we invoke our get remaining time after set interval, because I want to have an access to my countdown. Okay, so within get remaining time all the way in the bottom, I'm going to say if t, if t is less than zero. So when t is going to be less than zero, when the current time is bigger than our future time, correct? This is our case right now. And now I'll say clear interval again, that is the function that we have access from JavaScript. And then we'll just pass in our countdown variable. Again, it is important that you invoke your get remaining time after you have set up your countdown. Okay, otherwise, you'll have no access to this variable. So we clear the interval. And now, of course, I'm looking for my deadline. So that is one of the things that I selected all the way in the beginning. That was my deadline, the actual article with a class of deadline. And then in here, I'll say inner HTML and then set it to some kind of template string. And I'll have some kind of heading four, maybe. So heading four, I'll add here a class of expired class, and then expired. And I'll close out my heading four. So let's close it out. And then as far as the value we will write, sorry, this giveaway, this giveaway, uh, has expired, has expired. 
let's save it. And then, of course, now I'll have sorry, this giveaway has expired. Why? Because my T is less than zero because my current time is bigger than my future one because I was looking for 1030 and I can see that I have 1056. So again, my future time should be in the future. Now, let me head on up and fix that. So I'll have here 26 and then 1130. Something like that. Let's save it. And now, of course, I can see that I have two days. I have zero hours, but don't worry, this will change. Of course, once you have one day, then you'll start having some kind of hours value as well. And then 32 minutes and 50 and then whatever counting down seconds. So that is how we can set our countdown. Again, the biggest deal probably is this one where you would need to count how many milliseconds you have in one day, one hour, one minute. And then you need to use this modulus operator where you're just counting, well, how many hours are left? How many minutes are left? How many seconds are left? Okay. So that's why you use modules. You say, okay, what is my remainder? And only then you divide that remainder. And then the same goes for seconds and the minutes. And then in here, I just set it up as an array. Because since I selected multiple items, I just iterated over my items that are coming from HTML. And then I use the index. And since I knew that the values have the same index for the days, hours, minutes, and seconds. So the indexes are the same for these values as my node list. Then I just said, you know what, grab the index and then just add it into item. And then since I wanted to format it, I just added this zero. And then all the way in the bottom, we invoked our set interval. And then of course we pass in our get remaining time. And then we are running it every second. Now, since eventually the deal will expire, that's why also within get remaining time, I clear that interval once the value is less than zero. So once that is true, then of course we just add this heading four that says, well, sorry, that time has expired. And if you'd want to see that in action, let me see what is the actual time. So 24th, then 58. So I'll we'll have here 24. And then I'm looking for, I believe, what is what? 1058. So let's do it here 10. And then 58. And we'll see whether it has, okay, it has already expired. So why don't we do 59? Okay, that one has also has expired. All right, so why don't we do 11? 11 and then zero. Let's see. And now I can see that I have 40 seconds left. So now you'll see in action how the actual counter expires, or more precisely, probably how the countdown expires because the value for the future time will be less than we have actually today for the current time. And once that is true, then instead of displaying the counter, which wouldn't make sense, we're just going to have a heading four with sorry, but the actual deal has expired. So let me keep on scrolling down and I'll see, of course, that eventually I'll have this heading four with this value. So once that is the case, of course, right now I am sorry, this giveaway has expired. Now, I know this was already a big project, but the one last thing that I would want to add is this functionality where each and every time we'll start the application, we will check for the current time and we'll just add 10 days to that. So once we add these 10 days, that's why always the counter will work. So even though we do have the functionality where once the time expires, then of course we showcase the heading four with our text. Of course, since we would want to show that application works, that our counter works, we would always want to have some kind of time in the future. And the way we do that, we'll first navigate back to my setup to the app.js. And I will add here again, this AM in my text. Okay, good. And then I also will have to change my future date. Because as you can see right now, I'm just hard coding this value. So I would need to have some kind of setup where this will always check the current date and then add these 10 days. And the way we can do that is by setting up another variable. So let temp date is equal to a new date. And then let me get the year. Let me get a month. And let me also get the date. So here I will let let 
temp here is equal to a temp date. And we're, of course, looking for get and then full year. So let's invoke this function. Then another one will be temp month. So let temp month is equal to temp date get month. Let's get that. Okay, let's invoke it also. And lastly, we are looking for this day. So let temp day that is equal to a temp date and then get date. Now, as far as the month, I don't care if it's a number value because we'll pass it over here. Okay, so we will not actually need this array. We'll right away add this into our setup when we're setting up a new date. Now I'll comment this out just so you can have it for your reference. But now I will set up that date in the future, always 10 days from whatever the application starts. So in here, I'll have again the future date. So I don't want to change this value. I still would want to call this future date because of course, I'm already accessing in multiple places. And then I'm just going to say new date. And then I'll grab my temp year. So let me start with a year. Then I'll have my temp month, temp month. And as far as temp date, since I would want to set up 10 days from now, I'm just going to go with temp day plus 10, like so. And don't worry, JavaScript will automatically calculate. So for example, if it's end of the month, it will add necessary days and it will display the next month. And then as far as the time, I'm going to go back to 11, 30, and then zero. Okay, let's save it. And now you'll see that I'm still setting up time in the future. However, I'm grabbing these values. I'm checking, okay, what is the current year right now? Okay, it is, I don't know, 2020 or it is 2022. Okay, good. So set up future date also in that year. Okay, check what is the current month. So that way I'll always check what is the current year and then add these 10 days. So that's why how my counter will always work because each and every time someone will open up the application, I'll check what is the current date and then just add these 10 days to that. And that's how we can set up our application. Of course, we can check it out on a bigger screen and we can see that our counter is working. Now, I know that this was a big project. I understand that. But unfortunately, that's how it is when you work with dates. Hopefully, everyone enjoyed the project and I hope to see you in the next project. Excellent. And up next, we have a Lorem Ipsum project. Now, if you're not familiar with Lorem Ipsum, that is a dummy text that we can display if, for example, we don't have the content. And as far as the inspiration for the project, that would be hipster Ipsum, where instead of just getting the Latin text, we can get a nice hipster text. And if you'd want to navigate to the project, to the hipster Ipsum project, then of course, just go to hipsum.co. So for example, in here, we can go and decide how many paragraphs we would want. I think I'm going to go with five, beer me. And you'll notice that I'm getting a lorem text, so a dummy text, but it's just using a bunch of hipster words. So in our project, it's going to be somewhat similar, where we again navigate to our project, and we have a heading of tired of boring lorem ipsum. But then we can pick how many paragraphs we would want. If we don't pick any paragraph, then we'll get some random ones like so. So I can keep on clicking and I'm going to be getting random paragraphs. Or if you want to be more specific, for example, if I would want to have eight paragraphs, I just write eight over here and generate. And then, of course, we'll get eight paragraphs of text. Now, in here, I got some lorem ipsum from other generators as well. So this should be an interesting project where we'll practice of how to work with forms in JavaScript as well as how to get random numbers, something that we have covered before. And also, what is the gotcha when you're working with a number input with HTML and how you can access that value in the JavaScript. As always, we will start with our index HTML. So we'll have to set up our structure first, back to a setup folder. In here, we have the heading one. That's not what we would want. And then, of course, let's set up our structure. I'll start with a section. It will have a class of section center. Within a class, we're going to have a heading three with our text. And in my case, I'll type it out 
tired of boring lorem ipsum and then question mark. After that, we'll have our form. So I'm going to have a form element with a class of lorem form, and it's going to give me an action. Now, I'll not submit it to the server, so I really don't care about the action. And then within the form, I'm going to have a label. Now, the ID that I'll add for my input will be about. That's why I'm typing in the amount. Or I'm sorry, I said about the ID will be amount. So almost the same, but not really. So the ID will be amount. And then as far as the text, I will write paragraphs and then colon. I will set up my input. And it's not going to be a text one. It will be a number one. Because I would want to show you the gotcha that you should be aware of when you're working with inputs and the JavaScript. Now, as far as the name, I'm going to set it equal to amount. Even though we won't submit it to a server, we might as well have the name. ID will be also amount. Amount. And then right after the ID, I'm going to go with placeholder. That will be equal to the five. So we'll just showcase some kind of number value. And then right after our input, I'll set up my submit button. So it will be a button with a type of submit. And as far as the text, I'm just going to write generate. And then we just need to add here a class of button. So class BTN. Now right outside the form, but then still within a section, I would like to place a article with a class of lorem text. And this is where we'll display our text. So for the time being, it's just going to be an empty article, but eventually we will place our content in there. So article, class of lorem text, and we have our HTML. So we have the structure. Again, we can submit form all day long. Nothing is happening. And once we add the JavaScript, then of course, we only have the functionality. As far as the JavaScript, we already know the drill. We need to navigate to app.js. And then you'll see there a array. And then each and every item in the array represents a paragraph. So it is a array of nine items. And each item is just a paragraph. That's why you'll see a giant text, then comma, next giant text, and you get the gist. And like I said, total will have nine paragraphs. So, of course, once we'll set up the logic, then we'll just fetch either one, two, random, or all nine articles or paragraphs from our text array. And we'll start by selecting three things. I would want to select the form, the amount, that is, of course, my input, and then also the result, which is an article that will be used to display our paragraphs. One by one, form, then for the form, I guess I'm going to go with query selector. And then the class is lorem form. Then for the amount, it is an ID. So of course, I can still use the query selector, but we might as well can practice with an ID. So get element by ID, document get element by ID. And the ID value was amount. So I'll just type here amount. And then last, I would want to target my result my article with the class of result and that one will be document then query selector and we're looking for lorem text so that's the class once i have selected all these three things i would want to listen for setup but i'm not going to be listening for a click event i'll be listening for a submit event and that's why we'll add this event to a form so we have our form then we go with add event listener and then like i said the event name is submit. And we'll add here a comma, then our callback function. And again, we'll be looking for our event object. And what you'll notice with the forms is that they have a default behavior, and that is to submit to a server. Now, why that is not something that we're looking for, because of course, all our logic will go bananas. And I'll just showcase that with console log where if I'll type in hello, and if I'll open up my console, you'll see that you won't see that hello. So you'll see it for a split second, and then it's gone. Because the default behavior for the form is to submit it to a server. And we would want to prevent that. 
now, since we already have access to event object, I can simply say E prevent default. So that will prevent the default behavior. Now, of course, once I click on submission, I can clearly see my hello. So that was the first challenge that we needed to tackle. We needed to prevent the default behavior of the farm. Awesome. Next one will be another doozy. And that one will be the value that we're getting back from the input. Because even though our type is number, you'll see something very, very interesting in a console. Now, first, I guess let's decide how we can access the actual value. And since we have targeted already amount, that is ID for my input, for my number input, I could use the value one. And the way it's going to look like is I'm going to have const value. That is my variable. And in here, I'll just type amount and then value. Now, of course, if I don't type anything in, you'll see that there's something in a console, but that something is actually going to be an empty string. And as a side note, at the moment, you won't see anything because I didn't console log it. Now, let's see. As you can see, something is there, but that is just a empty value. But for example, if I'll add some kind of number, and of course, the number is the only thing that I can add because I already have the input with a type of number. But notice something interesting in a console. And that something interesting is the fact that this value is black. Now you might be saying, okay, what's the big deal that it is black? Well, since the color of my number is black, it is actually a string. Now, if you don't believe me, you can just type here type off value. And once you generate that, you'll see that it is a string, even if you add here a number, for example, 20. You generate that and you still get back the string. So even though your initial thought would be that if you have type of number, since you can only enter the number, that the value that you're going to be getting back is going to be number, you'll be wrong because all the inputs return a string. So that's a gotcha that you need to be aware of. Now, how we can fix that? Well, we can use parse integer and we'll just write here parse int. That is our function. Now we don't need to import it. It is right away available. And within the parse int, we will just pass the amount value. And you'll see right now that once I enter, for example, my 10, I'll be able to generate. And now my value is number. And now, of course, if you'll just console log it, the value, you'll see that it is a color of blue. Let me generate, for example, again, 10. And the color is different. Now, I know that you might be saying, okay, what's the big deal with these values, with the color values? Trust me, once in a while, when you'll be debugging something, you might remember the fact that the strings are going to be black. So the color will be black, but then the numbers will have a blue color. So that's just going to save you once in a while debugging where you'll be like, okay, you know what? I'm looking for a number, but I'm actually getting the string. Now, once I have my awesome number value, now what? Well, now I'd want to set up my if statement because we need to understand that we have a couple of options. So what are the options that we can pass in here in the paragraphs? Well, I could pass numbers from one to nine, correct? Those would match my awesome paragraphs. Yeah, that's good. But then also I could pass in an empty value like we just saw. For example, if I console log value, you'll see that that is my empty value. So of course, we would need to check that uh, for some reason I didn't save there. So let me generate one more time. And as you can see right now, I'm getting back not a number. So why is that not a number? Because of course, I'm using my parse int. And that's the value that I'm getting back. So we have an option for empty value. And let me write some comments here. Empty value. We also have an option of adding a number that is less than zero. So that's not what we want. So right here, negative one, that will represent my negative values. Then also I can write more than nine, correct? So more than nine. And again, that's not something that I would want since I have only nine paragraphs. So I'll say bigger than nine. So why don't we set up a if statement where if I have either of these three, then I'll just display one paragraph. Now, eventually we'll set it up as a random paragraph, but We'll start by just displaying the first paragraph. So if this is the case, if the user doesn't enter how many paragraphs or tries to enter less than zero 
or bigger than nine. In all three cases, we'll just say, you know what? Here's one paragraph. So I can just say if, and then I'll set up my or statements. So I'll say is not a number, and that is a function. Now, what happens with this not a number function? It returns either that is true or that is false. And I'll set up my if statement, and then of course, we'll just console log it. And the actual function name is this one is and not a number. And then I just pass in the value. And as you saw it, once I have here a string, then of course, it says not a number. So if I'll have my function is not a number and pass in the value, of course, that will be true. So I'll have another or. And in here, I'll say if the value is less than zero. And the last one, if the value is bigger than nine. So if all these three things are true, or more specifically, if any of these three things are true, then of course, I would want to do something. And that something is just displaying my one paragraph. Again, in a second, we'll set it up as a random one. But for the time being, it's just going to be my first paragraph. Now, how I can access it, I can target my article, the result one. Then I can just go for inner HTML. And this is going to be the case where I'm not going to set up my HTML in the actual index HTML because there's not going to be much to it. I'm just going to have a paragraph. I'll add here a class, a class of result because I have a little bit of CSS. And then I'll also close out my paragraph, of course. And then within the paragraph, like I said, I want to access my first item. So I know that within a template string, if I want to access a variable, I just need to have the dollar sign and then the curly brace. And then I'm looking for text array. And then I'm just looking for the first item. So you'll see that, for example, if the user doesn't pass any kind of value, and by the way, like I promised, I'll console log also is not a number and pass in value. And you'll see that this is true. So that's why I'm saying if this is true, then of course, get the first paragraph. Let's generate. And of course, we have the first paragraph. And this is equal to true. So that would be if the user doesn't enter any value. Now, what if user tries to enter, for example, negative value, same thing. Now, in this case, of course, it's going to say that the is not a number is false, because it is a number. It's not a empty string. However, I do have it in my condition, where I say if the value is equal to a zero, or I'm sorry, less than zero, then of course, display my first paragraph from my text array. And then of course, I can do the same thing for the bigger than nine. So let me move up. Let's for example, say 10. And then again, I will get my first one. All right. Now, why don't we make this a little bit more interesting, where I will set up my random value. Now, since we have done that already quite a few times, I'm just going to go with a random number, we'll use math floor right away. So we actually round it down. And then math random to generate a random number. And then remember, we had the array. And I'll just multiply it by the length of array. And then instead of accessing the first paragraph in my array, I'm just going to say here random. And you'll see that right away that once you generate, notice, now I'm getting some kind of random paragraph, even if I have the empty string, if I have negative, same thing, I'm going to have a random paragraph. And if I have, I don't know, 20, also will have a random paragraph. Okay, now what happens if the user actually enters correct values? from one to nine. Well, we have our else, correct? So we'll go with else. And then in here for the time being, I will set up a temporary array. I'll say let temp text, and I'll use my slice. So when we're using slice, we have the beginning, and then the end. So we'll make a copy of our array. And for example, if we'll start with zero, and then and with the first item, then of course, our new array will just contain that one item. But as always, it is much more easier for me to show you. Now the array that I'm looking for is the text array. And then like I said, we're using slice. And then as you can see in suggestions, we have the start, and then the end. Now what am I going to use as my end, that will be my value. So I'll start with zero. That means that I'll start with my first item. 
and then I'll use my value. Now, what value I'm talking about? This one. So, of course, now I'm saying if the numbers are between one and nine, and if that is the case, then I'll just get a copy of my array. And if you'll console log it, you'll see that depending on what is the value, that is going to be also your new array. So temp text. And for example, if I add here two, you'll see that I'll have array of two items because it starts with zero and then it ends with index of two. So it grabs values with indexes of zero and one. If you'll have three here, then of course it will stop by the index of three. So it will grab one, zero, and two. So zero, one, two. And of course, we can also test it out, for example, with one. And you'll see that we're just generating one item. And with knowing that, of course, now we can set up some kind of functionality where if I'm getting this new array based on whatever value the user enters, I just need to iterate over that array, the temp text array, and then wrap these paragraphs in the actual paragraph tag. So let me delete my temp text. Then I'll set it equal to a new temp text array. So temp text, I'll use my map. So temp text map. So now we're iterating over array. Now we can access, of course, each and every paragraph that we have in our parameter. And I'm just going to call this item because I'm too lazy to write a paragraph. And then I would just want to wrap the paragraph, the string that I have here in the actual paragraph tags. So I'm just going to say here return. And then, of course, I have my template string since I would want to access the variable. I'll have my paragraph. And then I'll add again the class of result. Same thing. And as a side note, probably we could have just copied and pasted. But let's do it this way. Result. Then I'll close out my paragraph. And then for each and every item that I have in the array, I would want to do so. That's why I'll grab that item. And then I'm just going to place it in my paragraph. Now, again, if you'd want, you can console log it and you'll see that your string right now is wrapped in a paragraph, whatever the value is going to be, whether that is going to be one, whether that's going to be five, six or whatever. So let me look for my temp text. And in this case, I'll pass in the value of six, just so you can see that we can have bigger values as well. And of course, now this is my array. And then each and every paragraph, the string is wrapped in the actual paragraph. Now, remember, the only thing we really needed to do was to use the join method. So you get one giant one. So out here, join, I'll have my empty string. So that's how I'm going to avoid those comments that, that I would have in between. And then I already have the result, of course. So result in our HTML is equal to my temp text. That's it. That's all we have to do. Now, before we start testing it out, I would want to add one more thing in my if condition, because as you can see, I'm testing for empty value for negative and for the bigger than zero. However, we might as well add zero. Otherwise, user can enter zero and then we'll display nothing. So we might as well say here that if the value is less or equal to zero, like so in the app.js, we'll add it here. And now, of course, we can start adding our values. For example, I can add here four and I'll have my four paragraphs. If I'll add nine, you can probably already guess that we'll have nine paragraphs. If we have negative one, then we'll generate one. If we'll add zero, same thing, random paragraph. We can try it with 20. Of course, same thing. And if you'd want, we can navigate to a bigger screen. Same setup. Again, if we have item of 20, we're just getting random values. Hopefully everyone enjoyed the project and I'll see you in the next project. Awesome. And up next, we have grocery, bud. Now, before we take a look at the application, let me go over why I included this particular application in our project. So as you can see, it's just a glorified to do list where we can add items, we can edit them, we can delete them, and we can remove all of them from the list. And of course, we'll also use local storage 
So that way, once we refresh the application, the info still stays. Now, why did I add this particular application in our project? Since to do lists are experiencing quite a bit of backlash, and some of it is deserved, and some of it, at least in my opinion, is unnecessary. I view to do lists as a tool, as a tool to learn a language or a framework. Because everyone who bashes to do lists still cannot point to me a better simple application that would allow you to create, read, update, and delete. With that being said, should you include to do lists in your portfolio? No, because they don't showcase the fact that you are an expert in the particular language or a framework, but they are a very useful tool while you're learning. That's why I included in the projects. Now, that is, of course, my opinion. If you have a different opinion and just by looking at to do list, you are very unhappy, then probably you should move along to a next project. But I just gave you my explanation why I find to be useful and why I included in our project. And with that being said, let's take a look at the actual application. So we have the form, we have the input. So if I'll add some kind of item, then of course, I'll add it to my list. Now, if we won't add any kind of value, we'll have a nice alert and it will say, please enter the value. So let's go with eggs. Then we can go with milk, beer, then I don't know, fish. And I think that should do it. And at this point, we have three options. We can either edit the item, we can delete the item, or we can clear the list. So as far as deleting item, we're just removing item from the list. And then since we're using local storage, then once we refresh notice, oh, we still get all the info that we had right now. So each and every time the actual user will come back to the application, it will be saved in local storage. So right away display what items were added to the list. Then if we would want to remove all the items, of course, we can just clear the items. But then what's really cool about this app, we went to great lengths to set up a edit and not only simple edit, but in fact, once you edit the item, it will stay in the same position. And it sounds simpler than it is, but trust me, we'll have to write a little bit of code to get that done. And also once we click on edit, notice how the value changes for my submit. And for example, I'll write this as a second item. And you'll notice once I click on edit, I have value changed. So I did not add the value to the list. I just changed the value. And now where I had my item, I have right now second item. Beautiful. That's going to be our project. And let's start working on it. All right. And since it is our, I believe, 14th project, you're probably not surprised that we need to start working in a setup folder. And we'll start with our HTML. So in the index HTML in the setup folder, we will get rid of our awesome heading one. And we'll start by placing a section with a class of section center. Now within this section, we'll place two things. We'll have a form and a list. So let's start with two comments, form and then a list. As far as the form, we'll have a form. Now we don't need any action. So we'll have here a class instead. And the class is grocery form. And within the form, we'll start by placing the alert. Let's add here a class of alert. And then we're not going to add any kind of text. So that's just going to be an empty paragraph. And then after that, I'm going to have a heading three with grocery. But that is, of course, the name of my application. Then we'll have some kind of form control. Form control here. So there with the class of form control. And in there, I'll place the input with the type of text. ID will be equal to grocery. Now that is important because we'll access that ID. So if you're naming it differently, please just keep the reference of what is the actual name. And I'll have some kind of placeholder with example of the text. So I'll have here eggs. Let's save it. I should have something like that on the screen. And then still within the form control, let's add our submit button as well. So I'm going to go with button, then type, then submit. And I'll just add a class here with submit button. And as far as the text, you can do whatever you would want. But I think I'm going to go with submit. And then again, in order to speed up our JavaScript, I will set up my HTML right now. 
So that way later, once I need to add this dynamically, my item, I can just simply copy and paste my HTML. So I'll have my list beautiful. And the list will consist of grocery container. That is, of course, the div with the class with grocery container and then grocery list. So that is important because there's going to be a clear button as well. So within this container, we'll have two things. We'll have our grocery list and then the clear button. So why don't we add this clear button first? Because that way we will avoid some unnecessary mistakes. So I'm going to have here button. And it's just going to be a simple button with the type of, you guessed it, button. And we'll add here a class of clear, clear button. And text also will be clear items. And then still within the container, on top of the button, we'll have our list. So we're going to go with a class of grocery list for my div. And then within the div, we'll just place one item. So the one item that we'll later add dynamically. And that item will consist of article. Class will be grocery item. And then within this article, I'll have two things. I'll have my button container and a title. So paragraph with a class of title. And let's just write here item. And then, like I said, second one will be my button container. So div with a class of button container. And in there, I'll have two buttons, one edit button and one delete button. So again, same spiel type button. First one will be edit, so class edit btn, and I'll place my font awesome. And the value you're looking for is fa edit, so fas, and then fa edit, and then I'll just copy and paste this particular button. And instead of edit, it's going to be delete. And then, of course, the class also will be a little bit different where I'll have fa and we're looking for trash. We'll save it. And at the moment, I cannot see my awesome list. Now that is fine. That is by design because if we check out the styles CSS, we'll see something interesting where let me navigate to my container. So I have section center, all that is good. But what I'm looking for is this grocery container. And as you can see, by default, it will be hidden. If I comment this, of course, now I'll see my item. Again, that is done on purpose because once we add the item, only then we will display it. That's why if you don't comment this out, then of course you won't be able to see the list. Now, since I want to keep it that way, I will uncomment my visibility hidden. And now, of course, I cannot see my items, which is exactly what I wanted. So we're done with our index HTML and we can proceed to JavaScript to set up our awesome functionality. All right. And once we have our HTML in place, we can start working on our functionality. Of course, in order to do that, we need to navigate to app.js. And our first order of business is going to be a little bit boring, but we might as well get that out of the way so we can focus on more interesting stuff. And that is selecting items. So one by one, I'll select all the elements that I would want. And I'll start with my alert one. And for that, I'll use my query selector. And then the class for my alert is alert. All right, that's done. Then let's copy and paste uh, two times, or you know what, not only one time. My apologies, one time, and this one will be form. And of course, the class for my form is grocery form. Grocery hyphen form. Then I'm looking for my item, for my grocery item, and that one has the ID. So I'll just call this grocery. And what I'm accessing right now is the input. And for this guy, just to spice things up, I'm going to go with ID. And then the ID is grocery. And then we have a few more query selectors. I'm looking for my submit button. And I'm just going to call this submit button. Then again, we have document query selector. And then the class name is dot submit btn. Let's copy and paste three more times. And next one is the container. Now, what is the container? That is my grocery container where I have the list and the clear button. So class in this case is grocery and container. After that, we have the list. So that, of course, is this one, the div with a class of grocery list. And I'm just going to name it simply list. 
so list and let's delete also the class of submit button. And we're looking for grocery and then list. And last one will be my clear button. So clear BTN. And then the class name is clear button, clear button. And I would want to set up also some variables that we'll use later on. So right after the edit option comment, I'll set up three variables. One will be edit element. So let edit element and that one for the time being will be undefined. I'm also going to set up a flag. So edit flag. And of course, since we're not going to edit right from the get go, we're only going to edit once we click on the edit button. That's why it will be false by default. So edit flag is false by default. And then the last one will be edit ID. And we'll use this ID in order to get a specific item in the list. So we'll write edit, edit ID, and that one will be just equal to an empty string. So we have our setup. And of course, now we can start doing more interesting things. And we'll start by setting up event listeners. And the first event we'll be listening to will be submit, and that will be on our form. So right where we have the comment for event listeners, I'll just add here submit form. So submit form. And then since the form has the variable of form, I'll just add event listener, and I'll be listening for submit event. And just to spice things up, the function, the callback function, I'll use it as a reference. So instead of writing it here function, and then whatever callback function we have, we'll just change things around, because we know that we can use our callback functions, and we can just reference them. So for example, I could set up all my functions in here, and then reference them in my event listener. And I know that I'll call this one add item like so. And now I just need to come up with that function. So I'll have my function add item. And then I do need to have my event object. And the reason why I would need to have my event object, because remember, by default, when you submitted the form, well, the form was trying to submit these values to a server. And that's something that we wouldn't want. So if you'll save and not there, if you'll save your app.js, and if you'll type in some kind of value, or even if you wouldn't type in the value, once you submit, we're trying to submit the form. And that's not what we would want. So instead, I would want to go with event. That is, of course, available to me because I have the parameter of E. And then I would want to set up prevent default. So that prevents that default behavior. And once that is done, then I would want to access the value. So the value that is in my grocery, why it is in a grocery, because of course, I'm targeting right now my input. So I target the input, I assign it to a variable, and now I'd want to access that value. How can I access that value? I can use a value property. So if we'll just console log grocery, and then value, you'll see that whatever we type out, so for example, item in console, we should have access to it. So let me open up my dev tools. And of course, there is my item. Now, of course, I can submit it, for example, without any kind of value. And then I'm just going to have the empty string. So that's the first thing. I'm going to have my value. So I'm going to be always grabbing my value and I'll assign it to a value variable. And I'm going to call this grocery value. Why? Because grocery is, of course, my input. And then in order to access the value, I just need to use the value property. And now I assign it to my variable. Now, also, when we will set up our items, and before we even add them to our list, I want to have some kind of unique IDs. Now, this is not going to be a serious approach. Just because this is a practice project, we're just going to do a little cheating, where I will have my ID. And then in order to get my unique ID, I'm just going to use new date, then invoke it. Then remember, when we used get time, what we got back. Well, that was that time in milliseconds, right? So that was the number. And I'm just going to convert it to a string. And if you're wondering why we're converting all of this to a string, because later when we'll access this particular ID, it's going to come back as a string. So we might as well set it up as a string. So for the time being, if we'd want to see what we have in a console, once we'll submit the form, you'll see some kind of values. So this is just going to be some kind of unique number. Again, you're not going to do that on more serious projects. In this case, 
just because we would want to get that unique ID, and I don't want to include any kind of external libraries or anything like that, and I don't want to calculate what is the number and then increment it and all that. We'll just do a little bit of cheating where we use new date, then get time to get that in milliseconds, and right away turn it into a string. So we have these two things. We have whatever value is going to be coming from our input, and then we have our unique ID. And essentially, once we are submitting the form, we will have three options. We'll have an option of just adding the item to the list. So if we are not editing, so if the edit is false, then we'll have another option where we are editing. So editing will be true. And the third one, if the user hasn't added any kind of values. So in here, let's set up our if there's going to be some condition. Okay, then there's going to be if else or I'm sorry, else if another condition over here. And then lastly, we will have our else. So we'll have these three conditions. And the first condition will be if the value is there. Okay, so I'll say if the value is not empty, and I can write it the long way. This is what we'll do right now. And then eventually, I'm going to show you a shortcut. So in here, I can say if the value is not equal to an empty string. And so I need to use my hand operator, I'm not editing. So edit flag is equal to false. So what this means is that I would want to add this item to my list. If that is the case, beautiful. This is exactly what I'll do. Now, another option I can have is if and as a side note, this is one too many, I just need one. Another way I can do is if my value is not empty, that is again, something that I would need to have, but I am editing. So of course, again, I can write the long way or I can say value is and then not equal to an empty string and edit flag is equal to true. So in here, I can just say is equal to true. And like I mentioned, yes, I'll show you a shortcut. And of course, in here, I also would need to set up add. So if both of these conditions are true, then there's going to be some kind of code. And last one, we'll have empty values. And that's why I'll just say else. And for the time being, we'll just add console logs. So we'll say empty value. Then the second one is editing. So console log, editing. And as a side note, we won't be able to see editing because we haven't set up event listener to our edit button. And then the first one is adding item to the value, or I'm sorry, to the list. So right here, add item to the list. And now I'll see something interesting, where if we have, of course, some kind of value, then we're going to have either uh, the first two. So either we'll be editing or not editing. And as you can see, the only difference is going to be the value for our edit flag. But then if it's going to be empty value, well, for the time being, we'll just have a empty value in a console. So if I'll try to submit it, check it out. Now I have empty value. And of course, I can submit all day long. And this is what I will get back. Now, if there's going to be some kind of value, even one letter. Now, of course, I can see that I have add item to a list. Why? Because my value is not equal to zero. And then of course, edit flag is false. And again, edit flag will be false by default. It will only set to true once we actually click on that edit button. And like I promised, I also would want to cover how we can shorten this up. And we can do that because every value in JavaScript is either truthy or falsy. Now what happens with a truthy value in the condition, it will evaluate the true. So falsy, of course, will evaluate the false. So for example, we are getting the value for our input. And essentially, we're getting a string. The difference is either we're getting an empty string, which is a falsy, so it evaluates to false, or we're getting some kind of string value, which evaluates the true, because the empty string is, of course, falsy value. So for example, I can just set up some dummy if statement, and I can just say if value. And in this case, I'm just going to have console log that, I don't know, uh, value is truthy. Value is truthy. And I believe that's how you spell it, truthy. So let's save it. And now you'll see that once you type something in, you'll submit and it will say value is truthy. Now, of course, in this case, if you'll have a not operator, so what you're checking here 
if the value is not true, if it's false, then of course this will be falsy. So in here, you can just have the empty string, and I'll see that value is falsy. So again, we are just using the fact that each and every item in JavaScript will be either truthy or falsy. And then empty string is falsy. So for example, if you place it over here and the value will be empty, you won't see anything in a console because it is falsy. So this one won't evaluate to true. Now, why I showed you the not operator? Because we'll use it for our edit flag. So how we can shorten this up? Notice where we have the value. I don't need to check it for the empty string. I can just say, listen, if the value is true. So if the value will be equal to an empty string, then we know that that is a falsy value, correct? So in the condition, it will evaluate to false. So what that means is that once I hit my if, then of course, I'm not going to follow up with my code because it's not going to meet the condition. It's not going to be true. And as far as the edit flag, instead of setting it equal to false, I can just use the not operator where I can say if edit flag is not true. So for the value, I'm checking if it is true. But then for the edit flag, I'm saying if it's not true. Now, what it is by default, it is false, correct? So of course, this condition will be met unless, unless, of course, we change it to true. So the same way we can shorten this one up, where again, I'm still looking whether there's some kind of value, because even when I'm editing, I still would want to have something as a string, because there's no point for me to edit something and then I just leave it as an empty value. And then as far as the edit flag, I can just say if it is true. So if there's some kind of value in input, and if the edit flag is true, if both of these conditions are met, then of course, we're proceeding with our code. If the value is there, but the edit flag is false, this is essentially what we're saying, then of course, we would want to add it to a list. So that's how we can shorten up our if conditions. Okay, we have shortened up our if statements. So one by one, we can start working on our condition. And we'll start with the simplest one. And that one is our else one, because we just simply need to handle the fact when the user doesn't enter any kind of value. And we'll just start simply by displaying our, our alert. So within the else, I'm just going to target my alert element. Since it is in the alert variable, I can just simply say alert and then text content. So some kind of value. Let's just write over here content, and that will be equal to whatever we would want. So let's say for the time being here, empty value. And don't worry, in a second, we will set up a proper function. I just want to showcase that this stuff will work even without a function. And then I would want to add some kind of class. Now, what class I'm looking for in a style CSS, if you'll search for class, we have alert, and then we have either danger, or we have success. That's all we have. So one is going to be the red background and red text. And then the other one, of course, is going to be green color with a green background. So within the app.js, just because of course, it is going to be a danger, or, you know, user hasn't entered the value, we might as well add that class of danger. So in here, I can just say alert, then class list, like so let me close the sidebar here, class list, and then I would want to add. And then the class I'm looking for is alert. And then danger. Let's add this one. And then now, of course, once the user tries to submit the form, without adding the value, check it out, we'll have our empty value up there on the top. But the thing is, I would want to use it in multiple places. If you remember when I was showing you the project, for example, once we delete the item, once we clear the empty list, once we, I don't know, edit and all that, I would still want to work with my alert. So instead of doing this manually each and every time we need to do that, it would be a better way if we would set up a function. So right below our add item, we'll have another comment. And of course, this one will be display alert. So we'll have a function, it will be called, you guessed it, display alert. Now this function will take two arguments, a text. So whatever we would want to actually show. And the second one is the action. 
Now, action just means what is going to be the color. Are we going to use this alert danger or we're going to use alert success? So it is going to be red text or is it going to be green text? Now, the way we set that up is we still use both of these values or I'll cut them out because, of course, I will run my function here. And then instead of setting this up to some kind of hard coded value of empty value, of course, this will be equal to my text. So whatever I place here as the argument. And the second one will be action. And for the action, I'll have two choices, danger or success. So instead of adding this class this way, I could use template string. And then I can just say alert. And then whatever is going to be my action. So whatever is going to be my argument. If I have it this way, so of course, this action will be danger. So let's invoke our function display alert. What text I would want to have is please enter value. And then, like I said, either success or danger. So I'm going to go here with the danger because I would want my text to be red. We'll save it. And then once the user tries to submit the form without entering the value, there you go. We have please enter value. Now, one thing that I would want to add, though, is that we remove that alert because I don't want that alert to be there all the time. And we can do that by running set timeout function. So right below where we setting up our alert and all that, we'll have another comment, remove alert. And then I'll use my set timeout. And remember, set timeout was looking for two things. It was looking for a callback function. So what function will run? And then the second one was in how long. So my callback function and in how long I would need to invoke it. And since it is again in the milliseconds, if I would want one second, I would need to write a thousand. And then what I would want to do within my callback function? Well, simple. I'm just going to grab both of these things again, copy and paste. Text content should be set to an empty string. And then I would want to remove the same class that I just added. So whatever class I added, I'll just remove it. And then, of course, we can try it out, try to submit. Place in the value, and within one second, our alert is gone. Again, why we went through all this hassle setting up the function? Because we'll repeat. For example, once we'll add the item, we'll display that there was a success. We added the list. Well, then, if, for example, the user tries to delete, then of course we'll display it, and hopefully you get the gist. So, since I'm repeating the same functionality, I might as well set up a nice function that just does that for me. Okay, and once we have tackled the easiest scenario, where user doesn't enter anything in the form and tries to submit. Now, of course, let's tackle the big beast, where if the value is true, so if there's some kind of value, and the edit flag is false. So if that is the case, of course, we would want to add that item to a list. And we'll start very simply by creating some kind of new element. Now, what element I'm creating? Well, I just need to check what I have in the index.html. So I had my list and then I had an article with this class of grocery item. So this is what I want to create. So if there's some kind of value and if I'm not editing, then I would want to create that item. So I'm going to go with some kind of variable name. I'm going to call this element that is document, then create element. So we're going with this function and then what we would want to create, what kind of element? Well, since in the index HTML, I have my article. That's why I'll create the article. So I'm going to go here, article. And then there's two things that I would want to add. I would want to add a class since all my articles have this grocery item class. And I would also want to set up that unique ID as a data set. So I'll start with a class because that's the simplest one. So I'm just going to say add class. And in here, I'll write a element, element, and then class list, add, and the class is grocery item. So that's the class that I would want to add. And the second thing is that ID. And again, we'll use this ID in order to edit. And I'll use my data set to add the ID. Remember, if the index HTML had data and then whatever, some kind of value, I was able to access it using the data set property. So in this case, we'll add that dynamically where I'm going to first create my attribute. So I'm going to call this let and you know what? 
we'll say add ID. So let's create our variable const attribute is equal to document. Then we are creating a attribute, create attribute on fly. And then I'm going to call my attribute data hyphen ID. So what's important is to have this data. And then since I would want to access as a ID property, I'm just going to say hyphen data ID. So again, everything that we did before, just the difference was that we were manually setting this up in the index HTML. Now I'm doing that on the fly. I'm creating the attribute. I'm just naming a data ID. And then later, again, I'll use my data set in order to access that value. And then I do need to set up my values. So attribute value, and that is going to be equal to my unique ID, the one that I'm just creating here. And then, of course, once that is done, I would want to add it to my element. So in here, I'm going to write element, then set attribute node. That is important. That is the method name. And then I'm just adding this attribute. And then once this is done, I would want to add my HTML. So in here, I'll go with element, then inner HTML, and I'll set this equal to a template string. Now, in this case, we do need to be careful, though, because you don't want to grab the article. Okay, because we already set up the article. What you want is everything within the article. So cut it out. And then again, leave this article where it is in the index HTML. And we might as well can delete it because we'll add the rest of them dynamically anyway. Just make sure that you grab everything within the article, not the article itself, because we already set the article up here with an ID, the ID, with the classes and all that. Okay, just make sure you follow the same setup. So I'll get rid of my article because the rest of them will be dynamic. Anyway, I'll save my index HTML. And then in the app JS, I'll copy and paste whatever I had within the article in my template string. And now of course, I would want to change this hard coded value to whatever I'm getting from my form. So this is going to be equal to value. But of course, we're not done. So now we set up the element, but we would need to add it to our list. Correct, because this was just first step of setting up the item. So in here, why don't we add a comment of append child, and that will be equal to my container, or I'm sorry, not container list. Correct, because we were selecting our list. That one is still there, and we selected here when we were setting up our variables. So I would want to use append child list append child, and now I'd want to add my element. So let's type here element. Okay, we're adding it to the list. We're still not done. We would still want to display the alert. So display alert. Now what I would want to display, I would want to say item added to the list, item added to the list. And then what is going to be the color? I think that should be success. So that's one we're adding. And then also I would want to show my container. Because remember in style CSS, I said that we're hiding the container. However, I have the class here, show container, where visibility is visible. So now what will happen in the app.js, if this is success, if we have added this to a list, then of course I would want to show my container. And I'll just say here, comments show container. And I have my container variable. I already selected my container, class list, and then add. And I would want to add show container. Let's see what we'll have. Again, the user will try to submit empty value first. Please enter value. Okay, good. And then we go with item. And of course, now I have my item. I had my alert. And I have my awesome two buttons as well. Beautiful. Now there's two more functions that we'll add over here. But for the time being, we'll just set up placeholders. Why am I doing that? Because I think it's easier if we have them as placeholders because then we don't need to scramble around our app.js and try to find it because of course, we'll be adding more code. So we might as well add them as placeholders, because that way I won't forget once we get there. Okay, now what are these functions add to local storage, and the function name will be exactly the same add to local storage again for the time being is just going to be a placeholder. And in here, we'll pass two arguments, ID and value. And then another thing will be set back to default. So set back to default and the function name will be exactly the same. So set back to default. 
let's invoke both of them. And now, of course, let's just set up some kind of placeholder because otherwise we'll get big fat errors. So in here, I'll say set back to default. And then as far as the local storage, it's going to be my function. And the function name was add to local storage. It's going to be looking for two things, ID and the value. And for the time being, you can just say log added to local local storage and the default one will be somewhat the same where again we'll have our function and we'll just console log something so I'll say set back to default and this is going to be our function it's not going to take any kind of arguments and we'll have a console log set back to default again we're just setting up placeholders because in my opinion, it's just going to be a little bit easier instead of hustling around our document once we would need to add those functions, because then we need to find the specific place. And then it just introduces more possible bugs. And I guess that should do it for adding item to the list. Again, we just go with some kind of item eggs over here, and we can see that we're adding them to the list. And in this case, we're going to add milk, and we can also add, I don't know, sugar, and all that. So we're adding them to a list. But as you can see in the console, we can see added to local storage, set back to default, and all that. So this is something that we will fix later on. Okay, and once we have our setup for adding the item, why don't we right away fix the set back to default situation, where at the moment, we're just invoking the function and we have the console log. But what we would want to do instead? Well, as you can see, as we're adding items, each and every time we do it, we still have the old value in here, right? So if I would want to add another item, I need to delete it and all that. So as far as setting back to default, we'll just make sure that things go back to our initial setup. And I can tell you right away that in this particular case, when we invoke set back to default, you will be wondering, okay, why we're doing all of these things? Since at this point, we only would need to clear this value. And we will clear this value, but we'll add our initial, or I'm sorry, we'll add some additional things. Why we're we adding them right now? Because this function will be called multiple times. And in those times, we would want those other things as well. Okay, that's why I'm just telling you that initially we would be only looking for clearing the value. But since I already have the function, and since I'm going to call it to multiple places, I might as well set up the whole function. And then when we call this function later, it will do its job. So as far as clearing out the value, I'm just going to go with grocery and then value, and that will be equal to an empty string. And then I'm going to add those values that at the moment will not make sense. So in here, I'm going to say edit flag is equal to false. Okay, good. And then I would want to add edit ID, set it equal to an empty string. And the last one will be submit button, text content, text content is equal to submit. And again, at this point, it looks like an overkill, because the only one we're really looking for is the first one grocery value is equal to an empty string. That's why when I add, for example, your milk notice, before adding the next item, I have empty values in here, because I'm just saying, you know what grocery value, you should be empty string. And only when the user starts stepping it out, then it's going to show up. So I can add here sugar. And of course, it's going to be the same thing where everything is wiped out clean. These ones, yes, at the moment, edit flag is already equal to false. Edit ID is already empty string. And submit text content is already submit. But later, once we'll call this function in different scenarios, they will come in really handy. All right. And once we can add items to the list, I think the simplest one will be removing all items. So still within functions. So still within functions and not within local storage, I'll just place my delete items or clear list, whatever you would want to call it function. Now, of course, I would want to set it up to my clear button. So we would need to start by setting up event listener, correct? So we have one for form submission. And next one will be for clearing out the values. So clear items, I'll use my clear button. That is the last selection that I have clear button. 
clear button, then add event listener will just be listening for click events. And then the function name will be clear items again, just to spice things up. Of course, we can write our callback function right here. But since we have done that quite a few times, we might as well test out some different setups as well. So I'll place my one before set back the default, but of course, it's up to you as long as you don't set it in a local storage, because otherwise it's just going to be confusing. So let's write here the function name. Uh, clear items, clear items. That is my function. So function clear items. I'm not going to pass any kind of arguments. And first, I would want to select all the items. So once I click on my clear button, I would want to select my items. Now, which items am I talking about? Well, the ones that have this grocery item. Now, of course, I cannot show it in the index HTML anymore because we're just adding this dynamically. So remember, when we are creating these articles, we're adding this grocery item. So now once I click on the clear items list, I would want to get all of them. So let's scroll down clear items. We'll use some kind of variable items is document, then query selector all since it's just going to spit be back the list. And then the class name is grocery item. Now I'm not going to console log it because again, we have done that quite a few times. And in here, I would just want to check if the length of this node list is bigger than zero, then since I would want to clear out the whole list, I'm just going to iterate over them. And then I'll use my list variable, the parent container, and then remove that item from the list. So if items length, so if the node list has any kind of length, that means what? That means that I have added items, correct? And then if that is the case, then iterate over those items. So for each, and then since I can access each and every item in my callback function, I just need to come up with some kind of parameter. In my case, that is going to be the item. And then I'll use a list. So that is the parent again, that is grocery list. And it has a method of remove child. So since in each iteration, I can access that child, I'll just pass it here. I'll say a list remove item, list remove child. And then I'm just passing in that item. Now, we're not done though. Because even though we can remove all the items and all that, what else we would want to do? Well, we would want to, of course, set some things around here, where for example, if we remove items from the list, I would also want to hide the container. Now, how is that going to look like? Well, we would need to remove that class of show container. So now let's test it out. I'm going to go with item, then I don't know, I'm going to go with item number two, I'll add both of them to the list. And once I clear the items notice, I still have my clear items button. And that's not what I would want. So that's why we'll go over here with container class list. And then remember, previously, we added the class, and now we're just removing the class. What is the class name? It is show container. We just removed this class. Okay, awesome. Now also would probably want to display the alert that we just cleared out the list. Remember, we have function for that, then the value will be empty list. And then I would want to set it up as a danger. Now, if you want, you can set it up as success. Again, it's just a preference of what kind of color you would want to set up. And let's see again, item, then item number two, then let's clear the items. And then I have my alert. Awesome. But I also hide my container. So I don't see my clear list button anymore. And then I would want to do two more things. I'd want to set back to default. And then I would want to also remove the whole list from my local storage. Now again, local storage at the moment will not make sense. So that's why I will comment this out. I'm going to say local storage, then the net and name will be remove item. And I'm going to be looking for a list. Again, don't worry. Once we get to the local storage, I'll cover this in detail. But for the time being, just add this one liner. And then we'll use our set back to default. So back to default. And you're probably wondering, okay, why we're we sitting in this case back to default. Let me show you with a finished project. So what I would want is, for example, add one item, item number two, or whatever three. 
So once we click on the edit, notice how I'm changing this value over here in the button. But there's also some things that I'm doing behind the scenes. Now, what I don't want is, for example, if the user starts deleting other items, this still stays as edit, or if I'm clearing out the items. That's why we're setting back everything to default. Again, at this point in time, you're like, okay, this is an overkill, but it's not. Again, later, once we add this edit functionality, this will make sense. Why are we setting back everything to a default? So that should be our clear items functionality. Again, we select all the items we added dynamically. We take a look if the length is bigger than zero. What that means is that there's at least one item. Okay, if it's that case, then of course, we just iterate over them. I can select each and every element. And then I use list the parent. And on that parent, we have remove child method. And I just pass the same item in here. Good. Now, once that is done, then of course, I would want to remove my class. I don't want to hide or I'm sorry, show the container anymore. I would want to display some kind of alert, set back the default, and eventually we'll also remove it from the local storage. Perfect. We can add item. We can clear the list. So I guess it would only make sense if we would start deleting with edit and delete buttons. However, before we can set up anything as far as the functionality, we also need to understand when we'll have access to them. So let me show you what I mean. I'll navigate back to our project and your initial thought would be following, where if we scroll up, I can notice that I'm adding one button for editing and the second one for deleting. And then one has the edit BTN class. And then the second one is delete button class. So you're probably thinking on this, okay, where I have my event listeners, I'm just going to set up one for editing and the other one for deleting. And I'm just going to show you with one because essentially it will fail and I'm going to go over why. So we can just probably say here const delete btn is equal to document, then we can use maybe query selector, it doesn't really matter. And then we're just going to say delete delete btn that's the class that i'm targeting let me double check otherwise you'll think that it doesn't work because i have some kind of bug and then let's console log it because of course we can only add that event listener if that thing exists correct and once you run it you'll see that it's null now why do you think this is null and the short answer is because we're adding them dynamically so what happens once we have our app if I add this item, initially, when it loads, we have no access to these two guys, none. So you cannot just set it up, okay, there's a delete button. And then I would want to add event listener, like you did, for example, with clear button on the form, why you were able to do it because clear button is right here. So of course, initially, once my app JS loads, I can simply target all my things. But in this case, it won't work. I have no access to delete or edit button. Now I have two options. Either we can use the fact that there is such thing as event bubbling. So for example, I could set up a event listener on my parent, and the parent container in our case could be probably grocery list, right? So if the user clicks on a list, then we'll check either if it's a edit button or delete button. And then of course, we'll do something either edit the item or delete item. But since we have covered already bubbling, I think it's going to be a little bit more interesting, where we take a look at the setup where we target those buttons with selectors when and this is very important, when we have access to them. Now to show you when we actually have access to them. Let me first of all, get rid of this gibberish. So there's no event listener. Okay, I already deleted. Awesome. Let me keep on scrolling down. And now notice something interesting, where I added the element. Okay, good. But then when I have access to it, when I actually created the element, correct. And remember, we could use not document, and then query selector, and then look for that edit button. In fact, I can just use that element, correct. So what I could do over here in the if where I have value and edit flag is true. So once I'm adding this item, this is where we have access to those buttons. So this is where we can set up those event listeners. 
And then, of course, we can just sum these functions in here where we have all the functions. So, for example, in here, I could have edit function, then copy and paste, and I can just have delete. I believe we'll work on delete first, but you get the point. I'll have these two functions, but I'll target both of them when I have access to them, not when the app loads, but when I actually have access to them. Or again, the other option you would have is setting up a event listener on a grocery list and then check for those targets and then do it that way. If you would want to have a challenge, you can probably, once you're done building the app this way, you can maybe try it out the other way where we're using the event bubbling. Now, in my case, I will target both of these elements when I have access to them and I'll use my element. So I'll start by setting up some kind of variable and it's going to be delete btn. And then again, instead of document, I'm using element. All right. And query selector. And now I'm looking for my delete button. Okay. And of course, in this case, class needs to match. Otherwise, it's not going to make sense. And I'll target the same way my edit one. So copy and paste. And I'll just name this edit. So edit button. And then it is going to be edit button class. And now I'd want to sell up my two event listeners. Click event listeners for edit button and the actual edit button. So I'm going to go with delete button, then add event listener. Add, I'm sorry, not this one, add event listener. And then I'm going to be listening for click event. And as far as the callback function, again, we can write the functionality in here, but it is getting already quite busy. So I'll just say that there's going to be a delete item function. We'll copy and paste. In this case, I'm looking for edit button, edit button, and then the function name will also be edit. So we do need to, of course, set up some kind of placeholders at least. So let's scroll down. We have our delete function. I'm going to have function and then delete, delete item function. And in this case, for the time being, we'll just have it as a simple function. And in the console log, I'm just going to say item deleted. And I'll do the same thing for my edit one, just so we can see that we have access to both of them. So in this case, this is going to be edit item. And I'll say not item edited. But I'm just going to say edit item, edit item. Now, once I have both of these things, let me add some kind of item. What I'm looking for is some kind of console log. So now I can see that I'm editing the item. In this case, I'm deleting the item. So yes, in the following videos, we will set up the functionality. But trust me, if you don't have this initial one, where you actually have access to them, anything that you would do later on just wouldn't make sense anyway. Because whatever you would write in your actual function, you wouldn't be able to call it that callback function, because you would have no access at the very start to buttons to edit and delete, because we're adding them dynamically. They're not in the index HTML when our app JS loads. Okay, we have access to both of the buttons. Now we just need to set up functionality in delete item and edit item. And I think I'm going to start with delete item because it's just going to be a little bit simpler. Now, what I am looking for is though the event object. So that's why I'll pass here as a parameter because I would want to access the parent container. So what I would want to do is once I click on my button, my delete button, I would want to get my parent container. Now, what is the parent container in this case? Well, we need to think about it. We have a section center. Then we have our container. And then, of course, I have my list. And then in here, I have my grocery item, correct? Now I have my button container. This is where my buttons are sitting. But once I click on the lead button, I wouldn't want to access the button container. I would want to access the grocery item. Why? Because I already have reference to grocery list. So again, I can use my remove child, the one that we used previously when we cleared out the list. In this case, however, we will use remove child with specific item. So our parent. So I'll click on a button. I'll look not for my parent, my direct parent, but actually for my grocery item. And then once I'll have access to that element, 
I'll just remove it from my grocery list. So that's why I need, of course, my event object. And I'm just going to have some kind of element variable that is going to be equal to event, then current target, current target. Why I'm using current target? Because this is already set up on a button. So I don't want to actually, by mistake, select, for example, font awesome icon. I want the button because if it's font awesome icon, then, of course, the path is a little bit different because the actual button is apparent. So something to keep in mind. There's cases where you'd want to use target, where you're actually seeing what you're clicking on. But then in this case, you want the current target because the path is very specific. So I'm going to go to current target since I'm clicking on a button. I already know that. And then parent element. And then since I would want to get the grocery item, I need to go two levels up. So this is going to give me my button container. But I want actually parent element as far as my grocery item. So once I have selected my element, then, like I said, I would want to use list, remove, child, and then I'm going to use my element. So I'm going to go here with element, and you'll see how nicely we remove this item. So I'm going to have item, and then, of course, hey, once I click, I removed from the list. Now, what other things I would want to do, though? Because, yeah, removing the item from the list is awesome, but I also would want to hide the container. So in this case, I would want to check well, how big is my list? Because if I have other items, then I wouldn't want to hide the list. But in my case, for example, since I had only one item, if that is the case, then of course I would want to clear the list. How I can do that by removing the show container class. So in here, I'll say if list children and then length is equal to zero, then of course what I would want? Well, I would want container class list remove, and then we'll go with show container. So show container should be removed. Let's try it out again. I'll have item, and then this is my item. And once I click, notice my list also disappears. Beautiful. Then we would want to go with display alert. So display alert. And then I'm just going to say item removed, removed like so. And we'll add here danger. Okay. Again, that's your preference, whatever color you would want. And I'll set it back to defaults. Again, why we're doing that as far as deleting the item, because I don't want user to start editing and then deleting items. And then I'll still have those edit setups. Okay. That's why we're just going back to default. So again, the function name was set back to default. Awesome. That's done. And then lastly, I would want to also remove it from local storage. But this is where I'll use my IDs. So again, I'll have my comment here. Remove from local storage. Okay, awesome. And then I have my function, of course. Now we haven't created that function, but it's going to be there eventually. Remove from local storage. And then we'll pass in the ID. Now we don't have the ID. Don't worry, we'll set it up in a second. So I'll have my ID. I'll comment this out. But down below where I have local storage, I will set up this function. So function, and again, the name will be removed from local storage, we'll pass in the ID. And then I don't think I'm going to add the console log, because probably our console is going to get quite busy. So we might as well comment this out as well. But then there's going to be this function. Now, where are we going to get this ID? Well, remember, we had the data set, correct? As we we're adding the item, you'll see in a console that or I'm sorry, not console elements. Notice if I check out my section center, my show container, my grocery list and item, notice how item has this data ID. So that's the one we're adding dynamically. And now I would want to access it. Okay, so let's move up where we have the delete item functionality. And since I have access to the element, when I use parent element and parent element, I can also access the same ID. So I can just go with const ID is equal to my element. Then remember, the property name was data set. And since I named my one ID, I go with dot ID. If you name this banana or bugs bunny, then of course, use the same value. So I'm going to get my ID. And now within the local storage, remove from local storage, 
I will pass this ID again. We will get eventually to local storage. Don't worry, I'll cover this in more detail. But yes, there will be a function removed from local storage, and we'll use this ID that we're accessing with data set ID. Again, we have current target, so that is our delete button, correct? That's why we're using current target because we have the font awesome, and that might be a little bit confusing. So, since we're setting up event listener on a button, I'm grabbing the actual button, and then I have parent element, parent element, so that's how I access my element. I get my ID, I remove it from the list, from the parent. I also remove show container. If there are no more items on a list, I display alert. I set back to default because I don't want user to start editing and then removing items. If the case is that the user is editing and removing the item, I will set it back to default. And then eventually I'll just remove it from local storage. All right. And once we have delete item out of the way, Next, we'll focus on edit item. Now, when it comes to edit item, it's going to be a two step process because not only we would want to set up the functionality in here, we will also need to handle it when we're submitting the form. Because remember, we were checking whether we are submitting the form or we are editing. And we'll start the same way like we had in the delete item. And we're just going to copy and paste the first line. So, what I'm trying to access here is that grocery item. So this is going to be exactly the same. Now there's also a small bug in here. It should be element, not whatever I had in there. So of course, if I would have that bug, I wouldn't be able to pass in the ID. That would be undefined and my functionality would eventually break. So just make sure that you have here element and data set and then ID. Now, once we have the element, now I'd want to set up those edit items. So remember, we had edit element, edit flag, and edit ID. So this is finally the time when we'll change these values around. So we're going to navigate back to our edit item, and one by one, we'll apply these values. So we'll start by set edit item, and this is going to be my edit element. So that's the first thing. And I'll set it equal to event current target. So the button I'm clicking on, then parent element, and now I'm looking for the sibling. So why am I looking for the sibling? Because I'm going to add my item here. And you'll see in a console, probably make this one a little bit bigger. Uh, we're looking for our item. Yep, that is true. And I don't know why I'm looking in a form. Should be looking in here. I look in a grocery list. I have my item and I'm looking for this title. Now, remember, the parent container will give me this button container, correct? So parent element is the button container. But then I'm looking for this title. That's the value that I would like to access. And as we're traversing DOM, I can just say previous, previous, like so, then element, and then sibling, sibling. So that's going to give me that title. So once I have that title, I can start setting up the values. And in here, I'm just going to say set form value, set form value. And this is going to be equal to my grocery value. Because remember, we had the grocery and then we also had the value. So instead of cleaning it, instead of setting it equal to a empty string, I'll set it equal to the edit element and then inner HTML, inner HTML. Again, this is just going to give me this name, whatever it is, whether that is the eggs or whether that is milk or whether that is an item. Now, again, of course, it's going to give me that specific value for that specific item. So I'm going to have milk and then I'm going to have beer. You'll see the moment I click on the edit item. Of course, in here I have the beer. Why? Because I go to the parent. That is my button container. And then I'm looking for my title. So this is going to give me that title. And then I just use my input. It has the value property. And instead of grabbing that property, in this case, we're setting that property. We say grocery and value. And this is going to be equal to our edit element in our HTML. Then, of course, since I'm editing what I would want, I would want to set edit flag equal to true. Correct. So we're going to go here with edit flag. And then we're setting it equal to true. And then the last one will be edit ID. So I'm going to go with edit ID. And that one is equal to my element. And again, 
I would just want to access that data set because for both of them, of course, that is going to be the unique value. So I'm going to go here with data set and then the ID because that is, of course, my attribute name. And lastly, I would want to change the value in my submit because now at this point I'm editing. I'm not just going to be submitting. I'm going to be, in fact, editing. So in here, we'll say submit text and then content is equal to edit. So let's save it. We will test it out. And then, of course, we'll head up and fix our submit because at the moment we just have the else or the if. So we're not handling right now our edit functionality. Again, let's start with milk and then beer. So again, if I edit, notice I have my milk, I have my edit. All of those values have been set. Now I just need to handle it when I'm submitting my form. So I'm going to scroll up. Of course, my first condition is if the value is true. And then also if the edit flag is false. So that's when we're adding it to the list. Now, the second one is if the value is true and the edit flag is false, because one thing we need to keep in mind, if we'll delete it and try to actually submit, we'll still have this please enter value. So we'll hit this else. And this is exactly what, what we would want, because remember, I don't want user to click on edit and then get the value and then just delete it. OK, and then say, OK, I edited it. Now there's no value. No, that's not what I would want. So it's good that if the value is empty, then we'll still have our display alert, please enter value and all that. But we're not going to be submitting it to a list. And we're also not going to be changing our value. All right. But what we would want to change, though. OK, good question. And what I would want to do is grab my value and assign it to my edit element. Remember, in here, I had my edit element, correct? And I assigned it to my specific paragraph. And then I had my grocery value and I assigned it to edit element and inner HTML. So I grabbed whatever I had in that paragraph and assigned it to my form. Now I would want to do the opposite, where instead of assigning it to the form, since the value, of course, will be changed since we're editing something, now I'd want to grab that value and set it back equal to my paragraph. And since I assigned it to my edit element, and the edit element is, of course, up here on the top. When I'm actually submitting my form, I can say, you know what? The edit element. So remember, that was our variable edit element. And then inner HTML is now equal to the value. Where am I getting the value? Right here. Grocery value. So again, first we assigned it to inner HTML, and now we're assigning it back. So we're kind of reversing right now. So edit element in our HTML that is equal to our value. Awesome. Then I would want to run my display alert. And I'm just going to say value, value changed like so. And then it's going to be a success. We'll have a green color. And then there's going to be two more things. We would want to edit local storage and also set back to default. So we're going to go with set back to default. Again, why am I doing that? because I would want to edit a next time as well. So now when I'll run my set back to default, remember, this one was grocery value equal to an empty string, edit flag equal to false, edit ID is actually equal to an empty one. And then we'll have submit text content is equal to submit, because at the moment we have actually edit. And of course, we would want to do that. Now there's one gotcha though, because above set back to default, I would still want to edit the item in the local storage as well. So make sure that set back to default is actually the last one. In here, we'll have a function and we'll call this edit local storage, edit local storage. Again, at the moment, we don't have that function, but we will have in a second edit local storage. And then there's going to be two things. I would want to grab that edit ID. So I don't want the new ID. I don't want the one that we're creating from the scratch. I want this guy, the edit ID. And remember, within the edit event handler, we were assigning this to a value that we're getting back from the item. The item had data set ID. 
And then, of course, this was assigned to edit ID. So now we're passing in down to our local storage. And the second one will be the new value. So, of course, this is going to be the new one where the user has changed that value. Now, let me navigate down. And in this case, I'll set up my function. Now, this one, of course, will be for my edit. So I'm going to go with edit local storage. It's going to be looking for two things, the ID and also the value. So let's set this up and now I'll be able to edit. So, for example, if I write item here and item number two and then, I don't know, eggs. And if I want to change my first item to something meaningful, I can click on it. Now I have my item. I'm editing. So now I grabbed my title assigned to my input. That's why I have the value. And now, of course, once I'll change it to, for example, I don't know, milk, right? Once I'll click on edit, now I'll sign it back. Check it out. Now I sign it. And of course, I have the milk. And as you can see, since we're keeping the reference of which item it is, that's why we're not changing the order. So if I'm editing the first item, I'm editing the first item. And the reason why we're all the time setting back the defaults, because this is the behavior that I want, where, for example, if I'm editing this item, if the user decides that, you know what, at this point, I'll delete the eggs or clear the items, I'll set it back to defaults. Because I don't want that edit to be lingering. Because as you can see, once we press edit, we actually assign these guys to some kind of values. And I don't want to keep on holding on to those values. If the user decides to delete something, then these will be set back to default as well. So that way, if there's some kind of editing going on, we'll have to start it from scratch instead of just making a big mess with some old values, new values, and all that. So that should do it for our functionality. And of course, now we just need to focus on how we set up local storage, where the moment we refresh the application, we still have access to the items we have in our list. All right, our functionality is working. Now, of course, we would want to work with our local storage, where each and every time we do something with our list, we will update our local storage. And then once the user comes back to the application, we have all the values. And the reason why we can do that is because when we work with JavaScript, of course, we work with the browser. And one of the APIs that browser has is the local storage API. If you'd like to check it out, we just navigate to our developer tools. We're looking for application. And in here, we'll have a local storage. And essentially, what we're doing here is we're saving information as key value pairs. Now, methods we would need to remember as far as local storage. And as a side note, we have access by default to local storage. So again, there's no external library or anything like that. We just need to run our methods. And the methods we have is set item, get item, remove item. And one thing we need to remember, though, is we need to save those values as strings. So that's a little bit of gotcha. But the way it would work with a local storage is we would write a local storage, local storage. And then, like I said, if we want to set item, we would go with set item, then whatever name. So I'm going to use the name of a list, but of course, we can use whatever we would want. So for example, I can say here orange. But then if I would want to say, for example, save array, I would need to save it as a string. And for that, we would use JSON and then stringify method. And at the moment, I'm just going to pass in manually. But of course, later, you'll see how we're accessing some kind of array. But in here, I could say, I don't know, array of item, and then item number two. So of course, once I'll save it, I'll see that in my local storage, I have my orange, and I have the items of item and item number two. Now again, the gotcha is that we need to use this stringify. Okay, otherwise, this functionality will end. Now, if I would want to get those values, I could just say, I don't know, let and then or whatever const doesn't really matter. Oranges is equal to local storage, then get item. And then in this case, we would need to use this JSON parse. So I'll use my get item. Now, what is the item name? It is orange. But then this whole thing, we would need to set up a JSON parse, parse, parse. And in here, we'll pass in the at local storage. 
Now, I know that we already covered this when we talked about the DOM during the tutorial part, but it's always to have it as a refresher. So once I'll save it, you'll see that if I'll try to access my oranges, I should have my list. So oranges. Okay, so now I have item one and item number two. So now I have the array. Now, again, if you won't use this JSON stringify and JSON parse, then you'll have a big fat mess because, again, we need to store them as strings. And if we would want to remove the item from the local storage, again, we would run local storage, then remove item, and then whatever is the item name. So I have local storage and then remove item. And then we just need to say what is the item name. In our case, that is orange. Let's do that. And now we can see that in application, of course, we don't have the local storage. So essentially, this is what we'll do in the add to local storage, remove from local storage, edit local storage. Now, why our setup is going to be a little bit complicated, because of course, we're not going to store oranges in there. We'll have to store it as a object. So it's going to be a array with objects and each item will have the ID and then the value. And then if we'd want to remove one, then we would need to access the ID and all that kind of good stuff. But this is going to be a general setup where we have set item, then we have get item and then remove item. But we just need to use the stringify when we want to save it and parse once we want to get that value back, because of course we would need to turn it back into array from the string. Beautiful. Once we have jogged our memory, as far as local storage goes, now let's start working on our functions. And I'll we'll start with the first one, add to local storage. Now, I guess I'm going to leave this for your reference. So I'm just going to comment this out just in case you would want to use it later on. And then as far as add to local storage, here's what we'll do. Well, we're running this when? Well, let's double check. We're going to head up. And I can see that if the value is there and I'm not editing, and of course, all the way in the bottom, I'm running my add to local storage. I get this unique ID. So the same one that I passed into the item. And then I also have the value. So whatever is displayed on the screen. So those are the two things that I'm passing into my add to local storage. And like I said, I wouldn't want to store oranges in there. I would want to store actually array with items. So I'll start by setting up some kind of item and I'm going to call this grocery, but it doesn't really matter what you call it. And that is going to be equal to my ID or I'm sorry, to my object. And yes, in the object, I'll have my ID is equal to ID and the value will be equal to value. Now, one thing that of course we haven't covered ES6, but essentially with ES6, we have a little bit of shorthand where if this value has the same variable name as your property, you can just shortcut it. Now, again, what I'm saying here is there's going to be a property of ID. And that ID is, of course, value of my parameter over here, the one that I'm passing in. The same will work here, where I have the property with the name of value. And that one is equal to my value parameter. And if both of them match, the shortcut is following. Or I can just remove the second one. And now I'll have my object, the ID and property of value. And of course, whatever I'll pass it in here. And this is going to be the case where I would like to console log because I think it's just going to give us a good understanding. So if I'll write here eggs and if we'll run it in a console, I'll have my ID. So that is the value that is coming from the parameter. Remember, that was that second thing. And then also, as far as the value, we have the eggs. So again, this is just an ES6 thing where we can just shorten our syntax a little bit. But essentially, it's the same thing. ID is equal to ID. And then the value is equal to value. If both of them match, if this variable name that you're passing in has the same name as your property name, you have a shorthand, my friend. So we can just save the typing a little bit. All right, we have the grocery. Now what? Well, now I'd want to get those items from the local storage because eventually they're going to be there. Now you're probably right away saying, okay, but they're not there at the moment. And yeah, you're right. But we would need to still set up some kind of logic where initially they wouldn't be there, but eventually we would also need to check whether they're there or not. Now, how we can do that? We can set up some kind of items. Now this is going to be my array. And then in this case, of course, 
I would need to get that item right now. How we were able to get the item, we used get item function. So in here, I'll say local storage, then get item. But then am I going to get the item or no? Is there an item with the name of list? And I can clearly see that in my application, everything is empty. My local storage, there is no items. So what am I going to get back in here? Well, let's see items. And we'll have a big fat undefined. I'm going to go with eggs. And yes, there is no. So there is no item in there. Okay, that's good news. Now we could set up a ternary operator where I'm going to say, you know what? If there is an item, good, assign it to my variable. If there is no item, if there's no list, then just set this up as a empty array. Okay. Now, of course, we can write an if statement here if we would want. But we can also do it, like I just said, with a ternary operator. Now, the way that will look like is following where I have local storage get item. Now, again, either this is just going to say, yeah, that value is there, or we're going to get back null. Now, if we're going to get back null, then if you remember ternary operator, we're just going to set this up as a empty array or if there is actually that value there, if the list is already there, then we'll have the actual value. Now, remember though, when we were using the get item, we needed to use this JSON parse. So this is just checking whether the item exists or not. If it does, then get me that item and use the JSON parse. If it doesn't, set my items equal to my empty array. Now, again, let's run JSON parse and now I'll have our local storage then get item and then the name will be list because I know that I will set this up as a list now if the name would be different then of course I would name it differently but I know that eventually here at the end of this and the local storage I will set it up as a list okay so now I have two options either I'm going to get this as a array of list which at the moment I don't have it or a empty array and I know that in this point, I have the empty array. Okay. And now I would want to add this grocery to my items, whatever it is. I mean, I know that this is right now an empty array, but eventually it's not going to be an empty array. There's going to be some items in there. So I'll just say items, then push, we're adding, and then I'm adding grocery. And now once I have my items ready to go, I just want to use my set method. And if you remember one thing with local storage was the fact that if there is already some kind of value, and if we're sending another one, we are essentially overriding that. But we don't care about it. Because each and every time we'll add our item, we will get back our old list. So essentially, yes, we will override that whatever value we had on there. But we need to remember that, of course, this is going to be the actual latest value. So we really don't care. Now I have my items. Awesome. It is going to be some kind of array. And like I said, we'll have our local storage set item and I'll name this list and now I'll say JSON stringify and I'm passing in the items. So now if the item wasn't there, we were definitely setting this up. If the item was already there, then of course we'll get back that item. And we can clearly see that if we'll console log our items and you'll see that the first time when we add our item, the items will just be an empty array because this guy, this JSON parse will be equal to that null that we already covered. But the second time, once we already have some kind of item, this JSON parse, the one that we're actually checking the local storage get item, that one won't be any more null. Okay. So that's why we'll grab our JSON parse then pass in the get item. So we'll get our list, pass it through the parser, and then the items will be already the array. Okay, and of course, we would need to test it out. So if I'll pass here the eggs, we'll see that the first time our value for the items will be this empty array. Why? Because local storage does not have the item by the name of a list. But the next time, since we're already setting it up over here, local storage set item list and then stringify the items, then we'll have our array with values. So let me run it. I'm adding the eggs, like I said. In the beginning, I have the empty array because I had a ternary operator. I'm checking for the item of list. That item does not exist. And we just evaluate to an empty array. Then the second time, 
course, there's going to be already some kind of item. So we'll just grab that item. We use JSON parse, and then whatever is in the item, we grab it, we assign it to the items, and now we'll add to our array. So if I'll add over here milk, milk, you'll see that now I have array of two items, the eggs and the milk. All right, and once we have add to local storage out of the way, of course, now I'd want to focus on remove from local storage and edit local storage. Now, one thing, though, is that for both of these functions, I would want to access whatever I have in local storage. And I wouldn't want to copy and paste this. Okay, because what if I would want to change something? So it would make more sense if we would have a function that just takes care of that. So in here, I'll have another function, get local storage. Now we don't pass any kind of parameters, but I will return my result. So I'll just grab this local storage code, like so, copy and paste. And I'm just going to say, well, return from local storage, whatever you get. If there's going to be a list, return my list. If not, then just return this empty array. And I'll just use my function here. I'll say get local storage, and I'll invoke it. And you'll see that the functionality does not change. We still have in our local storage our items. So if I open up the application on a smaller browser window, you'll see that I still have my values. So that didn't change. Can refresh all day long and we'll still have those values. So now let's start working on remove from local storage. And I'll start by looking where we are calling it. And I believe we called it when we were deleting the item. Remember, we were accessing the parent and then on the parent, we had the ID, correct? So once we had the ID, of course, we can pass it into our remove local storage. Now, as far as remove local storage goes in here, we'll have the same thing. We'll have our items. So I'm going to call this let items is equal to get local storage. Again, either I'll have the empty array or I'll have the array that is in my local storage. And at this point, of course, I already have my array because it is there. So my items will be equal to this array of two items that I currently have in there. And then since I already have the array, well, then I would just need to do something with that array. Now I purposely use let because I'm going to use my filter method. And I'm just going to say items is equal to items filter. So now I'll iterate over this array, the one that I'm getting back. And then I'm just going to call my callback function. I can access each item as a parameter. So I'll call this item. And then I'm just going to say like this, if item ID, because that's one of the properties that I have within the item that is coming back from the local storage does not match the ID that I'm passing in when I'm deleting the item, then of course, return the item. So what I'm doing here is I'm just filtering out the values that don't match this ID. And that's why the one that actually matches to whatever I'm passing in here well, that one will be removed from the local storage. So in here, I'm just going to say return item. And then at the very end, I would need to still set those new values. So this is going to be the case where I'm going to get a little bit lazy. And I'm just going to copy and paste. I'm going to say local storage set item list stringify items. Again, yes, we are overriding these values. So I grab whatever I have in there. Then I assign it to items. I filter those items. I have my callback function, I can access each and every item. And then this is already the local storage item. And then on that item, we have the ID property. And as a side note, if you want to see what you're getting back, just add a console log here, because we have done already quite a few console logs. That's why I'm skipping right now. But if you're still in doubt what you're accessing, we have, of course, here, our items from the local storage. And then of course, once I remove that item, I'll just set it in the local storage. Now, in this case, I'll add, I don't know, beer. And then, of course, I have my items here because I already had something in there. I had eggs, milk, and then the last one is beer. So in theory, I kind of delete these two. So I would need to clean out my storage eventually because I have no access to them in the sense of UI because, as you can see, they're not there. But what I'm trying to say here is that we could delete the beer. And you know what? I don't think we need to console log it here. So I have my items. Awesome. Now I added another extra beer. 
Now, let me show you. I don't know with onion, something like that. If you'll check the application, of course, you'll have more items. And you know what? I think this is going to be the use case where I would want to go to bigger screen. I'll see my items. I'll have my application. And as you can see, I have the eggs, milk, beer, and onion. I keep on adding those items. Now, I have only access to the onion. So I've click on deleting the item. Now, check it out. If you'll notice in your local storage, you don't have the onion anymore. Again, yes, we will remove all the items, of course. So it makes sense once we're done setting up everything. But at the moment, we had the onion. And then we just removed the onion because we deleted it using our delete button. We had access to the ID. We accessed items from our local storage. We run filter. And then we set the new items. And then, of course, send it over to our local storage. Now we have two more. We have edit local storage. But then also remember, we had remove item. So why don't we focus on that one? So if I'm going to head on up, I should find clear items. And remember, we had local storage remove item. And now you can see why we're using it. Because we have access to the local storage. And the method name is remove item. And what item I would want to remove? Well, that is a list. And now you can see why we added this piece of code. So we access local storage. We have our method. And we would want to remove this key value pair, the one that has the name of a list. So in order to test it out, I'll add some kind of item in here, maybe item number two. Now, as you can see, it was added to my items. So these are all my items. But now once I save my app JS, and of course, now this is not going to work, I need to add one more, maybe item number three. Now again, this was added to our list. But then once we'll click on clearing the items, you'll see how we'll use our local storage, remove item, and we'll just remove all the items. So now we don't have that list anymore. So now again, this is going to be the case where the first time we're adding those items, what do you think is going to happen? Will this get local storage will just return me my array, correct? Because get item will be null. So we won't use this guy anymore. And now we'll use, of course, our empty array, and we'll pretty much do everything from the scratch. So while we're still on the subject, of course, let's deal with our edit local storage setup it is going to be very, very familiar. We'll have our items get a local storage. So again, we either get our items or we get an empty array. And since I'm passing in here two values, ID and value. And as a side note, if we head up, we can see where we call it. So we had our edit item. Okay, that was one thing. But then we actually called our edit local storage when we were submitting with edit flag off true. So when we we're not just submitting, but when we we're actually editing, remember, we had edit local storage, we accessed our ID. So not this guy, not the DID that we we're creating, but the edit ID, we passed that one in as well as the new value. So what is the new value? So now what I would want to do is get that item from the list, the one that is sitting in my local storage, and just update the value. So I do need that ID in order to access that item. But I'll change it into my values. So in here, I know I'm going to be getting back my array. And again, I can use one of the array methods. So items is equal to items. We know that map will return new array, just like filter. So I'm going to have here items map. Then again, our callback function item. And then if the item ID again matches to the ID that I'm passing in, then I'll just change the value. So in here, I'll say item ID is equal to an ID that I'm passing in. Then item value is equal to the value that I passed in. And then I would want to return the item, return the item. So what happens as I'm iterating over my items, if the item ID does not match, we'll just return the item the way it is. Now, if the ID will match, then I'll set the old value equal to a new value. Let's see it in action. And you know what? There's one thing missing. Still need to set the item. Let me paste local storage set item. 
So now let's try it out again. We'll have our item. Okay. As you can see, I'm adding my item in my local storage. I have the ID and then the value of item. So now, of course, once I edit, I have my item. Okay. I'm editing and then I'll change it to eggs. You'll see that in the local storage, also this value will be changed to eggs. So again, we get our items from local storage. We iterate over. If the ID matches to the ID that I'm passing in, awesome. We'll assign it to a value. If it doesn't, we just return the item. And then again, we override the new value in our local storage. So local storage, set item, and then list, of course, and JSON stringify. All right. And the last thing that I would want to do is once we refresh, I would want to grab my items from the local storage and actually display them. So that way, when the user comes back to the application, we still preserve all the items that we just added. Because at the moment, we're doing a lot of functionality. We are removing from the local storage. We're editing in local storage and all that. We can clean out the local storage, but we are not taking the use of the fact that, of course, we can access local storage once the app loads and then just display all the items that have been added to the local storage. Now, in order to set that up, we'll have to head on up to our events. So where we have the event listeners and now I'll set up one for DOM content loaded. So say load, load items. Now that one will set up on a window. So say here window, then add event listener. We'll be listening for the DOM content. So DOM content loaded event. And then once that happens, we'll just set up items. So this is going to be my callback function set up items. Okay, that's my function. Let's save it. Now we will navigate down. And notice here, I have set up items. So this is exactly what I'll call my function. I'll say set up items. And I'll start by getting those items from local storage. And remember, the function that did that was get local storage. Again, let items is equal to get local storage. So in here, I would want to check if the items have some kind of length. That means that, of course, there are some items, so I'd want to display them. So I'll write if and then items dot length is bigger than zero. Well, what I would want to do, I would want to iterate over them and create those new items. Now, if you remember when we were checking for the form submission, we were creating already this item. So it would make sense if we would set up a function. So we would get this code, pass it into the function, and then call it into places. We'll call it when we're submitting the form. And the second time is as I'm iterating over my items, then I'll call my for each. And then for each and every item, I will call that function. So the function name will be create list item function create list item. It's going to be looking for two arguments, ID and the value. Let's pass it here. And now, like I said, I would want to copy and paste that code. So in this case, I will cut it out and I'm looking for element. So that's going to be the beginning of my code. And then I would want to end it over here. Now, I still want to include the element selectors because even though I'm getting them from the local storage, I still want the functionality, correct? Where if I click on edit or delete, it still works. So just cut out everything up to display alert. Then navigate down, copy and paste. This is my function. This is what the function is doing. And now we just need to add these values in here where notice since I'm adding here ID ID value, they match. So my argument matches to whatever I have in the attribute. And the same goes for the value. So now in this case, as I'm iterating over those items, I would want to call, of course, my function. So items. So if the items length is bigger than zero, then I'll run items for each. And I'm looking for my callback function, function, I'm accessing each and every item. And then these values, of course, are coming from the local storage. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that in the item, I have two properties. 
I have the ID and I have the value. So now I can call my create list item and I'm looking for two things, correct? I'm looking for the ID and then the value. So do the same thing, passing here the item ID, first property, and the second one was item dot value. So we call them. And the last thing that I would want to do within this function is show the container. So once I run it, then I'll just say container class list add. And remember, the class was show container. Now, of course, since we cut out the previous code, I still need to create a list item once I submit my form. Now, in this case, it's not going to change much because again, I'll say create list item and I'll pass in ID and value again, where I'm getting the value here, where I'm getting the ID right here. And then it was pretty much the same code. So the only thing again is that we're just passing the ID and value into attribute as well as the actual value. We'll save it and you'll see that we'll get code from our console. Now something is missing and it says here item is not defined 151. Well, let's see. So I have item for each I have the functions. And then of course, I'm saying here item it should be items, my apologies. Let's run it one more time. And I have my eggs that are coming from the local storage. And now I will navigate to a bigger screen. And we'll just test it out. We have the eggs. Awesome. We'll add here beer. Now I can see that I added beer if I refresh. Yep, there it is. We are again running our function, iterating over and we have all the values. If I want to delete them, of course, I'm removing them from the UI, as well as the local storage, I can clearly see that. Then I'll add one more time, eggs, milk, milk, onion, onion, like so. Let's add this guy. And then once I have all these values, well, of course, I can delete them one by one. Again, let's remove then item. Of course, that is going to be my item item number two. And then if I want to edit, instead of item, let's call this eggs. So now I have my eggs. And if I would want to edit this to a milk, this is going to become milk. So that's how we can set up our application. Hopefully everyone enjoyed the project. And I hope to see you in the next project. Awesome. And up next, we have simple slider built with a JavaScript. So later in the course, once we cover some other topics, we'll build a more complicated one. But this is just going to give you an idea of how to set up a simple slider with a JavaScript. So the setup will be following where we'll have two options, we'll have one option where we work with the buttons. So we'll hide buttons at certain points. So for example, prev button will be hidden in the beginning of the slideshow. But then the next button will be hidden at the end of the slideshow. So in this case, as you can see, I can only navigate back and forth. Because once I get to the end of the slideshow, I hide my next button. And then once I get to the beginning of the slideshow, of course, I hide my pre button. And the other setup we'll take a look at is the one where we'll just circle back to the end of the slideshow, or the beginning one. Now the way it will work is once we get to the end of the slideshow, Notice how we circulate back to the start. But then once we are at the beginning of the slideshow, and we would want to take a look at the last one, then of course, we just circulate back to the end of the slideshow. Now everything else stays the same, we can still navigate back and forth. Just the difference is once we get to the beginning of the slideshow, or the end of the slideshow, where instead of showing and hiding the buttons, we'll just circle back either to the beginning of the slideshow, or the end of the slideshow. Excellent. And we'll start with our HTML. So again, I'm in the setup folder. And instead of my awesome heading one, we'll create a slide container. So div with a class of slide container, and then I'll place my slides. And this is something you need to keep in mind where slides are the important ones. So divs with a class of slide, everything else is optional, whatever you want to place it there, you're the boss. But slides are the ones that will set up our slider, or you can call it carousel, whatever you would want. So I'm going to start with my first one. And as a side note, I was purposely trying to spice them up. So effectively set them up in a different way. So they're all not the same, because that way you can understand that pretty much you can place whatever you'd want within these slides. What's important 
is to have that div with a class of slide. And I'll start with the first one where I'll have the image with a heading one. As far as the image, I'm looking for IMG number one. I'll add here a class of slide IMG. And then right after that, I'll have my heading one with a value of one. We'll save it. And of course, I can see my slide. Awesome. Then actually, I'm missing here the class name. It is not slide. It is slider container. Okay. So now, of course, everything looks much better. And I would want to set up three more slides. But then, like I said, since the setup is almost the same, just the difference what we're placing within, I can just copy and paste so one, two, and three. And now I just want to change these values around where this is going to be a heading one with a value of two, then three, and then four. So now I have four slides. But since all of them are not going to be exactly the same for the second one, just delete the image. So I'm just going to be gone for the third one. We'll also actually hide the image. So we'll delete the image. And then for the fourth one, the setup will be the different image. So I'm going to go with a person one JPEG. Let me delete this extension. I'll call this person image person IMG. And then it's going to have this heading one with a value four. But before that, we'll have a heading four with Susan Doe, Susan Doe. Let's save it. Now, the way the setup works is we're using position absolute. So that's why we can only see the last one. Again, don't worry. Of course, we'll fix that. And then right after the slider container, so don't place it within the container, set up a button container. So I'll take a look at where I have my slider container, where it ends. Here it is. And then I'll set up another div with a class of BTN container. And then within this container, I'll have two buttons. And one is going to have class of pre button, and the other one will be next button. And in here, I can just probably add a type of button. And then like I said, class, and for the first one, it's going to be pre BTN. And in here, I'll just have a text of pre. And then of course, I'll copy and paste and change these values around where the second one, of course, will be my next button. And as far as the value, it's also going to be next. So that should be our HTML setup. Awesome. Before we start typing away JavaScript, I would want us to understand the general idea behind what we're going to do with the JavaScript, because that way, of course, it's going to be much more easier once we need to implement the actual logic. So the way the setup works is we have the container. Now, the container has some kind of width width and height. And then it is position relative, as you can see over here. And then each and every slide, so div with a class of slide is position absolute. And that's why you can only see the last one. So for example, if I would delete my last slide or comment it out, whatever you'd want to do, you'll see that and now we see the slide number three, because all of them use this position absolute. So of course, the next slide covers the previous one. And then all of them have this width and height of 100%. So let me navigate back to my HTML, I'll uncomment this. And you know what, I will add here a div, because I think it's going to look a little bit better. So I'll place the image, the Susan Doe and all that within the div, because we're using here grid. So I have display grid and place items in the center. So now it just looks a little bit better. And the way we'll set up everything in JavaScript, we'll just use positioning. Where at the moment we have position absolute for all the slides, correct? And of course, now they're sitting one on top of each other. But what we will do is we will select our elements. And now I will uncomment this. But of course, again, we will do this using JavaScript. But I'm just showing you the manual setup. So, for example, if you add for the first child to be left zero, so what is the left location? Then for the second one, you would add 100 and 200 and 300. Then, of course, you would see the line. Now, why you don't see the line right now is because in the container, we have this overflow hidden. So if I'll comment this out, you'll see in your project a long line of these items. So what's happening right now, all of them are position absolute. Yeah, that is correct. But then the first one, as you can see, has this left of zero. Then the second one will be 100. 
then 200, then 300. And using JavaScript, we'll just check what is the index of the actual item. And then we'll place either it's 100, 200, and 300. So that way, of course, we don't need to do this manually because at the moment I'm just doing this manually in a CSS. But what we'll have is this container that will always be displayed. And then we'll have these long line of whatever items we have. So at the moment I have four, but I can place here 55,000. It doesn't really matter. And then of course, as we will be clicking on the buttons, then we'll just shift these items. And the way we'll shift those items. So for the slide, we have transform property and we'll set it equal to a translate X. So that moves the item in the X direction. Now, one gotcha is that negative will move it to the left and then positive value will move it to the right. So now I'm selecting all the slides and I'm just going to say, you know what? Move it 100% to the left. So in here, I need to go with a negative value and then 100%. Now, what does it mean 100%? So whatever is the width of the item, just shift 100% to the left. And as you can see, once I do, notice all the items shifted. And that's why right now we're showing in the container, of course, the item number two. And then, of course, we can increase these values. So if I'll shift 200, then, of course, I'm moving more to the left. Then I go to the end of the slideshow. And if we want to move back, that's all we have to do. We we'll just go to 100 and then eventually we'll go to zero. Now, of course, the way our setup will be is that our overflow will be hidden. So that's why we'll only be able to see the item. So that's why once we navigate down and, for example, if I would want to move back to zero, I can just say zero. And now I'm showing slide number one. Now, if you'd want to increase again, we are going negative value. That's something that you need to remember. Now, of course, I'm showing second item Then I can go to third and on and on and on. And the reason why we have these nice transitions as we're switching from one slide to another one is because on a slide class, we have transition property with these values. So I'm targeting all the properties and then the time that I have right now is 0 0.25 seconds. So if you'll change this to, for example, two seconds and you'll scroll down and again, manually for the time being change these values, for example, negative 300, you'll see that it takes two seconds to switch from one slide to another one. Again, this is just to show you a manual setup. Of course, we'll do all of this using JavaScript, but this should give you a good idea of what we'll do so that way it should help you to understand when we set up all the functionality. Okay. And once we understand the general setup, of course, it's time to do our magic in the app.js. And we'll start by selecting three things. I would want to select all my slides. So I'll use query selector all for that. So const slides, and that is equal to document, then query selector all that should give me my node list. And I'm looking for my slides. Then I would also want to target a next button. So for that, I have the variable of next BTN. And then, of course, I need to target my class. And the class name is next BTN. And then I'll copy and paste and just change these values around where instead of next, I'll be looking for the previous one. And the same will work over here. Now, once I have my previous button, next button and the slides, I'll start by iterating over the slides and then remember how we manually added this left. Well, now we'll do that using JavaScript. So depending on where the item is sitting, we'll move either zero, 100, 200 and 300. And of course, that will give us a good idea that we can add as many slides as we want, because now we're using JavaScript, not manually setting this up in this CSS. Now we have our node list. Awesome. And we already know that we can just iterate over it using for each. We have our callback function within a callback function. We can access each and every item. However, in this case, we do need to have this optional index because I would want to check while well, we're in the actual node list, this item is sitting. So I have my index and then for the slide, I would want to add this left property. So I need to target my style. So style property. And then within the style property, I have an option off left. So I'll have dot and then left. And once I have targeted my left property, I would want to set up some kind of value. Now for this value, I would want to set up a expression. So that's why I'll use the template string. 
in order to access that expression, we do need to use dollar sign and then curly braces. And then in here, I'll grab my index multiplied by 100 and then add this percent. So again, we're doing exactly the same like we had in the manual setup. Now, the difference is that I'm using my index. So for the first item, it's going to be zero because my index is going to be zero. But then for the second item, I'll move it 100%, then 200, then 300. And let me save it. And of course, I should see my first item. Now, if you want to see the whole list, just navigate up to your slider container and just remove that overflow hidden for the time being. Once you remove it, again, you'll see a long list of items. And again, what's really cool about using JavaScript is this fact that if I navigate to my HTML and grab my slide, now let me check where this one goes, because usually I have a tendency of making some kind of dumb mistake. So I have my slide, I'll change this one to five. And you'll see that I can add as many items as I would want. And what I'll have is these items in a list. Okay, so that's the cool thing about using JavaScript, because you don't have to run back to style CSS, and essentially just add these manually. So you don't need to count how many items you have, you just set up three lines of code, and you're good to go. Beautiful. Once we have slides in one line, now, of course, we would want to set up the functionality where we can control which slide is shown and which ones are hidden. And we'll start with our first option where we will just navigate either to the end of the slideshow or back to the beginning of the slideshow. And we'll start by setting up some kind of counter. So let counter and the counter will be zero at the very beginning. And then I would want to target two things, the buttons, next button and brief button. So I add the event listener, I'm listening for click event. Then I have my function, of course. And then within the callback function, I'll just start by either increasing or decreasing the counter. So for the next button, I would want to increase. And then for the preve, of course, I will decrease. So in here, instead of next button, I'm looking for my brief button. And then counter also will decrease. All right, we have our awesome setup. Now what? Well, I would want to set up a function that just grabs the value of the counter and then adds the translate value to all the slides. Because remember, when we were adding this negative 100, negative 200, we were essentially just moving the slides either 100 percent to the left or 200 or 300 so that's how we were able to navigate through our slideshow so what i would want to do is each and every time i increment i just iterate over some of my slides and then add this using javascript so we did our first setup where we placed them in a line now we'll do this line of css so we have some kind of function i'm going to name my one carousel and then for the time being, we will leave out the logic where we either navigate to the end of the slideshow or beginning. We'll add that in a second. I'll just would want to start by grabbing all my slides. Again, I have four each. Then I'll have my function, my callback function. I'll access each and every slide as a parameter of slide. And then I'll use my style property again. So style. And then instead of left, I'm looking for transform. And again, this is going to be a template string where I have my translate X and then parentheses. And then within the parentheses, I'll set it equal to negative because I would want to move them to the left, of course. And then I have my expression. That's why I have my template string. And I'll just multiply my counter. So whatever is going to be the counter by the 100. So I'll say multiply by 100 and just make sure you add here the percent. Now let's save it and let's take a look at on a bigger screen. So as you can see, once I press, nothing happens. Okay. Why nothing is happening? Let me see. I have my cursor. Oh, of course, I'm not invoking the cursor. So we would need to invoke it right after we increase or decrease the counter. So let me invoke it first in here as well as in my pre button. Let's save it. And now let's test it out on a bigger screen. Once I click, check it out. Now, of course, I'm adding my translate X. And as you can see, I'm just moving. Now, of course, we still need to fix the fact that we eventually just run out of slides. But if you want to check it out your dev tools, you'll nicely see 
how all the elements are getting this translate added to them. So in the prev, check it out. Now, of course, we're just decreasing this value. So we start with this zero because our counter is zero, correct? As you can see, our counter is zero. Now, of course, we just invoke it once we run it, but since we navigate it back to the beginning where the counter was zero, that's why we're translating only 0%. So we start with this one. And then once I click, now my counter is one and I multiply the one by 100 and then add to all the styles. So all the slides just move 100% to the left. Then I add one more time and now all the slides move 200 to the left. Now, of course, we do need to fix the fact that eventually we just run out of slides. So what we can do? Well, we'll start with our first setup where we just either scroll or you can say circle back to the end of the slideshow or beginning one. And the way we do that is first by adding some kind of comment, since there's going to be two setups working with slides. That's our first option. And then I'm just going to say if the counter is equal to slides length. So in our case, that would be five, since we have five slides, then I'll set the counter equal to zero. Now, if the counter is less than one, that means that I would want to navigate back to the end of the slideshow. And in order to access that, well, first of all, I would want to set up some kind of if statement. So if the counter is less than one, then I would want to set my counter equal to slides length minus one. Okay, because again, arrays are zero index based. So that's why if we would want to access the last one, we would need to go with slides length minus one. And now of course, I would want to also hide the rest of the slides. That's why I'll navigate back to my CSS. And I'll set this to overflow hidden. And now we'll nicely see that we go one slide, second, third, fourth, fifth, so we're at the end of the slideshow. That is the case. We just nicely navigate back and our counter is set back to zero. Now, if I'm at the beginning of the slideshow and I would want to see the end, I just press previous and now I can see my previous slides. So that would be our first setup where we just circulate around our slideshow. And once we have our first setup, I would want to show you the second one where we just hide or show the brief and the next buttons. Now I'll leave this one for your reference. So I'll just comment out and I would want to hide the brief button right from the get go. So once the application loads, we will hide our brief button. And we can do that by brief button. That is, of course, our variable style display. And that is going to be equal to none. Okay, we had a button. Awesome. And then in here, we'll set up another set of if and else statements. Now I'll add here a comment of working with buttons, just so we know what we're doing. And we'll start with our next button. So in here, I'll say if counter is less than slides length minus one, that is, of course, the value for my last slide, then please show the next button. So next button, style, then display and it is equal to block if the counter is less than my last slide value then please show it otherwise please hide the next button so we'll go with next button style display and that is equal to none so now you'll see that as you're clicking on a next once you get to the end of the slideshow you just hide the next button so the user doesn't even have the option of looking for the slide that doesn't exist, of course. And I'll do the same thing for my prev, where I'm going to say if counter, if counter is bigger than zero, awesome, then please show the prev button. Otherwise, hide it. So I'll set it up in here, prev button, display equal to block, of course. And let's set up another else. And in this case, I'm going to say else. And then, of course, I'll hide it. So pre button style display to none. So right from the get go, we hide our pre button. Awesome. And once we navigate to a second slide, of course, our counter value is one. So it is bigger than zero, then we show it. But then once we navigate back, again, we hide it because we have if the counter value 
is not bigger than zero. And we just had our brief button. So now in this case, we can navigate to the end of the slideshow. We hide our next button. Beautiful. And we can only navigate back. Once we navigate to the beginning of the slideshow, we hide our pre button. So now we can only navigate to the next slide. So this is going to be our second setup. Hopefully everyone enjoyed the project and I hope to see you in the next project.